Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're, we're live on the, the remote as well. Yeah, so here we are in Bellingham, survived the weather storm last night. Checked in with my wife this morning, very powered up. Yeah, that, how long that goes on for. Um, so, uh, I think we have a fairly extensive agenda over the next day and a half day. Um, I think it's going to be about a day. I did share. Okay. Um, so, I don't have any uh, changes to the agenda. John, just checking in with you. No. no? Okay. So we can formally adopt the agenda. Um, moving on to the second item, um, I understand we do need to have a, a vice chair identified. Uh, Bob, I would. My my speaker isn't working on this side. Oh. I don't think yeah. any of ours. We have a, a mic in here, so it's going to it should just work fine. The the intention to the intention to have the mics in the room is just for in, internal, uh, but the the owl has a has a microphone and speaker in there as well. So we'll rectify that issue, but you can proceed. So thank you. For the I, I'll make a motion that uh, John Curlin, Mr. John Curlin, uh, be serve serve as vice chair of the International Pacific Elephant Commission. All right. Thanks very much, Bob. Is there a second? I'll second. Any opposed? We didn't close it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a railroad job. Well, we still have two of us for so either way. <laughs> Thanks for Okay. So then I will turn it over to you, Dave. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item three, the ITHC process. Great, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning to everybody in the room, uh, and then also uh, everybody listening in on, online. Um, so uh, just while we wait for paper 03 presentation to be brought up, um, just, just a few quick uh, ad administrative reminders, if that's okay, Chair, I might pass to Andrea just to run us through a quick look at a few logistical components. Thank you, and good morning and welcome. So we are in the boardroom, obviously, or we're in the Admiral Garden Room, and it is tight in here. If you guys feel like you would like to uh, go into the overflow room, we do have that right across the hall, and we are streaming, of course, on Adobe Connect. Um, if you are looking for the Adobe Connect link, uh, just go to the iphc.int website and uh, click the link. The restrooms are behind me, um, out that door, and down the hall to uh, the uh, the Wi-Fi, if you're not connected already, is one bellwether, um, is a password. Um, and then also a note from the hotel. If you can turn to the kitchen here and are going to the room, please make sure your kitchen with the kitchen if they're already warning you um, that they are staffed up for us, but this service is going to be slow. So we just need to the hotel. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, so let's move on to agenda item 3.1, 2, 3, and 4. And these are largely administrative in nature, uh, just to provide you some background information on the work that the Secretariat has been undertaking uh, during the intersessional period. And so agenda item 3.1 specifically relates to uh, paper 03, and this is the update on the actions arising um, from the recent sessions of the Commission. So the purpose is to provide the Commission with an opportunity to progress to uh, consider the progress made during the intersessional period in relation to the direct request for action by the Commission. So just as a little bit of background to refresh your memories, uh, back in January of 2022, the 98th session of the Commission was held uh, and there were a number or a series of actions to be undertaken by the Secretariat, Commissioners, and also subsidiary models, bodies which are outlined in Appendix A of Paper 03. In addition, the Commission made a number of uh, additional decisions throughout the course of 2022 in one special session, the 12th special session, which was held in, uh, I believe, February of 2022, and then also a, an intersessional uh, voting decision, which are all outlined in Appendix A of, of the paper. I'm pleased to say that all of those actions uh, arising from both the annual session, the special session have been completed and are reported out in that appendix. And you will also hear a 
additional detail on how we um, completed those recommendations uh, over the course of, over the course of the next day and a half, uh, where each of the secretariat staff responsible for those areas will report out on that progress. Uh, and in, in addition, the intersectional decision was related to the budget, which was, uh, of course, adopt, adopted and has been implemented for 2023, which commenced on 1 October of this year. Uh, and so, Chair, it's not my intention to go through those. They are going to be reported out uh, in detail throughout the course of the meeting. So I'll call the chair to any specific questions from the Commission uh, on any of those actions. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. Are there any questions? There's Dave knows we'll be going through this over the course, so most of the time have been any. So I think we carry on, Dave. Thank you, Chair. So let's bring up the presentation for agenda item 3.2, so paper 04. And this relates to the report of the Secretariat for 2022, which of course is preliminary at this point, uh, as we are still in um, November, just, and at the annual meeting we received the, the final report. Uh, if I could have the PowerPoint, please, associated with this, this paper. Um, and, and so this is, and I'll, I'll just pause for a moment while that comes up. Having a few little technical glitches at the front. So just a, a refresher that this is a report which contains updates on, on other activities of the Secretariat that are not fully detailed in other papers before the Commission. Uh, so for, exa for example, we don't detail the uh, analysis that we've undertaken for the stock assessment, the MSE, uh, and the Biological and Ecosystem Science Research Program, which, which will be, you will receive later, later today. In terms of the Secretariat, we currently consist of 34 full-time positions. Um, when in addition to that, we hire uh, on any given year, 35 to 45 temporary or seasonal positions. Um, to start our ports and the research vessels that we charter as part of the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey. Uh, and contained in Appendix 1 is, is a detailed um, description, position title and organisation of the Secretariat associated with those 34 full-time positions. Our shared vision, of course, uh, is, is no surprises there. It's to, uh, that the Secretariat aims to deliver positive economic, environmental and social outcomes for the resource for both Canada and the US through the application of rigorous science, innovation, and the implementation of international best practice. In, 2000, in 2022, we uh, recruited or funded two full-time interns over the summer period. Um, one, Ms. Uh, Tarina from the Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma. Uh, I don't know if we can have that not pop up on the screen. It makes it quite hard to, to read off sometimes. Uh, and in addition, Miss um, Caitlin Murray, who is an environmental science major at Sweet Briar College. Um, both of those interns had a very successful summer with us, and Dr. Planus is going to go through the two core research activities that they assisted us with um, later on this morning or early this afternoon, um, surrounding the sex ratio uh, work that his, he and his team are doing, and also the reproductive assessment. Um, so stand by and, and you'll receive a bit of an update on those two projects. Uh, this is something that we find very successful, very useful to bring on uh, interns, uh, undergraduate interns, to uh, assist, at, assist us at the Secretariat throughout the summer period. In 2022, we also ran the IPAC Merit Scholarship um, and the panel consisting of, of Commissioner Alveson and Commissioner Grief, as well as Angel Drobnika, Patrick Tapoe, and Krista Russell, um, were provided with a very strong um, pool of candidates, of potential candidates in 2022 for the Merit Scholarship. Uh, and the panel is very pleased to announce that um, Miss Lucy Hankins was the successful uh, candidate for 2022. Um, Lucy is from Seward, Alaska, and I was uh, very privileged to, to, meet, to have met uh, Lucy this year. Um, soon after we made the announcement in Seward, and uh, she's going to be attending the Utah State University as a Bachelor of Science uh, initially uh, as in aviation technology, and she has the desire to return to Alaska and serve the remote communities once she, she graduates. Just a reminder, we have one other uh, graduate 
uh, merit scholarship, uh, which runs concurrently. We have two of them running at any one time, and we currently have Halen Beck and Bacal, who is uh, going to complete his degree in 2023. And so soon thereafter, we will be making another call. Throughout the course of the year, we've uh, started to move back towards uh, in-person meetings, and we had our first in-person meeting of the Research Advisory Board at the Secretary's headquarters in Seattle um, day before yesterday. Uh, but otherwise, uh, all others have been uh, electronic uh, to this point, with the exception of the Scientific Review Board um, of the three participants. So it's a smaller group. And you'll hear a little bit more from the SRB chair on how those meetings went uh, later this morning. I'll pass to Basha. Thank you. I will now summarize the uh, adopted uh, fishery and proposed fishery regulation uh, 2021 uh, to 2022 process. So we adopted uh, six uh, regulatory proposals at the last uh, annual meeting and one at the special session 12 that was uh, uh, following the annual meeting. Uh, out of these proposals, three of them were secretary's proposals three standards related to mortality of fishery limits, commercial fishing periods, and one that included minor amendments to the regulations. When it comes to adopted proposals, uh, uh, we had uh, from contracting parties, we had a, a proposal regarding, regarding record keeping for uh, charter Pacific Health of Annual Limits and charter management measures in FPC regulatory areas 2C and 3A as well as a regulatory proposal on trap gear use in IPHC regulatory area 2B. Uh, the daily bag limit in IPHC regulatory area 2B proposal was also adopted by, as I said, later in the special session. There was one proposal from, a proposal from a stakeholder related to processing of Pacific hardwood for eating and preservation. This uh, proposal was uh, early this year deferred but it was resubmitted for this year's consideration and we'll hear a little bit more about it in the agenda item eight. I'll also summarize uh, now interactions with uh, contracting parties uh, that we as a secretary are involved. On the Canadian side, uh, this year, we uh, secure a multi-year permit for the IPHC server in uh, Guayanas National Marine Conservation Area. In May 2020, management board approved the application that the DFO put forward to permit multi-year approvals for uh, fisheries independent satellite survey in Waihana National Marine Conservation Area. As a secretary, we also uh, actively participate in the Halbert uh, Advisory Board. Uh, on the US side, we are also actively uh, following uh, relevant council meetings actions. Big item on the agenda this year is to a management transition. In November 2020, the Pacific Fisheries Management Council took final action on to a fishery management transition from the IPHC to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, the resulting proposed rule was open for public comment and now is expected to be uh, finally adopted. NIMS will be uh, following this uh, final adoption responsible for issuing permits for all 2A halibut fisheries as well as management of 2A non-tribal directed commercial fishery. This action is on track for implementation in 2023. Uh, following that, the annual management alternatives for 2A will be considered through the council process in September and November, together with the action on capturing plan at the uh, council meetings. The data, uh, uh, the, the policy branch together with the data services branch are actively involved in this process and supporting them in the early uh, transition period and planning to, to support the process as, as we move forward with this change. Uh, regarding other relevant actions, in February 2022, uh, the North Pacific Fisheries Management Council adopted the purpose and its statement and set of alternatives for analysis of Pacific halibut capturing and allocations between the charter sector and the commercial sector in Alaska. So this will be an interesting discussion for relevant to Pacific halibut, but as of now, this 
specific item it's not scheduled for for the uh on, it's not scheduled for the non-distributed management council unit uh, regarding the actual uh, <coughs> actions at the npfmc uh in april uh, 2022 there were two and one is related to recreation quota entity the council took final action on establishing a fee collection program for charter vessel operators to fund the recreational quota entity. Uh, this action, however, requires still US Congress to grant them uh, this uh, fee collection authority. So this is still not uh, uh, operational. Uh, there was also um, uh, adoption of several changes to the individual, individual quota uh, program. And uh, this includes clarification that Slinky calls are legal here for the IFQ fishery fisheries and community development fisheries. Thank you very much, Basha. Some of the other activities that we have undertaken in 2022 inclu includes uh, further refinement or advancement of the IPAC website. Um, there, there are quite a number of changes that we've made throughout 2022, but I just wanted to highlight one in particular, which was the publication of the water column profile data which is collected as part of the Fishery Independence Headline Survey coastwide. Um, and so this data has now been published on, on the website, is downloadable by anybody who's, who's interested. Um, back until 2009 at the moment, uh, that data is, is freely available. It is hoped that over the coming year, we'll be able to further, further uh, modify that data so that it is published in uh, an interactive format, similar to what we have for the Fishery Independence Headline Survey catch data and by catch data as well. So, um, yeah, stay posted for that update throughout the course of 2023. The annual report uh, was published, uh, and, and that is, is has been available since uh, early this year, 31st of March. And if you haven't already read it or you're interested, we can certainly send you a copy. Uh, but otherwise, it's freely available on the website as well. Uh, the report did undergo a substantial revision in 2022, and I would like to thank the communications team. Uh, for putting that together. In addition, IPAC circulars and media releases remain our staple uh, form of communication with the Commission, the, the contracting parties in particular, uh, and then also with uh, the broader stakeholder community who, who we serve. Uh, and those are, are available both uh, through our general mail outs from the IPAC website uh, through the links that are, that are provided on the screen. <laughs> In terms of external engagement and publications, uh, we maintain, our, our, our professional staff maintain strong links with several academic institutions. We have Dr. Hicks and Dr. Stewart, who are affiliate faculty of the University of Washington, based in Seattle, and Dr. Flamis as well, uh, also as affiliate faculty of Alaska Pacific University in, in Anchorage. Um, those three um, team members also sit on a number of graduate student committees. Uh, those are outlined on the screen and in the document uh, itself, so I won't go into those, but it does uh, assist us in providing a greater link to the academic community, uh, particularly those junior scientists who, who work their way up through uh, various colleges, universities, and hopefully one day will come to join us at the IPHC. 2020, 2022 has been successful um, again in terms of the number of publications that we've provided. Uh, we have eight published to date, and we have a numbers that are in review uh, and in preparation. Um, and while there's only another month to go, we, we do hope that a couple of those will be pushed through to be published. If not, they'll, they'll obviously be published early next year. Uh, so with that said, uh, simply asking you to note the, the preliminary report at this stage, and, and we'll provide a final report at the annual meeting. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, David Basher. See if there's any questions. Um, go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Well, it doesn't work either. Uh, I had a couple questions. Um, I, I wondered, uh, Dave, if your team has had a chance to think about what it will mean to be sort of freed up from 2A permitting and where you see it. I, I can't recall in any detail um, what that, what kind of draw that was on your uh, staff, but. Um, Looking ahead to 2023, wondering how you see sort of repurposing that time. Um, and then I had a couple questions about a few of the um, things that the Secretary had been working on with Alaska. I 
on the cap sharing plan between the charter sector and the commercial fleet. I, isn't there already a cap sharing plan in place? And so maybe you would be interested to hear the, the kind of driver for a revision or, or a new plan. Um, and similarly, really interested to hear about the fee collection uh, work that you're doing and, and how you're structuring that. <clears throat> not an exhaustive detail now, but perhaps uh, we could sort of find out a bit more about that to the sidelines of this. Uh, thank you, through, through the chair. Uh, in terms of the, the 2A transition, um, so Dr. Um, Janet, would you like to speak a little bit about the current um, time usage from the team? Uh, and then we can talk maybe a little bit about uh, where we could potentially reallocate that, that time usage. And I don't know if you have those numbers off at the top at the tip of your fingers. I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but um, about probably 15 to 20% of the time in the, in the spring is spent on, on licensing. Uh, and there are a number of issues in the data team, team and, and data services that need to be addressed in addition to that. So some of the free time will be used towards um, ensuring uh, long-term continuity of, of data sets, for example, that um, otoliths and aging process is something where we need to do some succession planning and cross-training, so that will be one item where folks will be spending their time uh, instead of working on licensing. Thank you. Do you want to jump in, Basha, and then we can pass to maybe the U.S. So on the capturing plan, this is a, a part of a process to be do it on a regular basis. And uh, uh, there was an initial uh, paper that was presented, some initial analysis, but that was deemed not sufficient and the council requested additional information. But this does not mean that there will be any reallocation on the US side, but just uh, they requested additional analysis. I'm sure that uh, uh, policy advisors on the US side uh, can have more on that. And the same on the fee collection program. Uh, that's that's something that uh, we just follow in terms of our understanding uh, uh, how Pacific Halbert is uh, um, like management on the on the state level is uh, is conducted. But this is not something we will be directly involved. So just following the actions uh, for for better understanding of the situation on the side. But again, additional details, I'm sure. Anybody want to take this? Kurt? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. sure. Uh, would you like me to answer from here? Can you hear? Can everyone online here? Yeah. Commissioner Davis, Mr. Chairman, uh, the catch sharing plan review is just part of a regular review that the council does of all of their catch sharing plans. They cycle through them periodically to make sure that they're meeting their goals. And uh, so this, this particular one came up, it was due, and the council's action on it was to temporarily at least table any further review and any specific actions pending results of the recreational quota entity funding mechanism. Uh, because that impacts very greatly the catch sharing plan that we exist that exists right now. Um, the, the presentation here uh, correctly points out that the catch training plan is a plan that allocates part of the halibut harvest to the directed long life group, directed halibut group, uh, in the guided charter sector. So um, that leads into the Recreational Quota Entity Program, which the council has developed a rule for. It does exist that a recreational quota entity uh, is now authorized to purchase quota shares from the directed group and use those quota shares to augment their existing percentage allocation that they have right now. And those shares and augment their percentage as long as they hold those shares. And the shares can go either way. That particular rule currently exists. 
But the portion that is lacking right now is how does the RTV acquire its funding to buy those shares? It could be any number of ways. And, and that's what this particular funding action was about and after many iterations and a lot of discussion landed on the most effective way to do that would be for the RQE itself to be able to collect fees from the charter operators rather than the federal government stepping in and do that. The RQE would do that on their own, but they need the authorization to do that. They're currently not authorized to collect fees. There's no there's no effective enforcement of that. And, and bear in mind, there, we, there are 500 businesses, there are 500 charter businesses in Alaska, and we issue more than 1,000 permits a year. So collecting fees from all of these business, businesses on an annual basis would be an onerous task. Um, so that's what the congressional authorization is about that uh, I should mention. And it is past the U.S. Senate. It's currently before the House of Representatives. It did pass once before, uh, although the president vetoed that particular legislation two years ago, three, 2020, early 2020. So we're on the second go around of this. If that authorization were to pass, then the RQE, then NIMPS would be authorized to develop regulations which would enable the RQE to develop a fee mechanism. And I, I can take any other questions if you want more details. That, that's very helpful. So just uh, so I'm following, charter operators require a kind of permit issued from uh, the state or NIMS, anyway, a government agency to operate as a charter. And then this would essentially sort of create the them give them the authority to charge a fee somehow through uh, to all of the license holders or permit holders, charter permit holders. That's the gist. The, the first portion, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Davis, is correct that they the charter operators do hold a license issued by the National Marine Fisheries Service, and then the question before the council was. How, how would that fee collection occur? And there are any number of ways you could do it. And what the, the council and the stakeholders landed on would be a stamp mechanism linking the charter anglers to this fee collection program. They would be required to hold a, a stamp and the operators themselves would be the person responsible for issuing those stamps and paying for them. So it, the advantages of that is that it's directly tied to the amount of activity that a charter operator would have. The charter operators that are part-timers, full-timers, lodge owners, if each one of their anglers was required to have a stamp that they had the operator pay for on a daily basis, it would link the two and that amount of effort. So the, the authorization would allow NIMS to Congressional authorization would allow NIMS to develop regulations that would enable this process. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any other questions? If not fair, then we could move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is 3.3, and the, we have the presentation brought up for that paper of five, please. <coughs> Dave, while we're waiting for that, um, I hope the comment is uh, going to be available uh, as we go through the agenda. Are people aware of that online? Yes, I, I believe it, it's posted. Uh, as part of the registration process and the chat there, but maybe, maybe it's worthwhile as well, just verbalizing that. Um, so if uh, anybody listening online, as we progress through the various agenda items, does have a, a comment that you would like to make, either in writing or verbally, um, there will be a button in your on your screen where you got to 
provide that uh, public comment. And so it's the same process that we used for the annual meeting earlier this year. You can either simply type in your question and the Secretariat will collate those and we'll read them out for you for a potential response or, or simply comment. Um, or if you would like the microphone, please just indicate uh, again what the topic is, the agenda item that you'd like to speak to, and uh, we'll make sure we line that up uh, at an appropriate time. Uh, I think we have the, the first set for, for later this morning after the, the assessment. Okay, so the next agenda item, agenda item 3.3, uh, again, it's just a, just an update on where we're at with the implementation of the recommendations arising from the second performance review of the IPHC. The report um, of the second performance review was published uh, back in October of 2019 with uh, the link provided in the paper on the website and also as part of this presentation. There were a total of 26 recommendations from the performance review that were considered by the Commission uh, and at the most recent annual meeting the Commission also requested the Secretariat add a scorecard uh, to the uh, cover of this, this particular paper uh, and, uh, and as, as part of the update so we know where we're at with the recommendations that are still remaining or on hold or, or pending um, and so that, that has been completed. Of those 26, we have 17 that are completed or completed and on, on annually ongoing, meaning that we uh, completed the task in um, over the, the first couple of years of the implementation, but felt that we should continue to uh, implement that recommendation on an ongoing basis. So each year we go through and, and, and update our activities accordingly. There are five that remain in progress. Uh, two pending and two on hold. And so I'm just going to step through those that are on hold, pending, and in progress uh, before we jump to any other questions or comments. So if, if we jump to the two that are on hold at the moment, and so just a reminder, these are the two recommendations that the Commission considered and then specifically indicated uh, that they did not want to progress at this time uh, during the five-year uh, implementation process. One is the legal analysis of the Convention and the other relates to the um, development of minimum data collection standards. And so both of those essentially have been uh, indicated by the Commission that no progress is required. Um, and therefore they're just on hold in case that, in case that position changes. The next two are slightly different, uh, and these are two recommendations from the performance review that uh, have been ag agreed to be advanced, but are, are pending in the sense that uh, the, any updates or information are, are yet to be provided as part of the national reports. They relate to compliance and enforcement um, in terms of full state measures and also monitoring control and surveillance. Uh, and so at this point, we don't have any, any updates on those. The remaining recommendations outstanding uh, are those with uh, progress that has been made but yet to be completed. Uh, recommendation 11 relates to the management strategy evaluation process. Um, Dr. Hicks is going to provide you an update as part of paper 13 uh, later today. Uh, and in addition, in addition, obviously, as part of that is the um, need for a formal adoption of a harvest strategy uh, by the Commission. Recommendation 12 relating to uh, fishing allocation opportunities again relates to uh, the adoption of a harvest strategy uh, and so that's uh, bubbled up with the, the previous recommendation in terms of progress. Recommendation 15 relates to the transition of fishery management from for the 2A commercial fishery from IPHC to NOAA. You, you just heard a, an update uh, from uh, Dr. Hutchnazak, uh, and we'll also hear a little bit more about that as part of uh, the presentation of paper 14 later in the meeting. Uh, and so at the moment, uh, as being indicated, we do expect that that's going to be implemented and completed in 2023. The next two uh, recommendations, or the last two recommendations that are that are in progress, uh, relate to enhanced cooperation, uh, particularly with non-contracting parties. And so, this relates to our engagement uh, previously with uh, countries that uh, are known to catch Pacific halibut within its broader range, uh, who are not currently parties to the convention. Uh, and so, those three countries are uh, South Korea, uh, 
Japan and Russia. So we have um, limited our engagement with those um, three countries at this point through Pisces as a scientific collaboration and information sharing uh, portal. And so that's where we will be continuing uh, any engagement uh, with those three countries who, who catch Pacific Harbor within their exclusive economic zones. So that's that wraps up the update chair. Uh, I'm certainly happy to look at any of the recommendations that have been completed or completed and or ongoing. Uh, but at this time, I'll pass back to you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. <clears throat> Are there questions for Dave? No. Uh, just on um, <clears throat> recommendation nine. Now, it's been a while since um, the review was done. And I was curious, I can't, I can't remember the background of that recommendation and a little bit of detail behind it. Um, you know, it's been a while since I read that report. Could you just fill me in a bit? Sure, thank you. Yes, and through the chair. Uh, so if, if you can see on the screen there, recommendation 09, the first recommendation from the performance review, and I'll just read it. <coughs> Um, the performance review recommended that observer coverage be adjusted to be commensurate with the level of fishing intensity in each IPHC regulatory area. So when the commission received the report of the second performance review and went through its process of reviewing and potentially adopting or modifying um, the recommendations from the panel, uh, the commission agreed to modify that specific recommendation. And that's where you see the commission directive immediately below that. Uh, and that being that the commission modified the recommendation from the performance review to read that the commission recommends that the IPAC secretariat in consultation with the commission develop minimum data collection standards for Pacific Halibut, uh, the scientific sort of programs, and, and it goes on uh, a little bit more detail. Um, I'm going to stretch my memory. I think it was in 2020 at the annual meeting, uh, the commission decided at that point didn't agree at that point to continue advancing um, that recommendation with the Secretariat's time. And so therefore it was put on hold. Um, and so until we receive a directive that you would like us to uh, pick that recommendation up uh, and move it forward, it's, it's on hold. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Chair. So if we could have the presentation for the next paper, and this is agenda item 3.4. Okay. So let's uh, jump into the next agenda item, agenda item 3.4, and this relates to paper 06. And again, this is, is just a, a brief update at this stage to, to outline that the process that, that will be ongoing um, as part of an iterative process each year. Uh, and this relates to the five-year five program of integrated research and monitoring, which runs from 2022 to 26. <laughs> So just as a, a little bit of background to, to the document itself, uh, so if you'd like to recall that the Secretariat conducts activities to address a range of key issues that are identified um, primarily by the Commission, but also by the various subsidiary bodies who support the Commission uh, and broader stakeholder community. And we funnel those recommendations or key issues through the Commission process for uh, approval each year. Uh, and that would obviously occur at the annual meeting in January. The process of identifying, developing, and implementing um, the various IPHC science-based activities is circular and iterative in nature, and involves a, a number of steps where we take the various ideas that come through, whether it be from the broader stakeholder community or the subsidiary bodies, um, review them in terms of what's uh, operationally feasible for the Secretariat and propose them to the Commission for potential adoption each year. Uh, so this really does uh, incorporate um, idea development and uh, with direct input from those various uh, subsidiary bodies and stakeholder groups and obviously the secretariat staff who have expertise in those areas 
before it's brought to the commission. Um, and then it go, can potentially go through a number of other iterations for improvement before it's adopted. <coughs> we also undertake uh, on, on an ad hoc basis and at the request of the commission additional external peer review. Uh, and that's in addition to, for example, the review that this uh, scientific review, review board would do. In the past, we have undertaken external peer review on the stock assessment uh, and also the management strategy evaluation uh, progress that, that's been made. So we have uh, implemented or commenced the implementation of the plan in 2022, noting that the previous biological and ecosystem science plan ended at, the, at uh, 2021. And as part of what I was saying earlier, the intention uh, and agreement from the commission is that this would remain as, as a living document. Uh, and so this is something that we're going to review and update at least annually, potentially uh, more frequently, uh, based on a number of resources that are available to us at the Secretariat. And, and that ranges from everything from internal funding sources, whether it be from the contracting parties, external grants, whether it be from uh, one of the, the national uh, funding bodies or, or another source, collaborations, whether we have established new agreements and, and collaborative efforts with universities or, or other uh, academic institutions, and then also as our internal expertise changes over time. Each year, and you're going to hear from the Scientific Review Board Chair um, later this morning, uh, each year the SRB may also uh, request or choose to make recommendations to modify the current plan um, based on their analysis of, of, of our scientific efforts. And again, this would come from the Scientific Review Board to the annual meeting for potential adoption or agreement rather uh, in January of each year. The overarching goal of our um, five year program of integrated research and monitoring is, is, is to promote the integration and synergies among the various research and monitoring activities that we do with uh, a primary, our primary goals to improve um, the knowledge through for Pacific Halibut, specifically through the Pacific Halibut stock assessment, management strategy evaluation processes, uh, with the overall aim of providing best possible advice for the commission in, in making your decisions uh, on an annual or more frequent basis. The plan uh, has a number of uh, short, medium and long-term uh, objectives associated with it. Um, with the short and medium articulated within the plan itself and the longer term um, noting that some of our monitoring efforts, for example, are um, not going to end in, in 2026 and so it's just a, a continuing uh, process. As part of that, uh, in pursuit of our overarching objective, which, which I just went through, uh, we have a number of uh, key areas that we're going to be focusing on, obviously undertaking cutting edge, re cutting edge research as, as much as possible for Pacific halibut fisheries management purposes, but also undertaking some uh, applied or methodological research on an annual basis based on requests from the research advisory board, uh, whether that be looking at different gears and how we might be able to um, make uh, the fishery more efficient uh, through to other, uh, other applications. We are uh, attempting to establish new collaborative agreements and interactions with research agencies and the academic in institutions and uh, a similar, uh, as an example would be our memorandum of understanding that we have with CLICES, uh, but then also our collaborative agreements that we are setting up with both uh, domestic agencies within each of the contracting parties and then also academic institutions. The plan is structured in uh, such a way that we highlight four key areas. Um, those being data collection, and this is both fishery dependent and fishery independent data collection biological and ecosystem ecological research, uh, stock assessment and management strategy evaluation. In addition, there is a component that we, we've added in the latest iteration, which specifically responds to commission requests for additional inputs to management and all policy. And, and this has been classified under management support. An example of that would be, for example, where the commission may ask us to take an ad hoc analysis on size limits um, over the, the last number of years uh, would, would be one example. And now that's moved obviously into that management strategy evaluation process as well. Not going to go into uh, a great deal of detail for, for each of these um, 
core areas of, of integrated research and monitoring. The document, uh, as well as the presentation, provides links to our website where you'll be able to drill down uh, into a lot greater detail for, for each of the core areas. So, for example, if you were to go to the stock assessment uh, section within the plan, you'll find links that will take you to the website, which will give you the most recent stock assessment, the historical assessments, um, uh, the peer review that was undertaken, uh, and of course, if there is another peer review in the future, uh, that, that will also be accessible. Similarly, for the management strategy evaluation section, uh, it'll take you to the website where you can go and, and look at the, uh, the tools that have been developed uh, as part of that process, uh, as well as the links to the management strategy advisory board processes. We do uh, plan on reporting out on the success of our annual implementation of the plan. Uh, and again, a reminder that it's, it's a living document and it's going to potentially be modified or uh, improved on an annual basis. And as part of that uh, reporting out, we'll be looking at uh, a number of key measures of success, including the timeliness, accessibility, the relevance of the work we're undertaking, the impact of that work, and of course, the, the reliability uh, as part as it feeds into the decision making process of, of the Commission. A flowchart of, of how all of that comes together uh, is provided on the screen and in, in the paper. And we have those core areas of monitoring, uh, both fishery dependent and fishery independent, uh, biological and ecological research, and stock assessment MSC, which forms the core activities we do in addition to the basic biological understanding work that Dr. Planas and his team are undertaking. Um, and of course, all of this is heavily based on, dependent on rather, uh, our various funding sources, whether it be internal or, or external. Uh, and so with that, Chair, it's, uh, again, I just simply ask that this is uh, an opportunity for the Commission to, to note the plan. Note that between now and the annual meeting um, it, it is the time where the Commission may consider uh, recommending a redirection of those activities in the plan. Uh, with the intention that we would then revise the plan and publish a, a new version in soon after the annual meeting, so in February or March uh, of, of each given year. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks very much, Dave. Um, I think I heard you say at the start that the research plan had been reviewed as it's through SRB. Yes, thank you, Chair. So um, for, I think, the last three, potentially four scientific review board meetings, uh, they have received and um, the draft of the report, of the plan rather, uh, have made a number of suggestions for improvement. And in the SRB report 21, uh, I think they also provide um, confirmation of the plan and how it's being implemented um, with some further potential improvements that could be made depending on funding sources. And you'll and again, you'll hear the scientific Re review board chair, Dr. Cox, present to you later this morning uh, with some additional <coughs> ideas for the potential uh, improvement of the plan. All right, thanks, Dave. Questions? Well, this one. Uh, on page 10, uh, you have uh, scientific publications helping external funding. Can you just uh, explain that a little more? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question and through the chair. Uh, so you're referring to slide 10, um, the little black uh, That's correct, oval yes. here. So this is really uh, the verification process or um, and also accessibility components of the work we do. So if I go back one more slide, um, when we're going to measure how success, um, there's a couple of elements that are, are particularly relevant to that scientific publication component. Uh, first of all is, is timeliness. So we uh, are striving to publish any of the work that we do um, in peer-reviewed journal articles or other formats that may be appropriate for that um, for that particular research stream uh, in, a, in a timely manner, meaning that they should be submitted and published and released and available for the scientific and other um, purpose communities uh, as soon as possible. Uh, and this really comes down to the whole accessibility. Uh, we have moved away from grey literature um, publication of our activities uh, in simple reports of the Commission or in documents before the Commission. Uh, again, with the aim of improving the accessibility um, of the work we do, which by default also 
uh, improves the um, standing of, of, of the scientists and, and the work we're doing at the IPHC. As part of that, you also have uh, elements related to relevance, but also impact and impact not only on the commission uh, and the decision making process of the commission, but the broader scientific community. And, and if we are publishing our work, um, it's more accessible. Um, it is has uh, a lot more trust from from those who are potentially going to use it. And how did that relate to funding, sorry? Yeah, sorry. So, so in terms of funding, um, we have a number of funding sources that we undertake our activities, obviously directly from the contracting parties. Uh, and most of that funding is being targeted specifically at the core areas that the commission needs information to make its decisions upon. Uh, but for external funding, we may have um, a number of activities, for example, associated with the biological and ecosystem science program, where we are contacting um, the NPRB to, to help offset some of the costs of those activities that were undertaken. Uh, and we've just have and his team have been quite successful in receiving that external funding to subsidize those activities so that we can potentially expand them or simply use commission funds for other more direct activities uh, that the commission may request them on. We ex receive external funding um, from quite a number of sources, and, and we will report those out, uh, obviously, as part of that annual financial process. But off the top of my head, we have funds coming from um, NOAA as part of the for, uh, fishery dependent monitoring in Alaska. We have funding from uh, NPRB, uh, and Dr. Finance will go through a, a couple of those uh, components. We also receive um, funding for services, whether it be for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, who provide funding for us to look at rockfish uh, off the Washington coast, for example, uh, in a very targeted manner. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Great, thank you very much. Uh, and so the next agenda item 3.5 is the re report of the 23rd session of the Research Advisory Board. Uh, and so that meeting was held the uh, day before yesterday in Seattle. It was our first um, physical meeting of the Research Advisory Board since 2020. Uh, and I don't know if the Secretary has, she has that report immediately on hand. Um, I, know, I know all of you have received it, so uh, that, that, that's a starting point. Uh, and so while they pull up the report from the website, it's, it's obviously published on the website as well on, on two days ago, uh, I'm going to go through just very quickly some of those core discussions that the RAD had and the, the messages that they wanted to convey to the Commission. So we had uh, discussions on the full breadth of, of scientific activities at the Secretariat, um, primarily related to the Biological and Ecosystem Science Program. Um, and Dr. Planus is going to talk about each of those core streams uh, later today, so I'm, I'm not going to touch on that too much, other than to say that the intent of the Research Advisory Board was the board, uh, the board to review our current activities on things such as our genetics work, migration work, uh, and provide some, some feedback on um, the potential operational modifications to those activities that would better serve the Commission and maybe uh, produce some, some clearer results. We spent a substantial amount of time at the meeting, though, uh, looking at the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey, and, and that was also at the request of the Commission, where you asked for the Research Advisory Board's uh, commentary and input on the operational implementation or potential op uh, implementation of the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey in 2023. So we covered tasks uh, or topics including um, numbers of skates, uh, which uh, we have proposed for a number of areas and in, in past years as well, um, anywhere from four to eight skates in particular charter areas. Um, the overwhelming opinion of both the Research Advisory Board, but also a survey of um, vessel captains that we put out in October, was that they would much rather have um, less than eight skates uh, fishing at any one time. Uh, and we walked them through a little bit about the cost benefits and, and reasonings of having uh, higher skate counts in particular charter areas uh, compared to others. 
Uh, and so the RAB avoided making a specific request or recommendation on the numbers of skates that should or shouldn't be used in particular charter areas, noting the uh, financial um, long-term revenue neutrality target that the, that the Commission has. Uh, with that said, uh, the, the opinion was clear that they would like to have less than eight skates in uh, all IPOC charter areas. It makes it easier uh, operationally to implement the FIS. It also makes it easier for them to attract um, skilled crew to come on the board on the vessels to to undertake uh, the survey. So this is something that we agreed uh, at the RAB that we would take to um, all of the this skippers uh, of the last number of years uh, and hold another um, another meeting uh, online meeting of those vessel captains as well as any of the RAB members who may be interested to join us. Uh, within the next couple of weeks. And so we're going to actually look at whatever decisions come out of this meeting for the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey uh, and then have an iterative, iterative process where we'll talk about each of the charter areas and the challenges. Uh, so, for example, it, it's not uh, uh, operationally viable to have eight skates in some of the, the further afield areas um, versus within um, the core chart, core of areas of this country. We had a number of discussions around the uh, bycatch revenue, uh, and uh, it was the only request for commission consideration, commission consideration at the meeting. Um, the RAB members and, and the vessel captains who were, who were RAB, who are RAB members uh, expressed some, some concern about what the implications might be for um, that bycatch in terms of the handling practices, the revenue that would be associated with the potentially degraded product that would be landed, but more importantly, what that uh, those handling practices might mean for Pacific halibut that's stored in the hull as well. Um, there was um, universal request to compensate the crew for handling any bycatch uh, in some form, whether that would come from the sale of that bycatch, and if that wasn't possible. Uh, from the sale of Pacific halibut, and so it's uh, it's it's a recognition that this may be it is something that would happen, um, but to ensure that the the crew were adequately compensated for for handling that bycatch uh, in, in any case. I think that uh, sort of sums up the, the core areas that we discussed um, as part of the survey. There was a strong request to. Uh, ensure we had some level of uh, survey in 2023 in regulatory area 2A and 4A and B, um, recognizing the, the fiscal um, negatives of, of uh, potential sampling in those areas. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be some stakeholders who probably want to comment on that at some point. Uh, and so I'll, I'll pause there and see if there are any questions or comments. Thank you, Chair. Any questions for Dave? John? Thank you, Paul. Um, Dave, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, there are plans for the Research Advisory Board to chime in on some essentially longer term planning considerations for the set line survey in light of some of the challenges in uh, rising costs and increased revenue. Thank you for the question and through the chair. Uh, yes, that, that, that also um, spikes my memory. There was a discussion uh, around precisely what the survey could look like in the future whether that be uh, looking at uh, electronic monitoring as, a, as an option um, to collect some of the information, which may lighten the load in terms of the need for the number of physical bodies on uh, each vessel versus some vessels. Uh, so there was a desire for the Secretariat to uh, commence that process to look into what other options might be available to us to uh, maintain the survey, but potentially lower our, our costs. Um, there was discussion around the use of, of, of snap gear and versus fixed gear moving forward. And while the RAB stopped short, specifically stopped short of making a recommendation either way, uh, they acknowledged that uh, moving forward, there would most likely be a need to transition to at least incorporating snap gear vessels in, in, the, in the survey, which, which may or may not end up uh, with, with, with a cheaper survey, but it would certainly lead to uh, an increased level of competition and, uh, and obviously there is uh, a level of conflict of interest there in making a recommendation um, for, for, for 
some of our skippers. Uh, I think that's pretty much all I can remember. I don't know if anyone else at the meeting recalls anything else. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, just uh, the discussion on the whale depredation mitigation strategies, and was there much discussion on that, and then how detailed did that get? Thank you. Just looking for Dr. Planus, but I don't see him. He might be in the, in the overflow. Um, Ian, did you want to, because you, you were sort of chiming in on that as well. There was discussion, and I, I'm trying not to steal any thunder that's going to come up as part of Dr. Planus's presentation later, but Ian. Yeah, thank you. Key piece was just clarifying. We changed the criteria several years ago, and making sure that the RAB was up to speed on what the revised criteria were. Uh, noting that we had revisited the sperm whale criteria, as we still document sperm whales diving and apparently feeding on deer at a significant distance from the vessel. So those criteria are pretty strict um, in terms of excluding stations where we we've, we've observed sperm whales during hauling. One of the key pieces that was a point of discussion in previous RAB meetings was with regard to um, orca depredation. And in that case, there was some concern that our criteria might not be capturing all the depredation. So we have at least two um, hooks returned with just lips on the hooks. And it was noted that sometimes the crew and, and or the scientific staff have observed cases where we don't see lips coming back, but it's very clear that orcas are depredating on the gear. And, so we did clarify for the RAB that that is a that that's a situation where the crew can make that call even if we don't meet our criteria for lips on hooks, we the crew can still make the call that depredation was occurring. And so that station we will be excluded. It's not only the, the criteria. And that was a that was a point of concern in the past that the crew sometimes sometimes we had cases where the crew felt like they knew depredation was happening but couldn't if it wasn't meeting our formal criteria, but in fact it was. Thanks very much, Ian. Any other questions? <coughs> Not seeing any there. Well, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, the last agenda item under this component uh, 3.6 is the reports of the Scientific Review Board, and we, I believe we do have Dr. Cox, who is uh, going to speak to his presentation um, relating to the reports of both the 20th and also the 21st session of the Scientific Review Board held this year. Uh, so Secretary, if you could bring up that presentation and then um, activate Dr. Cox's uh, microphone, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Sean, go ahead. Okay, thank, thanks. Um, I guess, uh, are they bringing up my presentation or? Uh, I hope so, yes. Just, just uh, hold, hold one more moment. If you okay. Like. There we go. Okay, well, uh, thanks for having us um, and giving us the opportunity to present this the outcomes of the SRB for the past uh, couple of meetings. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, do I, I actually, I think I can control these slides. Okay, good. Um, oh, you guys edited my my SRB slide. I, I, I left a deliberate gap there. We had four SRB members last year, and now we're down to three. So I had the I had the missing SRB member in there. But um, so there's myself, Kim Scribner, and Olaf Jensen. Uh, Kim Scribner has let us know that he will be, uh, I think, next September. Is that correct, Dave? Will be his last SRB right. meeting. Yeah. So um, we've got some. We need some uh, SRB recruitment, I think, coming up in the next year to get the, to get back up to our numbers. Um, so I'm just going to focus on some of the main highlights of our recommendations and requests, things that I think are relevant to um, the commission's discussion 
as you may recall the our summer meeting which is in june and that was srb 20 focuses mainly on research topics and then the september meeting focuses more specifically on um, the fis things that are more relevant to the upcoming annual meeting so for for our june meeting first thing we did we we endorsed the 2023 design of the survey um, fairly fairly non-controversial and provisionally endorsed the 24 and 25 designs uh, noting that we will re be reviewing those again in, in upcoming meetings uh, one of the issues that came up was was the in 4b that the precision of that particular survey uh, region is now getting above the the threshold the kind of design threshold for uh, precision on those and so we just recommended to, to to look for ways to mitigate that by possibly increasing the pool of possible bidders or whatever could be done uh, to get those some sampling effort out there um, in terms of the stock assessment uh, the big thing that happened this year was um, that we saw some results with um, estimating natural mortality um, instead of assuming that they were known in advance and so now we recommended that this be adopted in the short uh, areas of fleets models uh, you can't really estimate natural mortality in the long ones but um, in the short ones you can so uh, that was our main recommendation there and in terms of data weighting, which is always an issue, um, especially with you know age composition data and stuff, um, Ian showed us a, a, a bootstrapping procedure that he had was looking at, and so we thought that was a great idea as well. So we recommended adopting that. And we also got a chance to look at the five-year program of uh, research and monitoring again noting that it's coming along really well uh, it's it's it is a living document and it, and you know each time we see it it continues to get better and more specific and more structure to it and um, one of the things we mentioned here was recommending that the secretariat produce peer-reviewed data report publications and i think uh, I, I think i just heard dave talking about this which which was instead of um publishing things kind of in-house and, and in what's called gray literature is to put it out um, in a more formal peer review data report format so that external users can access it, um, benefit from it, but also um, you can track the external use of it, which um, you know would feedback to you, um, give you some feedback on how people are using uh, the information that you're providing and so on. So it's a, it's a good kind of feedback mechanism. Another fairly substantial, uh, well, request here, which um, was to not implement stock synthesis as an estimation procedure in the MSE um, uh, simulations as in, within the management procedure. Um, you know, you're, 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 Periodic assessments are done using stock synthesis, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to try to simulate the behavior of that stock synthesis model um, in the management strategy evaluation. What we suggested was to, to use some simpler method um, uh, to mimic an assessment or, or even just use a, a simpler method to inform the, the TCEY uh, setting procedure. I, I think I have a comment later later on. There's a follow-up in September on that more specific um, request. But the first one was to, to not use stock synthesis. It's probably more headache than it's worth um, in the simulations. Um, so this one, in, in terms of the biological and ecosystem program, um, just, just some ideas about being more specific about prioritizing uh, how, how the 
biological research is prioritized specifically to address uncertainties in the assessment and the MSE to kind of keep it focused on informing those two aspects of the secretary's work. Um, so moving on to our September meeting. Uh, again, this was, I guess this just came up a moment ago. Um, our recommendation here was that the commission look uh, more deliberately at how to choose what types of research should be funded internally versus externally. Um, the big difference here is work that's funded internally, you have a lot more flexibility and control over how that those projects proceed. If you're funded externally uh, by NPRB or wherever, some large granting agency, you know, you have to present, say, you know, a five-year program of work under that funding package. And you have to pretty much step-by-step step go through that thing, start to finish, regardless of what you're learning as you go. Now, you, you can sometimes make, you know, various uh, adjustments along the way, but um, you don't have a lot of flexibility in, in adapting as you go along. And so the point here is that if if certain things are funded internally, you could, you know, be much more flexible about treating things as pilot projects, deciding when when something should be, you know, stopped if it doesn't look like it's working out, um, change directions if if the research is pointing you in another direction. So, um, this would be something that uh, we recommended the commission take a take a look at. In terms of the the MSE, uh, one of the one of the axes of or one of the controls that are being looked at is the size limit. Um, and you know one of the implications of of reducing the size limit, as you as you're probably well aware, you know that that could change a lot of the um, economics of the fishery and we've seen this in other fisheries where you know, it looked it looked good at the time to eliminate a size limit but uh, when you run through the actual economics of it it's kind of borderline whether whether it would pay off so anyway that um uh, so we recommended some further analysis of that uh the second one here the really the main point in the second bullet um, is the the second one there um, is to look at in when evaluating multi-year management procedures you know setting TCEYs for two or three years or whatever to just keep track of how the TCEY changes in that assessment year these are these are things you know, it's, it's kind of on the you know I would call them you know secondary kinds of objectives that you know you'd want to keep track of but may not be your actual ultimate deciding variables but uh, now this one here yeah i think part of the conversation here was was about the genetic sex composition data sampling uh, noting that you you may not need to do this every single year. It may be something that you could do um, in longer over longer periods now that uh, a lot of the information is kind of there's some consistency year to year in the sex composition of the catch and so you may not need to do this every year. so that's something to consider. Uh, a fairly detailed recommendation here which, um, you know, it's kind of specific, but the, the reason I brought it up here is just to to just keep, you know, close skin market capture, you know, is something that is is certainly should be in the conversation for uh, Pacific halibut. I know there's a lot of work going on on the East Coast in Atlantic Canada for Atlantic halibut, and they're making quite a bit of progress there. Um, this is something that uh, should continue to be on the radar. Um, for for the Pacific. 
So this was, yeah, I think this is the one. Yeah, yeah, this is the more specific request that we made about the MSE and developing management procedures. So we recommend or we requested to see uh, management procedures that are run on a three-year assessment cycle where the TCEY um, is set in proportion to changes in the FIS index directly. Um, this is, goes back to uh, instead of running something like stock synthesis and running a model, uh, this changing the TCEY in proportion to the FIS would be much uh, simpler and straightforward than uh, implementing something like stock synthesis. Um, it gives you the opportunity in between, you know, in, in, in practice, this would give you a few years of uh, time to not be running stock synthesis all the time and doing all the work that that entails and maybe, uh, you know, doing other things that are also priorities. Uh, it, it, the three-year one also happens to match the current uh, three-year full assessment cycle. And this approach is very similar to what's done uh, for Southern Bluefin Tuna, for example, very, very successfully. And that's the end of our, of our highlights. I'll take any questions if you have them. All right. Thanks very much, Sean. Questions for Sean? Uh, good morning, Doug Cox. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Hi, Neil. Um, I wondered if you could offer any thoughts about, I can't remember the slide number, but you had a recommendation that related to uh, exploring other ways to bring the coefficient of variation below 15% in four yeah. and maybe somewhere else. That was my I, I'm just curious, when you look across experiences with other fisheries, um, and the targets uh, that they may be aiming for with their surveys for coefficients of variation or other metrics, related metrics. How, how does this one compare? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I, I just went over this in my fisheries class yesterday. <laughs> we were actually showing what happens to your, uh, to your risk your perception of risk depending on your coefficient of variation for the survey and it, there it's definitely not it, it's not a linear thing like um you know the absolute lowest is the best because it costs you a huge amount of money to get something you know in an area where it you know a less than 15 percent you know you may be spending a lot of money to get it down below that and not getting a lot of benefit for your stock assessment uh, advice so for um just to give you an example our our sable fish survey for example in bc our our cv is about 10 percent, and we have no trouble with that uh, once it gets over 25 or 30 percent you're getting that that's getting into kind of the it doesn't sound like much you know 25 30 percent uh, variability around an estimate sounds pretty decent, but when you're trying to extract information about stock dynamics and you know uh, you know the kinds of information you're trying to extract from a stock assessment, that that becomes uh, not as good, uh, not nearly as good. And then over thirty percent, it it gets in the kind of not very useful territory very quickly. So you know fit. In terms of an area like 4B, which is fairly small relative to the rest of the fishery, and I don't know, I don't want to stir up any, uh, maybe Ray can talk about this, but, um, you know, 15%, it's quite good. It's quite a good expectation for something like 4B, but maybe 20% would be, would be more workable, for example. I don't think it would cost you a whole lot. And I think it could, it's probably something that could be tested as well to see, well, what if we had, you know, a, a CV of 20% in 4B, would that, what would be the consequences of that? So, you know, I, I think a lot of, a lot of fisheries would give their, you know, their right arm for a CV of 15%, 10 to 15% on a survey. 
I don't know if that answered your question. Hopefully. I know that that's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, the other one that sort of stood out to me was the recommendation about the three year assessment cycle. Uh, so, um, wondered if, I mean, was the SRB any more prescriptive about what it would mean to track the FIS survey in the in between years? That's kind of one part of my question. Um, and then I, I wondered, you, you made the point about, uh, how it's simpler and more transparent uh, than a model, which I think in the context of the engagement we have with halibut stakeholders might kind of introduce the question of understanding the value of the more sort of involved modeling process relative to something like simply tracking survey. Mm -hmm. and so I wondered if you could comment a bit more on those things. Yeah, and that's a again, that's a really that's a great point. Um, the, the latter one, especially that you know, one of the things that I've always been impressed with is you know, at the annual meeting, everybody's there for the stock assessment. You know, everybody's engaged in the information that's being presented, and you know, there's some value to that. You know, in in bringing people along. Um, you know, uh, so. I don't know how you quantify that, but uh, the alternative would be to do something like that every third year. And in the years in between, uh, the discussion, you know, you wouldn't be seeing, for example, you know, Ian presenting all the ensemble models and all the age composition, you know, all that stuff. What you would be seeing is, okay, the FIST, you know, we had a TCUI uh, last year of whatever it is, 40 million pounds. The FIS went up by 3.2%. So we're going to increase the TCUI 3.2%. And, and that would happen, I guess, uh, you know, for, for a couple of years, and then you would update the assessment, um, you know, update the, the parameters of that rule that that FIS um, interim rule and continue on. So, so it's like you, you know, you're doing an assessment every three years, and all you're doing is using some simple method to set the the TCUI in the years in between. You're not pretending that you know that whatever that method you're using in between formal assessments is any way you know a stock assessment. It's simply a way to set the TCEY in between stock assessments. The simplest approach, of course, is to set three-year TCEYs, for example. Um, but you know, some people aren't too comfortable with that and would rather have that uh, ability to adapt in between those full assessments to what the data say. Um, you know, and so the the benefit to that is that maybe you, you it gives you space to have other conversations, I guess, about you know where the fishery is, you know what you want to be doing. So, I mean, I don't have an answer. Um, yeah, and so I mean that that is helpful. I think that helps me understand kind of what it might mean. Um, I guess you know there certainly some <coughs> voices or uh, perspectives that um, I think really see the it's easier to follow the link from survey results to decisions than it may be to sort of see how that gets um, processed through a modeling exercise and so I, I think another part of the conversation on this particular recommendation is sort of like you know, the the value and perhaps the limitations of, if any, of a simple sort of tracking to survey changes year to year versus the value and limitations of the more intricate modeling that, um, you know, under this recommendation would happen every three years. In other words, why not just keep doing this? Um, like, what, what does the modeling give us that the tracking of survey results might not?
Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, and it's also what you could substitute in there, you know, that there, there are certain, you know, research things that could be done that, you know, for example, instead of presenting the stock assessment in the two, <coughs> two or three years in between, you would maybe present some other pretty important results that you have in there. Um, the, the thing with, uh, you know, with this situation is, you know, you've got this, you've got this survey that essentially is, is so comprehensive and precise. Um, there's not a lot of, you know, huge gaps in understanding that you'd say, oh, you know, we're going to, we discovered this massive difference somewhere. Like, you know, the, the, the whole system is, seems fairly stable and like, it's, you know, you're not going to see like massive changes from one assessment to the next. So, yeah, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know what they, uh, what to tell you there. Okay, thank you. Other situations like for a Southern Bluefin tuna, for example, the one I brought up, which is similar for on a three year cycle. So there, uh, you know, the, the management procedure is created and then it just runs. You know, the last one ran for 10 years. Uh, it, every two years, there was a stock assessment, like a formal stock assessment every two years to report out on the status of the stock because, you know, originally when the procedure was created, the, the stock was like whatever, 5% of unfished abundance and un, nearly endangered. So there was a recovery plan in place. So the stock assessment was done just to report on progress towards recovery and reporting out to, uh, you know, agencies like FAO and things like that. And then after the 10th year or so, um, by that time, some, all kinds of new information had come forward. There was the, there was a, the close kin market capture was now available. They had genetic tagging data available, all this new stuff. So it was all redone. The whole um, you know, management procedure, the operating models, everything was updated and redone and created a new procedure that is now ticking along. So it's a different situation because that one, you know, there was, there was a lot more to be gained in the inter intervening years in terms of the research and, and what was done, which would have been a real waste if you were doing stock assessments every year and not moving for those big data advances. All right, um, <clears throat> any other questions for Sean? Here. Uh, slide 12. Um, <clears throat> had to do with uh, funding. And I was curious, did, did you guys identify some pro, uh, some some studies that are you'd rather not continue on with? You want to kill them, uh, but you can't. <laughs> or was this a, no, we didn't want to kill anything. <laughs> or was this more of a cautionary tale? Yeah. Um. I'm trying to remember if we had anything specific. Maybe uh, Josette may, may be a better person to ask about if he sees any of his current projects, for example, that... Oh, sorry, my mic just disappeared for a second. I'm trying to think of the ones that... I can't think of any offhand. But I know there are some fairly large externally funded projects, and that was just the point. Was um, I can't think of any specific ones that go in one or the other. But for example, if you if you were going to say fund close skin market capture to, to develop that for this stock, uh, would you want to do it externally or internally? Because internally, you know. Close skin market capture is something that is directly related to estimating abundance. So th this that's a has huge implications for the quality of stock assessments and things. I, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't want to totally fund that externally and, and be be tied to a specific, say, five-year plan of developing that, uh, assuming everything's going to go well. Um, so, you know, it may be something that's worth dedicating funds internally to at least parts of it, like, for example, doing a pilot project and, and getting, uh, you know, seeing what what the challenge is and, and are going to be going forward. I don't want to kill We didn't have any specific projects to kill. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Sean, I had one on, I think it's slide. 10? Uh, nine. Nine. Oh, no, slide eight, sorry. <coughs> so, when you're reviewing the research plan, um, do you have uh, the ability to comment on individual programs or projects? I think if, if we want, I know um, like the bio, biological sciences program is, I mean, that's the that's kind of the biggest one that has kind of tentacles in all kinds of different directions um, where a lot of it is kind of basic research that uh, there's a lot to comment on there. So I know Kim, especially that's, you know, a lot of the work is, you know, Kim Scribner's expertise. So he provides lots of input to that. The other ones are, you know, more within the, the MSE and stock assessment. Like I said, there's um, those aren't so far reaching, so they're a bit more specific. But we haven't, I don't think we've made any particular comments on where the directions should go uh, since we kind of do that along the way here. And we did have some input on kind of the structure of it, kind of what the evaluation criteria for the plan are, you know, in developing some of the overall objectives of the plan. But is that what you meant, or? Yeah, well, I guess um, what it was meaning is um, the research plan is kind of at a higher level. Um, it sets priorities and directions um, based upon input from the commissioners. But I'm wondering about indivi individual um, uh, research projects, whether you actually dwell down into the details. I mean, you clearly have on MSC, but have you on any of the other projects? And is that really the best use of your time? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I recall the first go we had at the plan, you know, we had pages and pages of comments. Um, I think Kim Scruton's comments were about five pages that got into, it's, and it wasn't, it, there were comments on specific projects, but they tend to boil down to similar, uh, for him, you know, a lot of the issues, it's hard to comment on a project sometimes without knowing exactly what's going into the project. So, you know, the methods that are going to be used, the data that's going to be collected, how it's going to be collected, like that kind of information you need to comment further uh, a lot of times. So I think you'll see, and you've probably seen that over the years in our um, recommendations, just asking for, you know, details when it comes to projects. Because one of the things that we've noticed is like, we tend to review things that have been, are kind of well along either, you know, already developed, already in progress and that sort of thing. And at that point it's, it's hard it's harder to comment on it since something is already up and running and you 
you know, you're just um, kind of looking at how it's going. So I, I think if there are specific projects in there, we could comment on them if, if you know, people wanted us to do that. But, you know, it kind of runs into um, some time constraints, I think, if given the, the things that we review in the time we have. All right, thanks, Sean. Thanks for your uh, answers for Neil and Peter's questions. They were, they were helpful, very helpful. I guess Welcome. the question for you, um, which Sean pointed out at the start of his presentation, that there's currently three members, and roughly a year from now, there will be potentially two. So, what's the, what is the plan to um, additional bodies? Yeah, thank you very much. So the, the current terms of reference and rules procedure for the SRB uh, allow us to go up to five. We have in the recent past targeted recruitment mm -hmm. of individuals for, um, let's say maybe not emergent areas, but areas of, of emerging refocus or focus. And one of those, for example, was on the set line survey following the uh, expansion series, and, and, and that's why we targeted the, the recruitment of, of Dr. Sven Kraspus, who's been up taking the job with the European Commission and had to step out um, due to uh, their, their existing rules. We are clearly uh, moving in a direction of genetics and genomics, and that, that's why, again, we brought uh, Dr. Schrodner uh, on five years ago, or was it, I think, um, to, to assist us with that, with that line of work. We were traditionally looking specifically at stock assessment and then management strategy evaluation. Uh, so it really comes down to where, what we see the commission um, needing o over the coming years. And, and there will clearly be a need to replace Kim with a uh, Kim version two. Um, given the level of genetics genomics works that, that are being undertaken by uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Myers and his team. Um, so for Kim, we're, we're, we're on the lookout. We've been looking for, for a while and um, courting a number of potential uh, candidates. And then once, once we have that reduced panel, we will we'll bring that to you for, for additional input. But then it, it's, this is maybe a question for the commission itself, is, is where else do you see um, a need for scientific peer review. Uh, we can certainly come up and indicate that we, we need a, a genetics uh, genomics expert to continue reviewing the work that we're undertaking. We, we already have um, Dr. Cox specifically for the stock assessment and his MSc experience with Southern Blue Pin Tuna. Um, if we were to move into close kin um, work, it would be ideal to have somebody who, who has that expertise but I'm, I'm not sure we're quite there yet in terms of identifying funding sources. So maybe that's something we'll, we'll propose uh, down, down the track. Um, and the alternative is just to get someone who's, who's more uh, as, a, as a generalist to do some, some reviewing of the theoretical uh, science that we've been undertaking. And uh, but so yes, we certainly are looking and, and trying to recruit so we'd also appreciate any feedback. If you think there's a particular area of focus that you would like external review on through the SRB over the coming years, that, that would be appreciated as well. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dave. Any other comments or questions before we move on? Not seeing any. Thanks again. I have one. I have one. Yeah. <laughs> I had my hand up, but anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. If, if you, you know, I, I would say an ideal person would get would be Mark Bravington. I don't know if you've tried contacting him from CSIRO in Australia, but I know he's he's been working with the Atlantic Halibut folks on their CKMR work. So, you know, the and maybe you don't need him for you know a three-year term or, or or whatever and you maybe you don't need him um for all the meetings since he'd be traveling from australia but who knows i, I think he you know he would be the absolute best person you could get absolutely um and and would move any you know, if you intend to go in that direction you move the best 
So that's my opinion. All right, thanks for that, Sean. That's helpful. Okay, I think we can go on. Great, thank you, Sean. Um, we are at uh, our coffee break. Um, and would you like to adjourn for 15 minutes and refresh and we get these microphones working? Yeah, that would be good. Okay, so for everybody, everybody online, we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you.
All right. Moving on to the uh, fishery independent data overview. And Jason, you're going to talk us through that. Excellent, Keith. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Um, the preliminary data for fisheries in the uh, areas. Um, this is preliminary data. It's data through the 9th of November. Uh, so some of the fisheries will have been finished up before the 9th of November, so that will be complete data. Other fisheries um, data, the, the fisheries will still be going on, on after the 9th of November, and so um, we'll show you projections to the end of the year for those fisheries. And I'll try to point that out as we go through, uh, but it is labeled on the slide, so hopefully it's, it's fairly obvious. Um, so I'm just going to, in this talk, give you estimates for some of the sectors. Um, I urge you to look at the paper for the specifics on all the fisheries. Um, the data will be net weight, and um, as I said before, some of the fisheries were not completed by the end of November, and so. Those fisheries will have a projection associated with it. The map on the right, it's a bit difficult to see, but um, it actually maps out um, where we had samplers uh, in the different areas. In 2A, we had um, samples, samplers in Charleston and Newport, Oregon, as well as Seattle and Bellingham, Washington. In 2B, we had a uh, port sampler in Port Hardy and Prince Rupert. In um, the southeast of Alaska, we had uh, folks in Petersburg and Juneau. Um, and then, and uh, looks like there's another one on there I can't read, <laughs> and I don't recall. Um, the, in the Gulf, we had uh, staff in Homer and Sitka and Kodiak, and then we had one uh, sampler out of the Aleutians at Dutch Harbor. Um, we noticed that uh, Akatan was getting uh, quite a number of uh, offloads this year. And so we decided to try and place uh, the Dutch Harbor individual in Actan to do a little bit of extra sampling there this year. Uh, we were successful at putting her out there for a short period of time, so that was good. And, and I consider it a success because we made the contacts and figured out the logistics of the year. Um, to sample one vessel in Actan because of a COVID outbreak, and she did not get back to Dutch Harbor. Uh, but at least we um, determined that we can actually put someone out there and do a little bit of sampling, so that's that's good. Um, and for 2022, uh, the total mortality was 17.8 metric tons, or 39.3 million pounds. And the way that breaks down is 71% uh, of that is direct and commercial fisheries, 17% recreational fisheries, 8% non-direct and commercial discards, 3% fisheries and 1% this. If we look at the fisheries relative to the TCEY, we see the direct commercial fisheries are projected to be about 92% of the TCEY. Uh, recreational fisheries are projected to be about 0.1%. Subsistence fisheries, 99%. And the non direct commercial discards, about 81% of the TCEY. The total Coming to projected to be about 92 percent. We take a closer look at um, different areas, two countries. Canada regulatory area 2B is projected to be 100 percent of the total mortality limit. Uh, the U.S. is expected to be at about 90 percent of the total mortality limit. Um, the different regulatory areas in the U.S. are broken down here. I won't go through them. Uh, just note that the um, lowest percentage of the TCEY is in area 4B, and the highest was in um, 2C. So the total TCEY is expected to be about 92%. If you add in the U26, 
non-directed commercial discards, um, it, the total comes to about 93%. Here we're looking at the cumulative percent attainment of the limit in the left panel and the cumulative weight limit in the right panel. Uh, these figures can be found on our website at these links at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and these include all areas. Uh, the black line is the average for the last three years, and the thicker yellow line is the 2022 data. And so what you notice is that the cumulative percent attainment is a little bit below three-year average for all areas, uh, but the cumulative weight landed is about almost exactly the same as the three-year average for all areas. Drilling down into the two countries, um, Canada, the projection, projected uh, landings is 2,532 metric tons, or um, about uh, two percent under the fishery limit for the quota share fishery. And again, if we look at the cumulative percent attainment, we see a similar pattern as we saw for all areas in Canada. Uh, percent attainment is a little bit below the three-year average. The uh, cumulative weight landed is uh, more or less similar to the three-year average. Moving to the United States, look at your area 2A, Washington, Oregon, California. These fisheries, um, these two fisheries, the Treaty Indian Directed Commercial Fishery and the Directed Commercial Fishery were completed before the 9th of November, and so these are complete data. Uh, fishery limit for the Treaty Indian Directed Commercial was 226 tons. They caught 226 tons, and that's 100% of the limit. The directed commercial fishery limit was 115 tons. They caught 109 tons, 4% under the limit. The salmon troll and single fish fisheries, which incidentally catch and, and keep halibut, were still ongoing as of the 9th, 9th of November. And so those fisheries uh, numbers here are projections. Fishery limit for the salmon troll fishery is 20.2 tons. Uh, they, they caught, they're projected to catch 12.3 uh, tons, uh, which is 39% under the limit. Sablefish fishery limit was 23 tons. They're projected to catch 28 tons. Um, that's 22% over the limit. And if you look at cumulative percent attainment and landed in 2A, you see that both percent attainment for 2022 and the cumulative weight landed for 2022 is a little bit higher than the three-year average. Turning to Alaska, the quota share fishery, again, is not complete by the 9th of November, and so these are projections. The limit is 9,757 tons. They're projected to catch 8,737 tons, or 10% under the fishery limit. The Inet Island Reserve Fishery, there is no limit. They had caught 14 tons um, by the 2nd of October. Uh, for Alaska, the percent attainment, the percent, or, uh, sorry, cumulative weight landed, um, mirrors what we saw for all areas percent attainment a little bit below the three-year average, but cumulative weight landing um, more or less similar to the three-year average. Finally, we just like to ask the commissioners to note the paper and uh, realizing that these are preliminary numbers, we'll provide the final numbers of the paper. In the Thank you, Jason. Any questions for Jason? Peter? <laughs> Not so much a question, but do you mind uh, going back to the hyperlink to the uh, uh, the landings? Is it possible to 
bring that up. Which one? Which one is it the landings one? The first one? Let's see, I'm clicking. Yeah. Oh, it's not going to work. Oh, quick. Am I able to? I'm sorry. <laughs> Those online are just standing by. We can come back to it if there's another question to you. Keeping you on your toes. Yes. Yeah, just, uh, is it possible for you, it just happens to coincide with when I started running boats. Could you coincide, uh, just select all years on this? I believe you can, yes. Yeah, it's right. It's a box. I just wanted to, yeah, you could see where we're, and so the red line is where we currently are, right? I believe that's true, although I'm having a hard time reading it. Yes. I just want to demonstrate like that's where, you know, we're at a, we're struggling here a little bit, it looks like, as compared to where I started in my career, it's where we're at now. And then could you just also, instead of doing percent fishery, like you demonstrated before, do uh, cumulative towns? <clears throat> And you can really see the dramatic effect, like where the, the stock is, uh, we're, we're not harvesting near to the level that we used to. And I just want to demonstrate that because some of the things that are coming up, I think uh, it's good to keep this in mind. Thank you for that. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for that, Peter. Any other questions or comments? I don't see many. Thanks very much, Nick. So we'll move on to um, 4.2.1. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we will. I'll be covering the uh, IPHC Fishery Independent Satellite Survey Design and Implementation in 2022. I first wanted to just start off by introducing, um, well, reintroducing myself and also in, and my team, um, as well as our new uh, staff member who will be joining us in January, right after the new year. Kevin Cole will be joining the uh, the FITS headquarters team. Uh, Kevin has been working in the field aboard several uh, FITS chartered vessels uh, for a number of years, I believe six years. So we are looking forward to him uh, joining joining the team in January. The primary objective of the FITS is standardized fishery independent data collection for the Pacific halibut stock assessment and stock distribution estimation. Looking at the Pacific halibut distribution and abundance trends, and we're collecting biological data such as sex, maturity, and age. We use standardized gear, which for 2022 was strictly fixed gear, uh, with 1,800 
feet escape to about 100 hooks spaced 18 feet apart. Number three, circle hooks are threaded through the front on 24 to 48 inch canyons, and the seven to 10 pound weights are placed on each non-acre skate end. The fist uses frozen chum bait with number two semi-bright or better quality, and this bait is cut to a quarter to a third of a pound. And captains work with the setline survey specialists uh, deployed aboard each vessel to ensure that the bait weights are standards and captains then sign off on bait quality. This map shows the planned design for the 2022 Fishery Independent Setline Survey. The survey this past year ran from the 27th of May to the 15th of September in comparison to 2021 when it ran from the 28th of May to the 14th of September. And in 2020, noting that this was um, uh, a unique COVID season where we began the season on the 26th of June and ran to the 9th of September. Eight vessels participated in the this this year in comparison to 13 in 2021 and 11 in 2020. The 2022 survey design had 1,188 stations planned in comparison to 2021 with 1,346 and in 2020, 951 stations were planned. These are ineffective stations and sightings in 2022. Please note that there was 45 total ineffective stations for the 2022 FIS. I'd like to highlight the uh, whale depredation ineffective stations where we saw six, uh, we saw a total of 13 ineffective stations in regulatory areas 2C and 3A combined. And then in area four, particularly 4A and 4CDE, we saw combined 10 <coughs> stations were ineffective due to orca depredation. This shows the uh, percentage of ineffective stations uh, dating back to 1998. You'll notice that the largest percentage is those that blue bar, which would be whale depredation. In 2021 and in 2022, we saw uh, approximately 5% of all fish stations deemed ineffective, largely due to whale depredation. Um, noting that Area 4A tends to have the highest percentage of ineffective stations. Uh, this year, Area 4 in general had the, the highest percentage with um, pork depredation in particular. And then if you look further back, you'll see um, larger orange bars. Those, are, those were due to significant shark depredation um, back in the early 2000s. The secondary objective of the FIS is mid to long-term revenue neutrality, which we strive to achieve through an improved fish sale process. Our request for tender is issued for each fish sale and all bids are rated against specified criteria. Um, we've established controls for the review and approval for each sale, and upon the completion of each offload, the buyers are invoiced. Um, our charter agreements also involve a request for tender, as well as um, all submissions are rated against the specified criteria listed in the tender specifications. To further achieve uh, the long-term revenue neutrality, we are currently sell sampled sublegal U32 Pacific halibut. Please note that in 2022, the price was slightly less as we've seen since we started selling these fish. Um, in 2022, the price was 12% less than our legal size O32 Pacific halibut. And our tertiary objectives is collaboration. In 2022, we collaborated with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife off the coast of Washington to complete eight rockfish index stations. We also worked in regulatory area 2A with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to complete dockside rockfish sampling. Um, in Alaska, we collected Pacific cod and spiny dogfish lengths aboard the FIST vessels. And in 2B this year, we completed a to dockside rockfish sampling um, collaboration in, in partnership with DFO, PHMA, and um, 
AMR, where the uh, where specific rockfish, including yellow eye colback and shortbreaker and rough eye, were tagged aboard fish vessels and then sampled by AMR toxide in those two reports. And as always, agreements are continuing to be discussed for 2023 and moving forward. This slide provides links to the various FIS data available on the IPHC website. And this shows our predicted versus actual catch for IPHC regulatory area. Before, I would like to note that while this slide says predicted, it's uh, the predicted values are based on the last time each given station was fished. Fish. So if the station was fished in 2021, we're using the catch data from that 2021 station. Um, whereas if the station hasn't been fished since, let's say, 2017, we're using catch data from, from that year. So it's last time it was fished versus what was caught this year. I want to particularly note that regulatory area 3A did see a, a fairly significant difference from predicted versus actual catch in the FIS this year at 54% of the predicted catch. I also want to note that um, as it is known that we did miss, miss some areas due to lack of vessel participation, this slide does represent a sort of apples to apples comparison. We're only looking at those stations that we sampled versus what we actually caught. Uh, we're not including any stations within a certain regulatory area that we did not sample whatsoever. So for example, in 3A, we were unable to sample Gore Point in 2022. Therefore, those stations within Gore Point are not included in that predicted catch value. Overall, coastwide, we saw 78% of the actual catch um, versus the predicted catch. This table shows the average price by regulatory area in U.S. dollars. Coastwide, the average price during the 2022 FIS was $7.72 U.S. dollar. Noting that in 2B, um, this is a U.S. dollar converted rate, we saw the highest prices at $9.01 per pound. Um, and then in Alaska, we saw $7.44 a pound. Um, I'd also like to note in area 4A, where the fish go directly to the frozen market, we did see a, a fairly significant price increase from last year in the frozen market as well, as you can see in the comparison from 2021. And this shows the uh, changes in the average price over time dating back to 20, uh, year 2000 and noting that in 2022, we, we saw the highest average price coastwide at $7.72. This slide uh, shows the total sales. Um, I would like to note that this actually is total invoice. This error, there's an error stating that it was invoiced as of September 6th, but this is actually our, our total sales um, for the completion of the season with a total of $3,194,874. With the comparison to 2021, where there's $5,498,404. I wanted to note, um, as hinted previously in my presentation, that we did have a lack of vessel open this season that caused uh, some areas within the 2022 FIS to be left unsampled. Um, this was due to lack of vessels overall, um, lack of vessel bids, just lack of vessels to be able to participate in any way. This was largely due to um, the sable fish quota being highly increased this past year uh, and vessels choosing to focus on fishing their stable fish quota and not being able to participate in the FIS this past year. We also, um, upon research, uh, outreach, excuse me, found that a number of vessels had switched from fixed gear to staff gear, which currently based on the 2022 standards, we were looking strictly for fixed gear uh, vessel participation. Um, a number of vessels experience issues with crew retention as well as just crew recruitment in general, uh, both throughout the season and prior to the season was very challenging for our vessels 
to uh, maintain um, adequate staffing. As, and then also there was a few, a, a few vessels that had to um, main, perform significant maintenance on their vessels, which about, not, didn't allow them to participate in the, the season. And with that, I will end my presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kayla. Any questions? <clears throat> John? Thanks. Uh, Kayla, back to slide 12. Uh, if I heard you correctly, the um, predicted versus actual catch here is based just on the previous year's survey results, right? So I, I guess I hadn't realized that, and I'm, I'm wondering how you account for anomalies there. Uh, where it may indicate some wide variation that really so. Yes, yeah. Thank you. And I, and I will allow a lot more of this discussion to fall on um, Dr. Ian Stewart and, and Ray Webster as they can provide a lot more um, detailed answers to this. Um, there was, honestly, there was just a, a, a it was a challenging year. I know there was uh, vessels, the time of season, which we don't like to necessarily rely on that being the only uh, reason for change, uh, vessels participating early on in the season versus uh, later, um, within the fifth season, excuse me. And there's just, um, yeah, I, I apologize. I might call on Dr. Stewart for a slightly better answer. <laughs> This is just a very um, simple method to for the survey to account for what they caught last time versus what they caught this time. When we go through the projection process for, for example, budgets for upcoming years, um, we're, we're using a totally <coughs> different process for that. And we're actually accounting for the potential for stock decline or increase in demand in that situation from previously observed. And so just to follow up on that, I, I guess I'm wondering what the value is of showing the information in this way at all. It has the potential risk of uh, conveying to stakeholders in particular a message that's different than what we might see when we have more normalized data. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I, 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 can, I can see your, your point. Uh, this is that the predicted values are what we provide to this vessels when they're preparing their bids. So this, the data that we provide them is purely based off of this is the last time we fished. The station is what we saw. So this, these predicted catch values are what they're being given when they're deciding um, when and if and where to participate in the survey. Um, so I see the value in them in showing that, but I have to welcome, yeah. Yeah. Th thanks, Kayla. And, and I guess just to add to that as well, this also um, helps report out a little bit in terms of uh, what we expected to catch for those areas, which impacts the, the budget in terms of uh, our project, projected revenue um, for, those, for those areas. So this provides a, a bit of an explanation as, as well of um, where, which regulatory areas uh, you, will, you will expect to see uh, lower fish revenue, for example, from what we predicted and what we projected for, for that given year. Thanks. Bob? Yes, um, Kayla, you mentioned Gore Point wasn't fished. So to help me understand this a little bit better, um, this 54% and, and 3A, for instance, and the total, um, so was Gore Point lack of catch part of this gray in, in here, or or did you just, is this reflective of just the areas you success, successfully surveyed? Uh, thank you, Commissioner Alberson. Uh, this is purely, as I, as I called it, an apples to apples comparison. So Gore Point, as well as um, some stations in Shalakoff and Portlock, which were left unsampled, are not in, those, that predicted catch is not included in that in that gray bar there. This is purely the remainder of 3A, um, leaving out those areas that were left unsampled. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Use my mic this time. Um, 
So I think I heard you say, Kayla, that uh, within the survey window, um, perhaps the um, the distribution over time of, of where when the fishing happened was, was different. I think you said much more of it happened earlier. Could you say a bit more about that and whether that causes any sort of questions or concerns that we should be taking into consideration? Yes, thank you. Uh, in, in general, in a perfect world, we would love to deploy all vessels out during the survey and fish every all stations relatively at the same time to avoid that um, when within a, a given season things are fished. Um, is that a factor? Yes and no. I know um, Dr. Stewart speaks on that quite a bit as well. Um, we had vessels on the water at the very beginning of the season as we always do, but then we also had a number of vessels participating later in the season. So is that a factor? Like I said, I, yes, no, we're really, um, I can't speak to that as clearly as like as others could, potentially Dr. Stewart or, or Dr. Webster. Okay, uh, fair enough. Um, was the, the distribution of survey effort notably different this year from from recent years? Uh, thank you. Uh, no, 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 it was not. Okay. And if I could just draw your attention as well to the FISP performance um, web page, which has the timing uh, by week through through that three month survey period for, for uh, one, two, three, or the last five years. And so if you go to that page, um, we can send that link again, but it's, it's FISP performance under the, the data page. Uh, you'll see exactly when each particular, each particular area was surveyed by week in comparison to previous surveys. Uh, and, and looking at that table, uh, you, you can see that while it moves around, it, it still moves around within um, the acceptable window for the survey. Next year. Any other questions? Can I have one on slide eight? where you um, talked about the improved fish sale process. So can you comment on, has that improved the process? It seems to have two objectives. One is to increase potentially the, the revenue, but also just the overall tracking of fish sales. Thank you. Um, the process um, over the past span of the past few years hasn't significantly changed. I would say, uh, oops, I apologize, my mic wasn't on. Um, the um, we've always we've tried to do more outreach to uh, additional buyers to increase com competition in some of the areas where there are limited fish buyers, particularly in areas such as 2A um, and out in in 4A as well. Um, reaching out to independent buyers as well. Um, and then we also have just uh, increased our efficiencies within um, our headquarters processes as uh, reaching out and in ensuring that all buyers are aware of each sale uh, prior to closing a sale. Um, we have a process that we close each sale at, at 2 p.m. Pacific time and um, an hour prior my staff reach out to every, every, every buyer listed within a given court to ensure that um, all buyers are aware of the sale and have the opportunity to, to bid, um, which has increased the number of bids that we are receiving for a given sale, which therefore increases the competition. All right. Thanks very much, Kate. We're ready to move on to the next item. Okay, thank you, Chair. So let's move on to agenda item five, and in particular, agenda item five point one, which will be presented by Dr. Webster. So I invite Dr. Webster up. And so, if we have that PowerPoint presentation, Dr. Webster, please. Sorry, this is still the old presentation. If we could have the, the next presentation up, please.
Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I have two presentations today. This is very much the shorter of the two, which will give an overview of some of the results of the space sky modeling of the survey data and a um, brief summary of what we do. Okay. So, as in the past um, five years, six years, space time modeling has been used to estimate from 32 in all sizes, weight three and a half, in all sizes, number three and a half, indices from 1993 onwards, which is when the um, standardized survey um, really began. Although we had surveys prior to that that got at the um, Various aspects of the surveys weren't standardized as carefully as they were from 1993 onwards. So, Brian Pesci, Rick of the Chariot, is 4A and 4CD. The modeling uses data not only from the FIS, but also from agency troll surveys from the NIPS Bering Sea Troll Survey, the Alaska Department of Fishing Game Northern Sound Troll Survey. And that's an area that we are unable to comprehensively survey ourselves every year, or even on a relatively frequent basis. The calibration is used to convert the troll data to, fit to a FIS equivalent um, data point. Other areas use the FIS data only. Um, the raw station data are adjusted for hook competition and timing of the FIS relative to the fishery. So there's two adjustments that we've been making for a number of years um, in order to, to um, standardize the data further. So the space-time models predict wave view and effort, numbers of the and effort at all grid stations. So we're making predictions on, on the FIS grid augmented by um, a less dense grid in the Bering Sea based on the NIMS troll survey, and whether they were surveyed in a given year or not. So recognizing that we don't survey every station every year, and neither do NIMS in some years, um, we can still use the model to get a prediction of, of the um, catch rate at those stations that, we, that were not sound. And this gives us a consistent estimator across years. Um, so the estimates are calculated as averages across station predictions. So then the lack of sampling or reduced sampling will be reflected in greater uncertainty. So even though we're getting prediction at a station, the quality of that information is not the same as <coughs> if that station was sampled or compared to if it was unsampled. Um, prediction at an unsampled station, particularly if it's surrounded by other unsampled stations, will have higher uncertainty and it will feed into the uncertainty estimates um, across a regulatory area or other region of interest. And official estimates can be for biological regions, IPHC regulatory areas, and coastwide convention waters. We also um, output the station level output is supplied to the online IPHC space time explorer tool, which I'll um, mention at the end of this presentation. So Dr. Steele will be going into some of these results in more detail in his presentation. But this is a summary of O32 weight to an effort by a biological region. It's estimated by the model using the FIS and, um, and the control data in the Bering Sea from 1993 to 2022. And the number in the lower left corner is the estimated percentage change from in the indices from 2021 to 2022. The shade in regions represent uncertainty. So, um, <coughs> The wider the shade and shaded region, and you'll see that particularly in the early part of the time series where the survey was um, patchier or less frequent, um, the greater the uncertainty in the estimate. So they represent that the, um, the shaded region represents uh, um, the 95% um, interval, and so there's 95% chance of true value for the indexes within the shaded region. You can see overall we estimate an 18% reduction in coastwide weight O32 weight the unit from 2022 from 2021 to 2022. Looking at all sizes weight the unit, the broad patterns are similar, but um, the degree of reduction from 21 to 22 is less, indicating more smaller fish relative to larger fish in the fish. And that's um, emphasized further by all sizes numbers the unit. Which had a coastwide reduction of 8%, estimated reduction of 8% in 2021 to 2022, with variation among the, the regions in the degree of um, decrease. The bulk of the de decrease in coastwide um, indices was driven by decreases in region three. So, all of these results 
and more, <laughs> are, um, can be found and explored online with the Space Time Explorer tool, which is something we think we put online for the first time last year. I'm not sure it's had a lot of interaction, but it is a really um, useful tool for, for drilling down in the, in the output of the Space Time model. And there's a link to the page in which it's found. It's been already updated for 2022. And with this tool, you can view maps of estimated Pacific elephant distribution, so you can get a, an overall sort of bird's eye snapshot of, of what the distribution looks like, and you can um, use sliders to change the year that you're looking at, so you can move the sliders and see how the distribution has changed with time. You can look at uncertainty by looking at the coefficient of variation. Um, you can overlay the stations to get an idea of where we had direct observations and where we didn't um, in a given year. And you can create your own time series. So suppose you're interested in a particular subset of stations. Um, maybe you have a particular just here in this example of Prince William Sound. You can draw a polygon around the stations in Prince William Sound and produce a time series just for that part of the um, of the stock. And we had requests in the past for exactly this kind of analysis on the output. I and mean, we had to provide those sort of an, on an ad hoc basis because this allowed um, users to, to provide, produce that output um, themselves in a fairly easy manner. So I certainly encourage um, folks here and anyone listening to, if they're interested, um, to um, explore this tool. And any questions can be directed at me at the commission. And so this, I guess, mentioned this was a brief presentation, and um, we just recommend that the commission note the accompanying paper. And I'm happy to take any questions on this presentation. Thanks, Ray. Any questions for Ray? <coughs> Don't see any, Ray. Um, you will be doing 5.2 as well. I think we can move on. Part two and, and a longer presentation is on the 2023 to 25 this design evaluation. And um, I'll, I'll be calling the assistance of Dr. Wilson and others when we come to aspects of this presentation. So a summary of this presentation, we'll give a brief history of the this and its background. I know that every year we have new people in the room, so this can be helpful for them to, to provide some context for what we're doing and why we're doing it. Look at the FIST design objectives and um, the review process for FIST designs. And I have the proposed designs for 2023 to 25. These are scientifically based designs, the designs that um, Dr. Cox discussed earlier in the mor morning when he talked about the designs of the SRB, of course. And then we have a, probably a, a larger discussion on the consideration of cost and various cost optimized FIST designs that are under consideration by the Commission for 2023. So the FIS is our most important data source on Pacific health. It provides data for estimating weight, numbers per unit effort, used for estimating stock trends, stock distribution um, among biological <coughs> regions, among um, IPHE regulatory areas, and it's important input in the stock assessment itself. It also provides the biological data for use in the stock assessment. The standardized FIS has been conducted by the IPHE each year since 1993, standardized for base of fishing gear, among other things. From 1993 to 97, the coverage was limited and generally restricted to what referred to as some, um, sometimes as the core areas of 2B, 2C, 3A, and 3B. And the design itself was somewhat different from the current design, which is which was standardized to a 10 nautical mile grid design starting in 1998. Um, by 2001, we had annual coverage occurring in all IPHE regulatory areas, 
a depth range of 20 to 275 fathoms of the Gulf and Aleutian Islands, and 75 to 275 fathoms along the Bering Sea shelf edge. To expand the grid shallower than that would have required hundreds upon hundreds of station, additional stations. Um, so by 2010, data from other sources showed that not all Pacific habitat was covered by the FIPS. We had information, particularly from commercial sources, that Pacific Halibut was present outside of this depth range in both deep and shallow waters, and that all IPHC regulatories had coverage caps even within the standard depth range. And such unsampled habitat meant there was potential for bias in the estimates derived from this data. For example, if, um, if uh, densities were higher or lower in those unsampled habitats on it, then the average for the, that we keep sampling for an area, then um, the estimate for the overall area would be um, negative and positive and biased. Therefore, we undertook a series of expansions from 2011 to 2019, covering previously unsampled habitat in all areas. And that allowed us to occupy for the first time 34% of the full 10 nautical mile grid that had been previously unsampled. So we were missing a third of the habitat um, that, that, that we now um, understand is part of the Pacific. And the result was improved understanding of how the density and distribution we reduced bias, we got better estimates of uncertainty, and these improvements were apparent throughout the time series, not only in the year we undertook the expansion, and they continue to persist to this day. The resulting expanded grid of 1,890 stations has now provided a full FIS design for which stations can be selected for sampling in each and FIS. This is what the grid looks like. The orange stations are our is our um, 1,890 station um, 10 by 10 nautical mile grid design from uh, Northern California all the way through the Western Aleutians and um, Northern Bering Sea Shelf Edge on the um, Russia US EEZ line. And um, the we also augment these data as I mentioned in my previous presentation with data from there was troll survey indicated by the blue dots. This was the 2019 survey. survey. There's some variation on where they fish from year to year. Um, and um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Troll Survey, and that's a 2029 design. Both of those are at present annual surveys, although I know the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Survey was not um, undertaken this year due to a lack of um, suitable vessel. So, this is a, a very extensive survey design and one that it would be prohibitive, possibly prohibitive to, to fish um, fully on an annual basis. Um, so in deciding what stations we need to fish each year, we bear in mind these objectives and the corresponding design layers. We have the primary objective, which is scientific, which is um, sampling the, the stock assessment, stock distribution estimation, and that brings in minimum sampling requirements in terms of the distribution of stations we want to fish, how many stations we need to fish, and skates per station, which um, the latter um, um, is important for ensuring that our biological sampling targets are met. Um, secondary, um, we have long-term revenue neutrality, which brings in logistics and cost operational feasibility and cost revenue neutrality, which also um, requires consideration of how many stations and how many skates per station to fish. And then tertiary considerations such as their impact on the stock and assisting others in collecting data and any ad hoc decisions made by the commission regarding the design. So there's a timeline involved in the process of um, developing and reviewing designs for the coming years. And consider that this timeline begins following the annual meeting, um, which is late January, early February each year. So following the annual meeting, um, we can develop and revise this designs for the next three years. This is when I get I have all the data from the previous year in hand. I can work through it and look at how um, um, what output was generated following last year's this. And then come up with designs for next year to ensure that our data quality targets are met. So more about that in a moment. And the designs that are, are um, produced over this period are then put out for review by the SRB. Um, we have a deadline of 30 days before, so they have to be ready by late May, mid May. And the SRB will review those designs at their June meeting. They may suggest additional work, um, maybe some um, variations of the designs that need to be reviewed further, in which case that work will be undertaken over the summer. 
The commissioners will see the designs for the first time at the work meeting review in mid to late September. And then um, we will present them again to the SRB for um, final review by that body um, a week later. But soon after that, the FIS data finalized for the current year, for the summer. So all analysis up to that point was using data um, up until the previous year, so for next year, next year's process, we'll be working with data up until 2022. And that's necessary to ensure that this pipeline is maintained, that the SRB has a chance to review um, the designs, um, if we include current data for the current year that we do. And then we undertake the modeling, the space time modeling of this data, and then a decision is um, expected to be made by the commissioners at the interim meeting, current meeting. And then ad hoc adjustments may be made um, um, up until the including the end. Now, throughout that process, we um, solicit um, and encourage stakeholder feedback um, and input on the design. So this is um, often um, generated through the charter bid process, um, through um, feedback from charter operators during the summer period, um, post-season surveys, and the research advisory board that um, had met on Monday provided some very useful feedback. And then we have the charter submission period itself, which is um, coming up. So now on to the designs for 2023 and 25. Um, again, we've proposed essentially two types of designs depending on the IPHE regulatory area. We have efficient sub-area sampling and IPHE regulatory areas 2A, 4A, and 4B. Those are areas where the bulk of the stock is concentrated um, in a re relatively small spatial um, component of the area. So we, um, we can sample more efficiently by targeting um, the bulk of the stock is a relatively frequent sample sampling, and then sample the rest of the stock on a, on a um, less frequent basis. But with a randomized design in IPHE regulatory is 2B, 2C, 3A, and 3B, where something like 70 or 80% of the stock um, as a whole is found, and um, biomass is found, um, and so um, in order to uh, to understand the stock well, and from a trace white perspective, we directly do sampling annually. Um, we continue to propose sampling all three stations in IPG regulatory area for CDD while recognizing that might not be logistically feasible every year. This is a highly dynamic area with apparently multiple shifting distribution and uncertainty regarding connectivity with populations near to or within Russian waters. And we know that complete sampling did not take place in 2021. We only sampled the north. And in 2022, um, this year, only the southern portion was sampled. Although that doesn't mean we were able to sample the entire um, shelf edge and for CDE over the last two years. We also note the following recommendation from SRB 019, which was last year, when they endorsed the 2022 design, um, they recognized that the region was an important area to monitor for future range shifts and biological samples collected here are likely to be important for understanding and biological <laughs> so this is the scientifically based proposed design that was endorsed by the scientific review board. It includes um, extensive sampling in 2A. Some of these parts of 2A have not been sampled since 2017. Randomized sampling in the core areas, but still spatially extensive and with high densities of um, stations. Um, and sampling of eastern um, 4B, the western 4A in the Aleutians, and also the far west of 4B, which we had, well, I'll touch on why the sampling is there in a moment, and also all of the 4C, D, E, and 4A edges. In 2024, um, this will be uh, more similar to the design that was fished last year, with the exception of 4C, D, E, or this year, I should say, back to the core sub area in 2A with it. Stock is concentrated off the southern Oregon coast and not on the northern Washington coast. Um, the core parts of 4B and 4A, um, all of 4C, D, E. And in 2025, the only difference is the addition of the southeast part of 4A, which would not have been sampled. Um, it was, the last time it was sampled was 2019. And it's an area that's quite low density, um, seems relatively stable. We have said some. Some information that maybe things are changing there, but it's an area that we're not targeting for very good sampling. 
So there are some changes since the designs for 2023 to 2024 that we saw last year. Um, recognizing that each year we present proposals for the coming three years to get some sense of, of, um, of how our uh, process is working, when different areas are going to be sampled next. But also, um, we recognize that those may be changed depending on the data that, that come into the survey. So in IPHE regulatory 2A, we added the moderate density waters of Southern Washington, Northern Oregon, and Northern California, 2023 only, and not previously proposed for 2025. And the reason they were added, um, which I think I'll come to in a moment, but um, it seemed that um, the stock was becoming more variable in IPHE regulatory 2A, and that without additional sampling sooner, that we were going to risk um, exceeding our um, coefficient of variation targets, our precision targets, which Dr. Cox talked about extensively um, this morning, um, in coming years. So additional sampling seemed to be required. Um, and I think she regulatory 4B, we added the western sub area. And the reason was that we had proposed that sampling in 2022, but we failed to get a suitable bid. So we're bringing it back to again for 2023. It is an area that has not, also not been sampled since 2019. I will add that since we did the analysis for area 2A in 2022, that perception that the area was becoming more variable has, um, has faded away. Uh, the data for 2022 were more in line with um, previous years and, and see these don't look quite as, um, as large as, they, as we might have expected based on the 2021 data, which we know was the first time we sampled it for a couple of years too with no sampling in 2020. So we the endorsement of the scientific review board for the 2023 design and the provisional endorsement for the subsequent two years um, at both meetings. Um, the scientific review board also noted that the 2023 design will need to be further optimized to ensure other commission objectives are met, including but not limited to maintaining long term revenue neutrality. So, in terms of coefficients of variation, we have the the target range of less than 15% per regulatory area that is based on historical data quality. In almost all regulatory areas in years, prior to us doing the expansion of the space time model, we noted that we were getting um, CVs below 15%. Um, space time model um, modeling revised some of that, but it, it still remained a, a data quality target that we wanted to achieve because of what we historically understood that we were achieving. Um, and um, we also, so in, by doing randomized or full sampling designs in areas on the core of the stock and four CDE, that guarantees we'll also have utterly need our data quality targets in terms of CVs, which are easily met in other areas. Um, we we'll also ensure unbiased estimation. Now, where we're not doing spatially comprehensive sampling, we have a risk of bias, and I'll touch on that in a moment, but this is. Um, Table showing what we project to see these would be following the completion of the subsequent three, three years um, sampling. So, if we were to undertake those three years of scientifically based designs that you just saw on the previous slides, we would maintain CVs at 15% or less at the end of the stock. And um, I also add year 2023 here. Um, CV is not only influenced by the current year's data, they're influenced by the data that came before and so and, and comes after. Um, so in 2023, the terminal year tends to have slightly higher CVs than, than um, previous years because we don't have a bracketing year in 2026 say, 2025. So we know that in 2023, even with that, even when that's the terminal year next year, we still expect to, to um, be within the CV threshold range, target range for all three areas with those designs. So bias, I won't talk about this too much. It gets a bit um, cumbersome to, to explain, but the goal is that we're looking at past year's data to inform us on how likely we are to see large changes over a certain time period. And so our goal is to, to ensure that um, any changes that we might miss by not sampling remain small. So if we have a, a part of a, a, a um, regulatory area, then the past has seen, seen frequent um, or occasional um, large changes over a short time period. That's an area that we want to sample frequently. Those that um, tend to be relatively stable in the historical time period 
other areas that we may not need to sample um, with the same um, frequency. And so here we're trying to ensure that um, that um, the, the amount of change that we miss for each subarea of these areas stays at or below 10%, whether we've missed it for two or three or four years. And so we're achieving that um, with these designs except for um, 4B in 2022, and that's something we couldn't avoid um, if it's already happened. So the best we can do is, is go forward with designs that, that ensure that the bias, um, the chance of, of um, appreciable bias in unsampleably due to un lack of sampling <coughs> is, um, is low. And these designs ensure that. So the proposed FIST designs for 2023-25 already incorporate some consideration of cost by using logistically efficient sub-area designs in lower density IDC regulatory areas. Now, as a statistician, I'm always going to prefer something like random sampling throughout an area. It's got much nicer statistical properties and you don't have to worry about bias, but we recognize that that's not logistically feasible in areas where density is low and costs are high. Um, so that's why we've provided these statistically efficient and um, logistically feasible designs for consideration. And the FIS is funded by sales of captured fish. This yeah, captured fish is intended to have long term revenue neutrality, meaning that any design must also be evaluated in terms of expected catch of halibut, expected sale price, charter vessel costs, paid costs, secretary costs. And this evaluation process is something that's been occurring in recent weeks. Um, within commission um, secretariat staff in order to come up with designs that are um, um, meet the secondary objectives outlined previously. So in recent years, balancing these factors has resulted in modifications to the design proposal, and that's going to be true in 2023 as well. Um, for example, increasing sampling effort in high density regions and decreasing effort in low density regions. So increasing effort where we're we're revenue positive and decreasing effort where we're revenue negative. And so here we present a sequence of designs optimized for cost to different degrees. <clears throat> so these are several options that have been developed by the Secretariat, and I welcome the input of Dr. Wilson and Dr. Wood in particular. Um, if there's anything I'm uh, missing from these designs, this is a brief summary of what's in the document. And some of these costs have been revised since um, I prepared some of these slides. And I'll note that um, the costs in the early slides are somewhat outdated. But the, uh, the overall um, perspective doesn't change. Um, so this is the pre-cost optimized design that you saw previously, with some um, optimization due to increasing number of um, skates um, to a maximum of six. So this is the full design that we proposed and was endorsed by the SRB with 1,109 stations. Um, it's going to give precise estimates with low bias and across all IPG regulatory areas, but it runs at a, a very high deficit. Um, uh, we estimated at the time $2.665 million. Um, it's now it's estimated to be even greater than that. So we went through a sequence, and there are other designs in the document that we're omitting here um, for um, the sake of brevity. But this is a, a, a version of that design which omits 4CDE um, and increases up to eight skates and increases station density in parts of the stock which are revenue positive in 2022. Um, and so it increased the number of stations to 1,363, increases the number of skates per station. So we, essentially in those core parts of the stock. And um, by increasing revenue in the core of the stock, we get the deficit down to $0.976 million, which again is an out of date figure. And it's still a, a high deficit close to a million dollars. And this is the best we can do just by adjusting state by adding stations and skates. To do better, we have to start removing um, stations from parts of the and so here's option six, which was initially designed to achieve a loss of less than half a million dollars. <coughs> um, revisions have, um, in fact, um, increased the projected deficit for this design. Um, it's above half a million dollars. But this was a design that, um, in addition to removing 4CDE, we're also removing um, the secondary parts of 4B, um, 4A, particularly Western 4B, um, northern shelf edging 4A, 
and um, only fishing the northern part of Tiwa. So this would provide good estimates coastwide and overall low risk of bias at the coastwide level, um, but um, imprecise estimates of potential for bias at the end of the stock, not doing all we wanted from a scientific basis in 4A, 4B, and 2A in particular. And this is the best we can do while maintaining a survey region in each IPHE and regulatory area. Now this is where I begin the revised cost design. So these ones, have, this has been updated for cost. And this is the revenue neutral design. And it not only now removes um, all sampling in 2A, 4A, and 4B, and 4CD, noting that 4CD will have <coughs> extensive coverage of show orders from the control service, so it won't go on sample, and there's a low risk for bias and, and, um, and uh, CV beyond the threshold. This will be, this design, nevertheless, because we're some, still focusing sampling in the coral stock, and I should note we're also leaving out two um, revenue negative survey regions in 3A um, to achieve revenue neutrality. This will still provide good coastwide estimates of stock trends, noting that 70 to 80 percent of the bottom mass is in those core area 2B. 3B. Um, we'll get imprecise estimates of potential for bias at the ends of the stock um, and less precise stock distribution estimates. Because stock distribution estimates for all areas are informed by all areas. So if you leave out some areas, that can affect the estimates for the um, areas that are sampled as well. Um, and this is revenue neutral projected one net surplus of $12,000. We have considered. Um, Okay, so some discussion of this revenue neutral design. As I noted, the bulk of the stock occurs in those four core areas. There's still a high sample size. We will still expect um, precise estimation at the coastwide level and relatively low bias at the coastwide level. So we, we're unlikely to meet our precision targets, and we certainly won't meet our precision targets in um, some of 2A, 4A to 4B, with, with no doubt in those areas. So we have an increased risk of bias in those indices for these areas as well, because there may be, particularly some parts of those areas haven't been sampled for be um, going on four years next year. Um, so if there has been changes in the stock in those components that they have not been sampled, we won't have had a chance to see that. And this design is likely to result in indices and biological data that maintain the basic stock assessment inputs, but with higher uncertainty in 2020. And it's not entirely unlike the design we fished in 2020 um, due to COVID, where we had a greatly scaled back design and restricted to the core areas. Um, I think there's more discussion. So, okay. Maybe more discussion. There's certainly more discussion in the, um, in the document, but it's certainly a design that, um, that can be maintained for, for a year um, without um, compromising the quality of the stock system. You know, if you have a comment on that further. But once you get beyond a year with this kind of design, you're, you're taking greater risk and not sampling um, as widely as, as the scientific um, designs look like. So we've also considered some intermediate options um, since um, in recent weeks. And so um, these options are intermediate to options six and seven, and the goal is to preserve some sampling at the end of the stock. So it's option 6A, 6B, and 6C will remove one of those three ends of the stock, 4B, four um, areas of the three ends of the stock, okay? at the ends of the stock, 4A, 4B, or 2A from option 6. And they'll still have projected deficits of 0.426 to 0.498 million dollars, but now we're below that half a million dollar threshold that we mentioned for option, originally for option 6. So it brings option 6 back below that, that goal of less than five. Um, $100,000. Um, and two option versions of option seven, which are designed to add some sampling back to the ends of the stock. So we could add half of what we had proposed um, for option six um, in um, 2A, 4A, and 4B, the revenue neutral design, or um, 24 stations in each of those uh, regulatory areas. And um, those deficits range from 0 0.32 to 0.35 million dollars. So still significant deficit. Um, with sampling at you know um, I think she's the and um, I believe these designs in option six are not under serious consideration. So option seven A we look at more closely. This is what that would look like. So it is the same as the revenue neutral design in the core areas. 
but it adds sampling off the North Washington coast of 2A and sampling in the core parts of 4B and 4A. So 1,031 stations. It will give us good coast-wide estimates and overall low bias risk. Estimates, no precise estimates of potential for bias at the ends of the stock. It's still better than we would have, of course, under the derivative neutral design. And with um, a median cost of 300,000. This is the design which has is restric restricted to 24 stations in each of those areas at the ends of the stock. So it shrinks a little bit from what we had in the previous slide. Um, you see the little gap in 4A where we remove some of the less some productive stations. Um, basically the same properties as the previous design. So planning for 2024 and 2025, if we implement one of these reduced designs, assuming first no sampling at the end of the stop in 2023, then any design proposals that we'll have, scientific design proposals, um, will include fishing the sub area that we had previously proposed for 2023. There's a reason we wanted those areas fished in our design proposals. They were um, proposed to maintain data quality in terms of CV and reduce the risk of bias by the further we, the longer we defer sampling those, the greater those risks become. Um, and also the potential for adding more stations to compensate um, if, if it seems that even with the addition of those reintroduction re, um, of those areas in 2024, um, we still lost something by not sampling um, what we wanted in 2023 um, to additional stations. So that presents a number of design options, um, variations, we are considering this morning. On it, we were asked to look at um, a um, further. Um, let me get back to the map. So, a, something that was perhaps intermediate to this and the revenue neutral design, and that was either a further, and, and what we considered perhaps more seriously was a, a further scaling back of, of the ends of the stock to bring the costs somewhere between the three hundred ten thousand dollars and the, and the revenue neutral. So something close to $800,000. So that would, um, could look like um, fishing uh, 16 stations or, um, um, in 2A, 4A, and 4B. And in order to do that, we would still probably have to remove um, an additional area from 3A, a low cost area, a little revenue from deficit area from 3A to cover that. Um, or removing one of 4B, one of 4A, and one of 2A from the design. And that would reduce the cost to roughly halfway between this deficit and the revenue neutral. And we can give you uh, more specific details on that stuff so we integrate that into the, into the tool. So um, happy to take more work. We are happy to take more questions on those potential designs as well. And with that, I just have the recommendation that you note the paper, endorse a revenue neutral design option seven or a modified version of that, and provisionally endorse the design that will be proposed in 2024 to 2025, recognizing that there are to be modified in fact. Thanks very much, Ray. Um, looking at the time, it's 12.15, and I suspect there's going to be a fair number of questions around this particular presentation. I'm going to recommend that we break for lunch and come back and do questions then, if that's agreeable. Squeeze in a couple. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, since you're the uh, senior vice chair, yes. <laughs> Very kind, and I'm bold to get in the way of lunch. Uh, so I, some of us had a discussion around this yesterday, of course, and I had to drop out of that early. So uh, Ray, just to clarify with the um, your last point about looking at 7 b and potential additional options to close the gap there and get closer to revenue neutrality, should we expect to see some sort of a 7C proposal in the near term? I don't know if we have some ideas for that. I'm not, I'm not, I, can use, I can look up a map, that's the desire. To, to make that more concrete in your mind, what that would look like. But there are various options. And um, 
given that we could drop either 2A, 4A, or 4B, so there's three options there. Or scale back in each of those areas equally, and then that would require a change in 3A as well. Um, perhaps the latter would be most interesting to see what that looks like, because that would be something that's relatively hard to envision. But we, we can produce maps and some slides to deal with that. Yeah, I, I don't mean to rush and suggest that necessarily has to happen now. David indicated that the important thing for planning purposes was to get the green light from core areas and that you might have a little more wiggle room. The edges of the page, so that's in the plans, and you can do it rather than near term. I don't know what happens. I've got uh, some bigger picture, bigger picture questions. All the way we get a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, I think probably some of us uh, as well will have uh, some of the bigger picture questions, but um, it's just the confirmed timelines, okay? So make sure we're all on the same page. Um, if we made a decision here around the core area, um, when would you need to have a decision on the peripheral areas, if you will? So you don't want to leave this. If, if we need to make it sooner than a couple of weeks, then I think we should press on and get options on the table now. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, we can certainly, with those um, peripheral areas, and look at uh, a, a longer timeline. Our, our current goal, though, is soon after this meeting is to put out the, the request for tenders for, for the survey and so just as a function of that the more certainty in all of the areas that we can have have the better uh, it does sound like there's uncertainty around the, the core areas and that will get us most of the way there um, and then if we are able to put on the table some options for you for those peripheral areas at this meeting and i, th I think we can i think the team's uh, the conversations we, 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 we've had is that they can put those to you. Um, that you may well be in a position to um, agree one way or another for those peripheral areas um, at, at this meeting. And that, that will obviously make the tendering process a lot smoother. Um, but then, I, I, again, I'll throw that caveat in there that uh, the Commission always has the opportunity to make ad hoc adjustments at the annual meeting. And, and so that is something that we would then potentially incorporate as uh, an additional request for tender if another area was added if price if, if our costing estimates changed again so um john what would you like to do would you like to see some options here at this particular meeting have a discussion with look at those or you need some time to think about that um, you know, I'm not sure I'm prepared right now to say which of those variations on the theme like, uh, would be the most fruitful to look at. I, I guess I'd defer to you, Ray. If you, if you have things in mind that you think would be beneficial to put in front of us, that's fine. It sounds like we've got a little bit of time. I believe we do have specific ideas. <clears throat> so why don't we see those this afternoon, those ideas? And even if we don't make a decision, they'll give us some thoughts on where we want to go. Sounds great. Good. Thanks, Ray. So how much time do we need for lunch? It's quarter after 12, well, 20 after 12. Can we get back in an hour or soon? It's in the service. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's planned. We'll get back at uh, 1.15.
going again if you're ready, John. Sure. Yeah. So we were on item 5.2 and was raised a presentation of the uh, survey design for 2023. Are there questions for Ray? Right here. Yeah. We have two, minutes, so we're sort of flowing over, but he's going to come across and join us. Okay. Just give him a minute. Hey, thanks. Um, so I, I don't have anything specific prepared here, Ray, but I guess I'm uh, uh, being the newest commissioner. I'm going to ask maybe some naive questions. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, um, I'm wrestling with the challenges that we face with the survey, with increasing costs, decreasing revenues, and trying to wrap my arms around what, what uh, discussions <coughs> have taken place in the past, what analyses have taken in the past to uh, look at different paradigms for the survey um, at uh, decreased frequency. At, um, it, it, you, you touched on some of the things in, um, in your presentation in regard to sort of fine tuning for some of the areas, but I guess I'm thinking at a higher level um, and wondering if there have been power analyses or other kinds of, of uh, analytical work done to look at. Look at Potentially not being as ambitious as the commission has been in the past in doing the satellite survey. So I think that's essentially getting at the analysis that we are doing, especially at the ends of this talk. The issue with being not so ambitious in the core areas is that that would mean a loss of revenue to fund the survey. Um, so that's why the, our analyses have been focused on, um, that's one of the reasons why our analyses have been focused on 2A, 4A, and 4B in particular. Um, and so until 2019, we were fishing those fairly extensively every year, <coughs> from the Oregon, 2A from the Oregon border up to the BC border. Um, we had, a, we had um, a survey pretty much covering the entire outer coast. And from 4B, we went way up to these three stations, the far west and Aleutian Islands, and the only thought we didn't fish regularly was um, Ballard's Ridge here in the north. And likewise, for we had these stations here were fished on an annual basis, stations here were fished on an annual basis. So that's what we've moved to, <coughs> excuse me, that's what we've moved away <coughs> from, partly recognizing that we don't need to sample that frequently. Uh, not only is it expensive, but um, most of the stock is not in these these areas, we can, we can maintain the quality of the data or sampling those areas every three or four, or wherever it requires based on our, our analysis to maintain the, the quality of the data in terms of bias and, and CVs. So um, that's the analysis that we present to the SRV each year um, based on the, the most recent data incorporated into the space time model. What do we anticipate the designs um, and the frequency of designs um, going forward, um, what do we anticipate they'll mean in terms of quality of data? So, um, the open, so the focus there is on precision and bias. The power analysis is really sort of doing statistical tests, comparing one thing or another, and we're not really doing that. We just want to make sure that we're getting um, high quality information that's feeding into the SOC assessment and the estimates of stock distribution. So, yeah, I, I don't know if this if you have any follow-up questions to, to that. Well, perhaps. So, um, so what about in, in the core part of the range where, yes, there's opportunity for revenue generation, but do we need to be sampling as frequently as we do? So when I um, when I first um, when I first presented designs to um, to commissioners when we were looking at rationalizing the survey. Would have been in um, first time within uh, 2019 when we completed the expansions. I presented designs that kind of had a rotating um, uh, sampling of, of survey regions within the core. So 
for example, in, in 3A, where we had this proposal, which leaves out two of the survey regions, <coughs> the original proposal was that we wouldn't be sampling everything. We'd be doing similar to what we did in the, in the ends of the stock and rotating in and out different survey regions um, each year. Um, so that would be a, um, a lower spatial, ex spatial extent of sampling, but not all, not all stations would be sampled at the same frequency that we have in the current randomized design, which essentially samples every station um, at least once every, every two years. Um, so that was something that was explored and presented and, and didn't seem to have a lot of appeal. I think it was concerned about leaving important chunks out of the core of the stock. These are the area that these are the parts of the stock that are driving the trends. And, and if we miss something in hearsay or here or here, then that can have a greater implications for um, our understanding of the stock than if we don't sample out here or not, for example. So we, we did explore that, that kind of design. Um, just to clarify on that point, was that I'm looking at uh, potentially every other year, every third year, you know, when you say you looked at not sampling some of those areas, what kind of time period were you looking at? So each, each um, it would be a different, um, I guess it was every other year. So it was, <coughs> that's that's what we presented. So the safety um, survey regions that weren't fished in one year, they would be swapped out with, with different survey regions the following year. And I believe that <coughs> Dr. Stewart has some something you want to say too. Just at, at, the, at the broadest level, there's three primary objectives for the fishery independence satellite survey in terms of our, our data sets. The, the first being just a primary index of abundance for the stock assessment. The second being age composition information to go with that index. The index is probably the easiest one to get because we can cover enough biomass in the core of the stock to get a reasonable index <coughs> overall in the coastal stock with a pretty modest footprint. The biology is a little bit more challenging because it does vary so much across space. We do see different um, age distributions, particularly at the western end and the eastern end of the stock. So that does take some additional spatial sampling to, to generate a reliable age distribution for the stock. And, and then the third piece, and probably getting to your question about why we haven't considered for example, a biennial or a triennial design. Um, the third piece is that the commission has relied at least for the last 15 years on a management procedure that has at least some component based on the stock distribution. And in order to, to feed that management procedure, we need annual estimates of stock distribution down to the individual IPHC regulatory area. So one of our goals has been to maintain at least some sampling in all areas to the best of our abilities in order to be able to update that stock distribution information on your new business. That's, that's really interesting. You know, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that last point. Um, does that mean it sort of requires that annual input uh, to be able to project the distributions to the regulatory area level? Yeah, thanks for the question. That, that is the, the way the commission has generally operated over the last 15 years, it, it has used a method that applies an annual stock distribution. Now, it, certainly there's an opportunity to go to, say, a rolling average, where if you missed a year, you'd have the average, say, two other years to, to combine with that. But that has been a primary uh, goal of, of the commission, to be able to update that on an annual basis. And I would say that compared, I mean, that, that's a standard approach for many groundfish species to use some component of stock distribution in the overall procedure. The challenge with Pacific halibut is that they are very dynamic. And as we, we saw in Ray's earlier results, and as you'll see in my presentation, we can see some very large changes year to year in the stock distribution. So as we start thinking about averages or, or a different way to go, um, we, we do run the risk of getting out of step with the, the biology. And it's not so much, in many cases, that's due to observation error. It's due to inability to measure accurately the distribution of the stock. In our case, at least in recent years, we've had a survey that allowed us to measure very accurately the distribution of the stock and, and really be able to see these very large changes in distribution from year to year. And that, I think that's mainly driven by the fact that halibut are highly migratory. And these year classes, as we see them come through the stock, are not uniformly distributed. So we can see real change over a one to two or three year period of a pretty large amount of biomass 
up or down in any particular area. Okay, thanks. That, that's really helpful too. Um, so um, again, I apologize. <coughs> questions are a little naive here. Um, I, I'm I'm gathering from the challenges that the survey faces that um, some of these challenges are not going to go away. Um, fuel costs, operational costs are, are probably not going to go down much, if at all. Um, there may be abundance challenges, you know, in terms of the revenue side of the equation. So, um, you know, with all due respect, it sounds like what I'm hearing is sort of nibbling around the edges of fine-tuning survey design. And, and I guess I'm wondering at a broader level if if there's been any sort of strategic analysis to think about potentially a new paradigm, just something very, very different. And maybe that's crazy, but, but uh, I'm, I'm just interested in, in your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, uh, Certainly been over this um, last two years, it's made us think long hard about the survey and how it's how it's functioning, but not for those long term reasons that you, you, you've just highlighted. It's, it's been very much trying to accommodate the uh, variations that we're seeing for the last two years, so year by year. Um, but, but as you say, it may, may be, it, it's time that we spent some additional time resources into looking at what other alternatives could be there. Um, but at the moment, yeah, we haven't looked further ahead to trying to deal with these current issues. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Webster, um, I'm looking at the chart up there on the, on the screen, and it looks like some uh, salt and pepper marks up there by Cape Spencer and then just south of <coughs> Port Lock there. Are those sort of dead areas that you don't plan to because they have historically not produced fish and if we're not going to fish those, would you use last year's numbers or do you have a surrogate for those areas? Thank you for the question, Commissioner Ellison. Um, so the original designs that we proposed, if you recall, had randomized sampling in 2B, 2C, 3A, and 3B, which recognized that we don't need to sample every single station every year to produce high quality estimates. And under the randomized sampling, we essentially fish every station once every year for two years, more or less. Um, so um, as we move to um, optimizing these for revenue, uh, we added profitable stations or stations in profitable survey regions back in. And that's what's filled in the grid in most of the survey regions from 2B up to 3D. Those regions where you still see the randomized design remaining, um, which you pointed out, 3A but also in, in 3D, in um, Western 3D, are um, those regions that are otherwise revenue negative. <coughs> Um, those are revenue negative regions. We still want sampling from those, but we can't, from a revenue point of view, we get nothing by adding stations back to those regions. <coughs> so this is the design we're actually proposing. Is what you see there, that salt and pepper, as you put it, um, pattern is, is what our proposal was. And the result of um, cost optimization is why we see more solid orange elsewhere. So, um, as far as these stations, we can get good estimates from this. The space-time model will fill in the gaps because we have data from last year at those stations or the year before, and we have data from adjacent stations. So we don't get such fine-scale spatial variability that those adjacent stations tell us nothing. They tell us a lot about what's going on nearby. So we can still get good resolution, um, excellent estimates by fishing around half the stations um, in, in each um, survey region, and that's what we propose there. So. Um, the proposal for next year would be to, to switch out the stations we fished and some of the other stations. Thank you. Any other questions? I have uh, <clears throat> one just carrying on from the line of questions you're asking, John. That, um, it seems to me maybe we have two decisions to make. One is about what we do for this coming year. 
and another is what we do for the longer term. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for the longer term, it's going to take a little more effort than probably in a month. But and it's going to require input from us, obviously, as commissioners, about what we would be satisfied with, and as well hearing back from you know, our respective delegations. I was kind of struck by, not kind of, by, but very struck by some of the comments that Sean had earlier um, from this morning. We were talking about CVs of um, you know 15 percent, and a survey is you know pretty awesome, and. Uh, you mentioned, I think the sable fish one was 10%, so it's even better than awesome. But I, I do wonder if we are going to move to something different. Um, and we also had a discussion yesterday about the impacts, you know, of you know skipping a year, for example, um, means probably you're going to save money. Might cost, cost might not even be doable, but maybe it's more of what you can do in a year. So, um, and so that, that leads me to, well, if you do a survey annually and you do less stations and the CV is going to be higher. So um, I guess we need to figure out what those trade-offs are and that'll probably take a bit of time. If, if, if I can, if I may add one thing about the CVs, those 15 percent um, ranges apply to IPHE residential areas. I've already noted that in some areas we're doing much better than that, but on a, on a coastwide basis, we're talking about a complete survey, which is probably what Sean is referring to with regards to the stable fish survey. We're doing much better than that. We have CVs in the order of 4% or 3% on, on a coastal basis. We have a fantastic survey in terms of precision relative to anything else in the world. Um, it's only when you start looking at a finer scale that, that um, and because we manage at that finer scale, that's why we're looking at that, initial, that finer scale, but um, coastwide, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that, Ray. I had not picked up on that. That's interesting, too. So I guess, I mean, where does that take us? Um, maybe a question again for you, Dave. We need to make a decision for this year. We've talked about the time frame of that, meaning that we need to provide some direction for uh, Dave for the core areas now. And if we want to look at some options for the uh, 2A and 4A and B, then we should provide some direction to him over the next month or so. And we still then do have an option to fine tune that if, we, if necessary at the annual meeting. So I guess, Dave, um, <coughs> that's the correct time frame for all this? That'll work. So, yeah, Bob. Do you need a suggested motion or would you? No, I guess, <coughs> well, I don't think we do, Bob. But, I do think I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page of the time frames collectively. And also I think what the two tasks are, one is the short term this year and also the long term, which is gonna take a bit more time. Yeah. You may have something different. Yeah. Sorry, I had I had questions actually for Ray. So I this is were you finished or no? Um yeah, I think we might come back to it. But go ahead with your question. Yeah, no, it was just around. Um, I was reading the RAB report, and you know the desire and the want for you know fewer skates. And I just want to. Can you demonstrate you know the difference? I think you sort of, you went through the slides, but could you demonstrate a little more thoroughly uh, the costs of you know. The additional cost of going from eight skates down to six. I'm going to pause that to Dr. Stewart. There, there are some options, I believe, in the document that have just a, a change in skates versus stations. We we generally try to add stations rather than skates where we can, but you know, as you see in this design, we're left trying to add everything we can add to make it revenue neutral. So that's why this final design still has eight skates in some areas, but, but not all areas. Okay. If we went to six skates coast-wide, it would have a significant impact in terms of uh, revenue neutrality on the order of a half a million dollars. Okay. That's, yeah, that's what it's going um, The other thing I hear a lot from folks uh, that do these surveys are about inlets and the challenges of travel between uh, stations and um, I just I guess the options for um, you know when you're looking at a lot of 2B and 2C 
uh, the options are either you go to a um, randomized design or a full design. Is that tr not correct? It's a, it's hard for you to truncate uh, portions of smaller areas. Is that correct? So we've been implementing a randomized design in those inwards, which can have the unfortunate result that, that you may have just one or two stations far from anywhere else. Um, now, one thing that was in the table in the past years, and we discussed this with the um, RAD on Mondays, is that in the past year, in, in the past, when we did surveys up in Lisbon 2C and 2B, we would add extra stations that weren't necessarily on the on the survey grid, but they allowed for a more complete um, fishing day for the vessel operator. And that's we suggested on Monday that that's an option that that anyone wanting to bid on the survey could discuss with the, this team. That um, we have, you know, if there's one far flung station up in DC, then there's likely um, another station that may be on the grid, but we also have an extra station that were in place when we first fished it, um, when we did the expansion in 2018, that exists in our database and could be added back, or they could propose something new to make it feasible. It's more data, it doesn't, it's not a, it's not a bad thing for us to fish those stations, we'll use those data, and it makes them more operationally efficient. And that's something that, that should be considered as well. So um, the other option is to, I guess, as you say, only fish a complete grid up there. Even a complete grid is, is kind of thin as well, um, or fish them less frequently, I suppose. But that extra station option is something that, that might encourage discussion <coughs> around between um, um, charter, if um, folks bidding for the charter regions and uh, yeah, I would encourage those discussions because I hear it in a fair bit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Uh, I just wanted to throw out there that I think there might be a bit of a, you mentioned the, like, what do we do this year in the long term? Um, there may be something in between there. Cause my, I guess I'm assuming that figuring out we'll, whether we want to make some significant changes for the longer term could take some work. And um, in my read of Dr. Webster's presentation, choices we make not to do things this year um, in order to, to cut costs essentially creates more pressure on trying to make up what we have not collected information on for next year and the year beyond. And so to me, there's like a little bit of a medium term question about what does that mean for the costs we may be facing in just one year from now um, or you know how much worse does the does the issue of missing information become because i just feel like that's going to be upon us actually quite quickly and so spending some time like actually maybe generating some estimates of that um, sooner than later might help us um, have more of a plan for the next year or two. Uh, I mean, if all that is irrelevant because we think we can sort of figure out the longer term picture more quickly, that's fine. But it just seems like we may have a something in the medium term that um, it would be good to turn our minds to sooner than later. Um, did anybody? Ray, did you want to respond to that? I, I can. This, um, this is typically the kind of thing we would consider um, in reviewing design for coming years and presenting to the SRP. So um, as um, shown in the presentation, earlier part of the presentation, we do an evaluation of the designs. And so we look at the, the um, impacts of data quality on, on missing things. And that includes whatever we do in 2023 will have an impact on the designs we put forward for 2024, which we'll be doing um, in um, May and June next year. So that does play through. And, and so that while we haven't analyzed that quantitatively at this point, um, that is uh, part of the process when we do that is typically the beginning of, of the coming year. Any follow-up questions? Yeah, I guess just that um, maybe if we're not already planning to, to ensure that when we have those discussions, we're bringing ideas or options forward that are 
we think will be revenue neutral, because I suspect that's where the commission's interest is going to lie. Um, so that we understand the SRP's feedback in the context of those options. Um, otherwise, that, uh, that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Any other questions? Um, John, I'm gonna, I recommend that we don't make a decision today, but we think about how we want to proceed, have a discussion, and come back to this tomorrow. Yeah, that's fine. And, and um, Ray, you indicated that you you all have some active ideas for variations on 7A or 7B um, in terms of the near term issue. And, um, I guess all I'd say at this point, Paul, is it might be helpful to have them. It, as Secretary of Staff is thinking about how to present that, uh, potentially to uh, think about whether there's a way to present it that makes sort of the trade offs clear. The, pros and cons, both in terms of cost and um, added value, uh, that's the right term, added scientific value um, from um, from doing a you know a slice of 2A, a slice of 4A, a slice of 4B, that sort of thing, if what we're looking at is um, some scenario that's on the order of $150,000 uh, Revenue neutral, $115,000 in the hole. Uh, we can't do um, the amount of additional sampling in those areas that's reflected in 7A or 7B, but are doing something less to get a, a sense of the pros and cons of this. That makes sense. Yeah, um, makes total sense, John. I think that's a good suggestion, and I guess um, can we see that tomorrow? Can we see it today? <laughs> yeah, I think it would be if you can do it tonight. That would be very helpful, so we can take a look at it. If that's not possible, then tomorrow's obviously fine. But if it's possible, I much prefer that. <coughs> Any other comments on <coughs> on uh, the survey? No. Thanks very much, Ray. So, um, Dave, I think there are some comments online. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. So, uh, if I could ask the Secretary just to put that slideshow, project that slideshow for us. And while while that's occurring, so we have uh, five questions, comments. Uh, some written, some would like a microphone. Um, and so we'll just step through those uh, once they're on screen. Or maybe I'll, I'll step into the first one uh, because it's a question, Dr. Cox. Uh, unfortunately, he's not online, um, and so uh, Dr. Stewart has volunteered to, to make the response. So the question is from um, Health Association of North, North America, uh, Peggy Parker. What are Dr. Dr. Cox's comments on tying the TCEY to the Fishery Independent Setline Survey without an annual stock assessment in light of vast and quick changes in ocean environments today? And so I'll pass to Dr. Stewart. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Wilson. I, this is a good question because we certainly see a very dynamic environment, particularly in the Bering Sea in recent years. I, I would say that our fishery independent setline survey, assuming that we can continue to successfully have a comprehensive design, is probably our leading indicator of environmental change and, and stock distribution and abundance. So in that regard, it's probably the safest place to hang our hat in intervening years. Um, <coughs> I, I think the, that question speaks more perhaps to alternatives that have a fixed TCEY in the intervening years between a biennial or a triennial assessment. And there we, we may have a concern uh, that we wouldn't be able to respond to that. Thank you very much. The second question is um, going to come from Aiden Hillier. And uh, Aiden would like to speak to the question. Uh, so if we could activate the microphone and over to you, Eldon, rather. My apologies. My eyes are a bit fuzzy on the screen. I had to look down. Go ahead, Eldon. Just 
do see the microphone um, is not being live, Eldon. Um, if you could just try again. We do appear to be having some connections issues there, and so thankfully we do have the uh, topic and, and comment uh, available on the screen. And so, um, Eldon, just feel free to interrupt me if, if you are able to activate your microphone, but otherwise I will read um, the comment. So the comment relates to the stock status of Pacific Halibut, so agenda item five. And the <coughs> comment is, as a sovereign government representative, I'm not giving a written public comment. IPHC really needs to, I'm giving a written public comment. IPHC really needs to survey uh, regulatory area 2A. The stock is in need of better and more review to protect uh, Pacific Harbor. Um, so Eldon, is your microphone active and you'd like to add anything to that or, or expand upon it? Chair, I have you for a response to that, um, but uh, noting Eldon's uh, dropped off, I'll ask you on how you'd like to handle it. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I think um, given the conversation we just had, uh, the questions that we were asking, I think hopefully addresses Eldon's uh, concerns and hopefully that we can hear back from him when he kind of reconnects. But I think the issue that we're faced with is um, trying to meet revenue neutrality, but also to meet what we need to manage the fishery. And the issue that we're faced with right now is what can we afford within areas 2A, 4A, 4B. And so I think the, the direction that we have provided the Secretariat is going to help address that kind of question, which may lead to some changes. Well, I'm sure it will change, lead to changes in, in the uh, in the survey, but it may also lead to changes into how we manage the fishery or make decisions around TCY, but that's much further down the road. So I think um, it would be great if Alden was able to come back and we could have a conversation, but um, that would be my answer for now. Great. Thank you very much, Chair. And so the Secretary will try and contact Alden and see if we can make that connection. Uh, so moving on to the third question or, or, or comment, uh, comments and questions, and this comes from Don Lane, um, the owner of the Predator, uh, former IPHC commissioner, on agenda item four and specifically uh, the fishery independent satellite survey. Uh, so I'm going to read this and then we'll provide some uh, direct responses. So as part of the comment, Mr. Lane suggests that the 2022 survey was 289 stations short of target, 24%. The number of survey vessels was also short by same percentage, roughly. Vessel recruitment success must be a part of discussion in future survey design and decisions. What changes of programs or programs is IPHC considering to improve vessel recruitment? Specifically address these issues that I'm personally experienced with. Uh, number one, bid deadlines. How did that work out in 2022 and changes in 2023? Prompt payment of tendering fees as per bid specs. This has been a moving target for IPHC and is problematic. Bait management. Bait has not been where uh, vessels were told to expect it to be, resulting in requests for additional running times, delaying survey completion. Uh, loss of 50% bycatch money to vessel and IPHC in 2023. How is that going to be addressed in contract process uh, and estimated cost profit projections? My experience is bycatch money was usually ten to $15,000 for a region paid from my fuel and groceries, not a small sum. Uh, so if, if I uh, attempt to, to respond to some of the comments uh, for bid deadlines, how did that work out in 2022 and changes in 2023? Um, I think the bid deadlines worked very well in terms of allowing us uh, additional time <coughs> to uh, look at the bids and work with, with those uh, tender specifications and the bidders to see if, uh, for example, additional changes needed to be made um, to the survey design. And, and this really comes down to the discussion surrounding uh, eight skates versus six skates or seven skates that we're having at the moment. Um, having that early discussion with skippers in theory should allow us to, to make potential modifications uh, if needed. Um, 
but otherwise I'm not, I'm not sure what else I, I could offer in, in terms of bid deadlines. The earlier the better is certainly preferred from, from the Secretariat. Prompt payment of tendering fees as per bid specs. Uh, I think the problem with the Predator revolved around 2000 and 2021 where uh, payment was requested by check and it was sent to a post office box um, for the vessel uh, and there was nobody there to pick it up. Uh, eventually we made electronic payment so I believe that's now been remedied, remedied and we make all vessel payments electronic, electronically to avoid um, lost checks or misplaced checks. Bait management, I think this refers to an issue where the Predator was requested in 2021 to go to Kodiak to pick up bait, which is where we traditionally store a lot of our bait. Uh, however, those external bait storage facilities on Kodiak uh, were shut down during COVID uh, and that re resulted in us uh, redirecting the vessel to another location where we had to move the bait for full pickup. Uh, so I think that was just a situational circumstance on Kodiak. Uh, and then the bycatch um, issue, I, I don't have a particular response. Maybe that's something um, for the commission chair to potentially comment on. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the uh, comment on the bycatch piece. I guess that is something that we will be looking at actually um, this session and uh, the annual meeting and dealing with that. So I think at this point, Don, that's uh, the current status. The next question is from Lynn Matters, uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, also relating to the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey. Uh, and again, this relates to the two-way um, potential survey design. And I, I think you have already responded to this uh, with, with the way forward, uh, but I'll, I'll read the comment and, and associated text. On the survey design, not sampling at the ends of the range in 2023, but planning for 2024, isn't that just kicking the can down the road? Won't there be the same revenue issues in 2024 as currently anticipated for 2023? Secondly, it has been stated that the Area 2A is highly variable, yet parts of the area haven't been surveyed since 2017. Uh, Puget Sound in Northern California. Getting updated survey data from across Area 2A seems especially important with the 2011 and 2012 year class recruiting into the fishery. And so the only comment that I provide there in addition is um, the uncertainty that we and unexpected fishery conditions in 2022, um, we're expecting them to be somewhat present in 2023. And that's why we're trying to take a more precautionary approach. Uh, but whether they're going to persist into 2024 is, is an unknown. And so I'll pass back to you, Chair, if you wanted to add anything else. Uh, <coughs> no, it's not this time, thanks. Thank you, Chair. And so we have one last question or, or comment from uh, Angus Grout, and, and this comes to the uh, survey, again, Fishery Independent Set Line Survey and the number of skates. Uh, and Angus's uh, question is, I was just wondering if you are planning on moving away from the eight skate strings on the FIS as a vessel that has participated in the snap gear pilot. If the strings are eight skates, we can't fish three in a day, thus making it economically unviable for us to bid on the work. If you're hoping to get more snap boats bidding, uh, I would hope to see the string length drop to at most seven uh, and preferably uh, six gates. And so as additional commentary there, I guess just um, also referring back to the research advisory board report, uh, which was held a couple of days ago, um, and, and a similar sentiment was, was expressed there in terms of the desire to move away from eight gates wherever possible. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Um, before we move on, I'll just uh, check one more time to see if there's any further questions. Bob. So, David, on, on the payment of the of the charter boats, do you have specific, specific times during the month that they are reimbursed, provided they get certain information into you? Could you elaborate on that? Thank you for the question uh, through, through the chair. The short answer is yes. And, and we have um, specific timelines as part of the contracts. And now that we have uh, all electronic uh, banking information for each of those contracts, um, they're now automated. Well, manual at the initial point, but then they become automated payments. And so yes, they're, they're made regularly throughout the month. And I'm trying to remember exactly how many days, but maybe Andrea, do you remember off the top of your head? No. 
but there, there, there are fixed fixed periods that we get the payments to them now electronically uh, and that's been the case um, for, for a number of years and we this year was the first year that we've had all um, vessel contracts providing electronic information rather than a mailing address which obviously resulted in um, hard checks being, being mailed uh, and potentially lost. Thanks. All right, um, let's move on now to item 5.3. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Stewart. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Stewart. I, uh, along with Alan Hicks, do the annual stock assessment for the commission and have for the last 10 years. Um, I'm pleased this afternoon to present to you the results of the 2022 stock assessment, a summary of the various data sources that go into that assessment and our other analyses, um, as well as the modeling results and some projections and a decision table for I'm going to begin uh, with a short summary of the two salient, most salient results from this year's stock assessment. And, and I recognize, if you've looked at the document already, um, that the results of this year's assessment are somewhat challenging to reconcile because the two sides of the results um, do have some information that, that suggests some, some different things about the stock. And so I'll do my best to describe how we can have both of those results at the same time and, uh, and what they might be in the stock in the near term. So to begin with, what did we see on the water in 2022? Uh, we saw a very clear signal across both the fishery independent set line survey and the fishery um, of decreased indices. So catch rates were down virtually across the board. Uh, in 2022 and this again is consistent both between our survey activity and the fishery activity this was also consistent with the what we projected from last year which was a transition from older year classes particularly the 2005 cohort and older year classes to a younger age structure in the stock particularly the 2012 year class uh, this is this year 2022 marks the the biggest transition from uh, those older cohorts of Pacific halibut to the younger ones, and that that was a, a large contributor to what we saw in the change in coastwide indices. Our estimates are that the spawning biomass trend over this period is, has been relatively flat, uh, but we are shifting to younger fish, and this is you're, as you're going to see, this is going to be very important in our forward-looking prospectus on both the trend in the stock as well as the potential risks to the stock in that we are counting on these younger fish um, to mature on schedule over the next several years. The key piece that leads us to where the stock is today is the very low recruitment observed from 2006 to 2011. This continues to dominate the short-term productivity of the stock, leading to less yield than we would expect in the long-term average. Um, and the, the effects of these reduced year classes are ha, have been quite pronounced over the last several years. This is the longest run of poor recruitments we've seen since the 1960s. On the other side of the coin, we've made some improvements to the stock assessment models, including the removal of an outdated assumption of low natural mortality in one of these four models, which we've now replaced not with another assumption, but with a direct estimate from the data sets that we have available to us. That has changed our perception of the long-term productivity of this stock. It suggests that this stock, on average, is capable of producing more yield than we previously understood. This is going to have a fairly large effect on the calculation of our long-term fishing intensity reference points, such as F43%, as you'll see the yield at that level of fishing intensity is substantially larger in this year's estimate than it has been in previous years. And I want to highlight that this is independent of the recent trends. So this is not uh, being caused by or nor is it causing the, uh, the change in, in survey that we saw in 2006 to 
2022. This is our this is our best estimate of the long term productivity of the stock. And of course, I'll go into more detail about on all these points as we go through the presentation. So I'll begin by going through the various data sources that we have available and drawing out some of the major themes that are important to the stock today. The first is to look back across the historical mortality sources, noting that we are at a level of mortality and have been for approximately the last decade um, that is just a little bit higher than the, the previous low that occurred in the late 1970s that was then followed by uh, two peaks uh, of very high removals uh, up to and just over 100 million pounds in the early 2000s. Those large mortality levels were buoyed up by uh, very strong recruitment that occurred over the 1980s, including the 1987 year class, which was the single strongest year class we estimate to have occurred in the Pacific Halibut stock in over 100 years. If we look at a little bit more detail now, if we back up to last year's annual meeting, what I'm showing you here is a projection from last year um, of what we expected the mortality to be uh, this year in 2022 as a function of the mortality limits that were adopted. We'll note here that it's just under 42 and a half million pounds. And recall that the projection each year, uh, and, and we've had this process in place for approximately five years now, is to use the three year moving average uh, to project forward for non directed discards. And so it, last year, that was just under 5 million pounds projected forward, even though we had seen a trend in that information uh, leading up to 2022. This year, at the time that we closed the, the data sets for the stock assessment, which was the 1st of November, um, you'll see this lower table provides the estimates at that time of the mortality from each of these sources. Now, you may notice a few discrepancies between my presentation and that of um, Dr. Janet earlier today. Uh, there, we've already had updates to uh, a variety of these uh, mortality estimates, and so the, the numbers won't match exactly, but the general patterns are, are very similar. And what I want to draw your attention to here are, are a couple things. The first is that the non-directed discards, um, and here I'm showing you also the three-year average because it's been trending downward generally over those three years, even though we saw a slight increase in 2022, uh, what we would project forward into 2023 is uh, 4.3 million, which is slightly less. So the actual estimate came in approximately half a million pounds less than we expected. And you'll see in total, we, we came in um, almost 3 million pounds below what we had expected to see in 2022. The only source of mortality at this broad level that came in above our projections was the commercial discard estimate. And that's increased from a little over a million pounds to a little over 1.5 million pounds. And that was not unexpected uh, because we, we're seeing an increase in the contribution of these younger year classes to the commercial fishery. And not all of those younger fish are above the minimum size limit. So this, this is attributable to um, an increased rate of encounter of small fish below the uh, current 32 inch uh, commercial minimum size limit. If we put that into comparison with recent years, so this figure shows you uh, the gray bars are the mortality that accrues to the TCDY um, going back over the last approximately 10 years. The blue line shows you the TCDY that was adopted for that year, and the dashed line shows you the TCDY that was implied, re recalling that prior to 2018, the commission was setting FCDYs and not TCDYs. And what you can see is generally the mortality has been very close to the limits that were set. We first saw a substantial deviation from that in 2020 due to disruptions across most sectors in the, in the fisheries. In 2021 and 2022, we had slightly increased overall TCBYs across all sectors, and we've seen slightly increased uh, mortality associated with those, although both 2021 and 2022 have remained slightly below. And as I showed you, part of that is due to our, the way we are doing the projections, and part of that is due to reduced catch in some sectors, uh, not completely catching their entire allocations. So I did highlight the change in commercial discard mortality. This is just a graphical figure showing you the um, total coastwide 
commercial discard mortality in as black line and the individual um, IPHC regulatory area contributions. Just noting that with this increase in 2022, we're seeing the largest commercial discard mortality that we've seen in approximately a decade um, as that had been reduced. And, and part of the reason that we saw that reduction over the last several years was that we actually had fewer uh, small halibut present in the stock during those periods of low recruitment. I'll move now into a, a, a recap of some of the information my colleague Dr. Webster showed earlier. Uh, this slide shows you a comparison of the three main components or the three main results that we get from the annual fishery independent set line survey. From left to right, it's the index of abundance in terms of numbers, the index of uh, biomass in terms of total pounds, and then on the right-hand side, an index of the legal biomass, or 032 pounds per skate on the right-hand side. And as Dr. Webster noted, um, the downward trend that we saw from 2021 to 2022, represented by the, the percentage figures in each panel here, um, was more pronounced as you move from numbers to biomass and from all pounds to just legal size pounds. And this again is consistent with the, a reduction in the largest, oldest fish proportionally greater than the reduction in uh, overall numbers or in the, the younger size and age classes of fish. Again, Dr. Webster showed this figure. This is a, a breakout of the trend in terms of numbers of fish by each biological region of the four that you see in the map on the lower right hand side there. Noting that we did see some differences in trends across the biological regions. The largest uh, regional decrease was in region three. And uh, it's worth noting there that the, we had seen a quite a large increase from 2020 to 2021. And that was driven primarily by an increase in abundance of fish in IPHC regulatory area 3B, where the decrease that we're seeing this year from 2021 to 22 is being driven primarily by a decrease in fish in IPHC regulatory area 3A. So although it's, it, you don't see it in this particular panel, um, there are differences even within the biological region. I also want to call your attention to the area of region 4 that I have just highlighted um, just to note that we've seen a, a fairly long term now, more than a decade long decline in the overall numbers of fish that we are measuring with our fishery independent set line survey in region four. I'll note as Dr. Webster did that this, our survey index is supplemented by the trawl survey information, both from the Eastern Bering Sea and the Northern Bering Sea. And this represents a composite of that information, plus the sampling that we're able to achieve with our fishery independent set line survey. So it does represent a larger and older demographic than the trawl survey by itself. Uh, but it is, I think it is worth noting that this is a fairly monotonic decline that we've seen in region four. This panel now shows the same information by biological region, uh, but shows all sizes weight per unit effort. As I noted before, the, the trends are similar, but the uh, ups and downs are slightly stronger um, when we look at weight than at the end of the day, in the bottom center of the panel here, you see the coastwide trend in all sizes of weight Pacific halibut measured by the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey. With the decrease from 2021 to 2022, we are at the lowest um, estimate we've had in this time series since the early 1990s. I'll move now into some of the biological information that we gathered from the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey. To orient you on this figure, this figure shows the age composition information by year across the x-axis and age on the y-axis. Each circle represents the proportion of the fish that were caught by the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey in that year at that age. So the bigger the cir circle, the more fish there were at that age in that year. We've, we're with, on the fishery independent set line survey, all of these fish are uh, weighed, measured, otoliths are collected, and we identify the sex of those fish. So we have males and females separated in this figure. You see several strong diagonal patterns of larger bubbles, uh, and I'll highlight those here for you. The, the, those are particular year classes as they work their way through the stock. Each year they become one year older, and so they show up as a strong diagonal pattern in this figure. 
Um, from left to right, these are the 1987 year class, which as I've noted was an incredibly important year class for the stock as a whole. The 2005 year class, which over the last decade has been one of the most important year classes contributing to both the survey and the fishery. And at the end here, I also highlight the 2012 year class. <coughs> and this is now the second year in a row where the 2012 year class has been the new, most numerically abundant single age class in the fishery independent satellite survey. And that's across the entire coastwide stock, but this a similar pattern shows up when we look at each biological region. And you can see between those two lines on the right, between 2005 and 2012, you also see a, a, a gap. You, you see a number of very small circles there representing uh, those weak recruitments that we observed between 2006 and 2011 as they worked their way through the stock. And that particular gap in recruitment now is occurring between ages 10 and approximately 17. And what that means is that that is essentially right now the core of our spawning biomass is comprised of these essentially missing year classes. And that's, that is in large part why we find ourselves at the bottom of the index in terms of the trend over the last 30 years. And as you'll see later on in this presentation, we, we find ourselves quite a long way from where we would expect to be on average um, over a, a broad range of, of stock and uh, environmental conditions for this stock. So I'll now go into the 032 or legal size weight per unit effort trends. And, and for these, we can compare directly to the commercial fishery. So here I'm showing you on the left, the coastwide trend for the fishery independent satellite survey. And on the right, the, the trend in weight per unit effort as reported coastwide um, for logbooks from the directed commercial fishery. Now, no, we don't have all the logs at the time we finalized the data sets. Yeah. Over the last decade, we've developed a correction for the missing logs at the end of the year, which would suggest that um, at the end of the day, we would expect the trend from the commercial fishery to be exactly the same downward pattern from 2021 to 2022 that we've observed in the fishery independent satellite survey. So both of these series strongly corroborating the, uh, the, the long-term decline through about 2010 or 11, and then some relative stability since then with a fairly strong decrease at least in the last year leading us to both series occurring um, at the lowest values we've observed for the last three decades to provide a little bit more detail here this is now the fishery independent set line survey weight per unit effort by individual IPHC regulatory area recall that this has been used uh, frequently in um, the IPHC's management procedures over the years as a, a component to inform the distribution of the stock across IPHC regulatory areas. And I'll highlight here IPHC regulatory area 3A, which was the single largest decline at 37% uh, down from 2021, uh, leading it to be substantially below any value we've seen uh, for catch rates in 3A. And I, I think this is strongly corroborated by the fishery, which I've shown you here on this slide, uh, which also um, saw a strong decline, not only from 2021 to 2022, but also dating all the way back to 2020 and for fixed gear all the way back to uh, 2019. So this also corroborates that regardless of the gear type we're looking at um, or the, the sampling vehicle, be it the commercial fishery or the survey, uh, we're seeing a very similar trend um, across the core of the stock. And 3A is the single most important IPHC regulatory area to the overall stock dynamic as it represents generally the largest single share of biomass uh, across the entire coast. Just to provide a bit more detail on the commercial fishery here, I've separated the commercial fishery out into some of the more important components within each IPHC regulatory area, whether that's the tribal and non-tribal fisheries in 2A, fixed hook and snap gear across most of the rest of the stock, or sub areas within the Bering Sea. And generally here, you can also see that the, the trends are, are frequently corroborated. There's certainly more variability the, the more we cut this down into individual components. Um, but overall, the picture is, is fairly similar um, between the gear types and between the different um, components in the fisheries. The exception, the biggest exception being 
uh, the upper left-hand panel in IBHC regulatory area 2A, where the tribal and non-tribal fisheries have essentially been experiencing or been observing very different catch rates for as long as the last decade. The non-tribal fishery occurring later in the year and in different areas and um, seeing reduced catch rates in recent years with the tribal fishery occurring primarily off northern Washington and inside uh, Puget Sound and showing you know, increasing catch rates over most of the last decade. If we look now into the biology of the fish coming from the commercial fishery, this figure shows you a, 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 the trends in the average weight of fish landed by the commercial fishery across each of these IPHC regulatory areas. Um, and although we've made this switch to younger fish, uh, you'll note that at the coastwide level, we are, we've been for approximately the last decade, um, an average fish size has been between 20 and 25 pounds with some stability there. And so there's a lot of ways you can get to this kind of average. You can have a lot of fish centered right around that, that weight, or you can have a broad distribution of fish with some larger fish and some smaller fish. Um, and so this is, this is a fairly blunt uh, measure of the overall trend in the biology of the stock. But nonetheless, um, it's probably the most important metric when it comes to um, fishing success and the ability of, of the fishery to bring fish in, sell them, and, and make a profit on that. If we look at the same pattern for fish of legal size over 32 inches that we observed in the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey, uh, you'll see that the overall pattern is, is very similar. Um, again, between 20 and 25 pounds at the coastal <coughs> level. You will note that one um, green point at the end of the series there, 4B, had a very large average size fish in our 2022 fishery independent set line survey. That is actually accurate. It's not just an outlier. Um, we did not catch very many fish in 4B, and we caught quite a number of very large fish in 4B this year. So some of that is just due to a small sample size, but we really did see a very large average size in 4B in our fishery independent set line survey. If we look now into the biology as observed by the fishery itself, uh, this is the same figure I showed you a few minutes ago from the Fishery Independent Set Line Survey, except now it's from the fish that are sampled in port from the commercial fishery. Noting that we don't have sex-specific information for all these years, uh, since 2017, we have collected uh, genetic samples and we can identify males and females. And although we, we lag one year in our analysis of this information, uh, that has provided us a very valuable uh, resource in terms of identifying the overall sex ratio of the fishery, which is approximately 80% female, as well as being able to see the, the relative contribution across age classes. So this, this figure shows you the same strong year classes that I, I will highlight on this figure um, as I did on the survey figure, but 1987, 2005, and then I will highlight the 2012 year class particularly in 2022, because this is the first year where that younger year class is the most numerically abundant year class in the commercial fishery. So for the very first time, we have stepped across this gap in recruitment with the commercial fishery, and we now see that as the, uh, the most frequent age observed in the commercial fishery in 2022. And I think we can expect to see continued decline in the older age classes um, and an increasing importance in these younger fish. And you'll note that that jump from older fish in the 15, 16, 17 year old range down to 10 year old fish that carries with it a fairly large um, drop in the size of fish. So if you if a, somebody were to go out and catch a certain number of fish and now all of a sudden those fish are being replaced by fish that are five to seven years younger, that's going to be a appreciable hit to the, uh, the overall catch rate and the amount of pounds brought back to the dock. And I think that's a major contributor in, in some of the trends that we've seen here in um, 2021 to 2022. And I, I will point out that we knew this gap was coming. We've seen these, we've, we've been seeing these weak recruitments for a number of years. And uh, this, is, this 2022 is going to be the first year when the fishery has reached across this gap um, and is now beginning to rely more heavily on these younger year classes rather than the, the older year class. The so fishery has been very effective at targeting these older year classes. Um, and they've certainly been more valuable. Where this fishery independent set line survey actually made this jump last year in 2021, um, but now we, we're seeing it both places. So 
there is a little bit of good news here, uh, and it, it's this is part of it in, in terms of the overall weighted age. This figure shows you our best estimates of reconstructed weighted age for a female halibut. Uh, it shows you a, a, a range of ages from eight up to age 16. Um, if you have been following the Pacific halibut story in recent years, you, you'll already be familiar with the fact that we see large changes in weighted age. We saw very large fish for their age in the late 1970s. The average weighted age declined over a multi-decade period until about 2010. Things looked pretty flat for several years after 2010. And then in recent years, we started to see an increase, particularly in the youngest ages. So it, you can see the uh, green line or yeah, green line at the bottom of this figure starts to turn up first, <laughs> followed by the blue line, which represents 10-year-old fish, and then the darker blue line of 12-year-old fish. Uh, in sequence, each of those starts to turn up at the end of this time series, suggesting that some factor is increasing the size of age for fish, beginning with the youngest fish about a decade ago and working its way up through the, the age classes. Uh, and this is this is good news, certainly for the stock. Um, the, the loss in yield going from a 16-year-old a, a fish that used to be 70 pounds down to one that's in the 25 to 30 pound range is a huge loss in yield for the same number of fish. So to the degree that this pattern continues, this, this is certainly a positive trend for the fishery. However, I would condition that with the observation that this is a slow moving process. It took several decades for these declines to be realized. And so even if, if this is a, a positive trend, um, it's, going to be, it's going to be a very slow motion trend. We shouldn't count on large changes in yield due to this factor alone, um, except that as a, as a gradual process over overcoming decades should this trend continue. Okay, the last result that we get from our, uh, our, our fishery independence setline survey is with regard to the distribution of biomass. And here I'm going to reference the distribution of biomass across the four biological regions where our, our long-term objective here is to maintain uh, biomass in each of these four regions such that we have a, a, the potential for a healthy spawning stock no matter where these fish might be throughout their range. Each of these panels shows you the percentage of the coastwide biomass that's estimated to be in that region over this time period from the, the early 1990s through, 2000, through 2022. And you'll note that uh, particularly in region three for 2022, that decline in 3A that I showed you in the weight per unit effort trends corresponds to a pretty big drop in um, the estimate of the fraction of the stock that's occurring in region three. After a couple of years of, of an increasing trend there, we, that's a pretty sharp downturn. Um, correspondingly, we see an increase in the fraction of the stock that we estimate to occur in the other regions. Now, to provide a little bit more resolution on that, um, this is the change that that was this is this figure shows you all sizes weight per unit effort, which is our best estimate of the for the biology of the stock. Uh, this figure shows you the change in the O32 stock distribution, which is a, the O32 stock distribution is a measure that's been used in the IPHC's management procedure for a number of, of recent years. And I provide that here for comparison. Um, you'll note the top row here is the 2021 estimates. So these are last year's estimates of last year. So they're not directly comparable to 2022, but they're what we had when we calculated the various management quantities last year. And the second row down are the 2022 estimates. And, and I, although those are estimates of different quantities, I just want to highlight how much change we've seen, particularly in IPHC regulatory area 3A and in 4A. Both of those proportionally have gone down substantially in, in one year. Uh, and so, you know, depending on um, how and whether these, um, these estimates get used, uh, this, this is potentially uh, going to be very influential in terms of our, our perception of the distribution to each of these, uh, particularly 3A and 4A. The bottom row here also shows the three-year average. Just to remind you that, that although the average will buffer these changes somewhat, um, even the average will be responsive to such a large change as we observed in 2022. Okay, I will now wrap up the data section by speaking just briefly to the ecosystem conditions um, observed by this or experienced by the stock. 
For several decades, we've understood that Pacific halibut recruitment tends to be correlated to the Pacific decadal oscillation, which is just a general metric of overall uh, productivity and environmental condition, generally on, in the Gulf of Alaska. So when the Pacific decadal oscillation is in a positive phase, shown here by years with green dots and the green arrows, uh, those would be positive um, those would be positive PDO periods. Generally, we see higher recruitment in the Pacific halibut stock on average. Conversely, when the PDO is in a negative phase, we tend to see lower recruitments. This is not a good predictor of individual year recruitments. You'll note actually that 2012 is a red point here, which is a negative phase. Um, but on average, across this 100 year period when we've been, been measuring these two things, uh, we do see a correlation of uh, higher average recruitment during the during positive phase. Noting that we, we did have a positive phase from 2014 through to uh, 2019, and then the last three years, 2021 and 22, have been fairly strongly negative, which is generally favorable for things like salmon survival in the California current and conditions down in the south, but less favorable for things like ground fish in the Gulf of Alaska. And, and that seems to be where it's most important to the the calendar stock. Um, I will also highlight just a few observations from ecosystem conditions in the, the major the major regions that are um, important to the Pacific halibut stock. So the, the short story here is that after quite a bit of disturbance over the last almost a decade now, uh, beginning with the warm blob in the Gulf um, in 2014, we're seeing more of a return to average in 2022 than really we've seen over this whole time period. Still definitely some warmer water in the Aleutian Islands, some intermittent heat waves going on there, but uh, better ice cover in the Bering Sea and, and still more um, movement toward an average condition in the Gulf of Alaska. So very little to report there, really. Uh, in, the, in the lower, uh, in, in British Columbia and in the California current, we have seen through 2021, we've seen some reduced productivity. However, this shift to cooler uh, negative PDO phase appears to be reversing some of that, particularly in the California current. Um, and we continue to see some intermittent hypoxia in the California current as well. I'll note that I draw heavily from um, domestic agencies and their research into these ecosystem conditions. These are all links at the bottom here leading you to the most recent uh, ecosystem reports from each of these various regions. And I thank all the, all the very diverse authors um, and the amount of work they do to, to summarize all this. I unfortunately do not do this justice by putting this all into a single slide. Uh, but I would encourage you to go in and read each of these reports. It's, it's 100 pages or more and provides a lot of detail in the specific conditions. Okay, with that as a summary of the various data sets, I'll now move into a summary of the modeling for 2022. 2022 is a, was a full stock assessment for Pacific halibut. We are on a, approximately a three-year cycle. We, we do a, a full stock assessment and then for two to three years, we will update that assessment, making very little change to the underlying data other than adding new information. Um, and again, making very little change to the underlying models. So every three years, most recently in 2015, again in 2019, and then in 2022, we have the option to go all the way back down into the raw data, rebuild all the data sets from scratch, um, reevaluate all the various modeling assumptions, um, and, and make improvements where we need to. These, uh, these types of changes are reviewed incrementally uh, by our scientific review board, as you heard from Dr. Cox earlier, uh, it, it has a two-part process. So the first meeting in June, where we provide the bulk of the research changes, then we make refinements in response to their comments from June and present those to them in September, where they then help us finalize uh, the, the structure of the analysis that will go forward into the year's stock assessment. Of course, we update all the data and, and did again this year, anything from previous years where needed, and we add all the information in 2022 as well. So recall that for Pacific halibut, we don't use just a single stock assessment. We're actually using four individual models, which represent different hypotheses about the best approximation to the population dynamics. They aggregate the data differently. They have a, a range of different uh, structural assumptions built into them. Uh, but each one could stand on its own as a reasonable model for the Pacific halibut stock. 
Um, in this way, we are able to capture a broader range of uncertainty. We're able to show you through the decision table um, a, a broader range of the potential risks than we could uh, describe with a single model. Uh, but we also tend to see some additional stability We're using four models in any given year uh, one model trending up or down in response to new information will have less of an effect on the overall stock assessment than if we were just using a single stock assessment model. And that's even true for this year, where we are seeing some, some differences between this year's results and last year's results. So there were a number of things that we looked at for 2022, but we didn't make any tactical changes to. And I'm not going to speak in depth to these, although I'm happy to answer questions about what we explored the possibility of including whale depredation estimates in the stock assessment. We evaluated other ways to model correlation between the environment and recruitment strength. And we spent a considerable amount of effort looking at um, different ways to weight the four models within the ensemble that were based on their performance in predicting the upcoming year's fishery independent satellite survey. We think, and, and the SRB agree, that this last one particularly is a very promising avenue for further research. But because it is something that's brand new and we're not able to borrow from other stock assessments or other methods, we're developing this at the IPHC, um, they felt like it, that it was better to, uh, to wait and do some more development before we implemented this in our tactical models for 2022. We did implement a number of improvements this year, uh, routine software updates. Um, we accounted for elevated natural mortality for the very young small fish ages zero to two, these are fish less than 25 centimeters. Uh, it makes sense that these fish have a higher level of mortality on them from natural causes than a, a one meter long halibut. Um, and so that was a, a fairly easy change to make. It had very little effect on the, on the result, but we had hoped that this would improve our ability to estimate recruitment relationships uh, with potentially with environmental and other covariates. We also improved the way in which we treat uh, the weighting of the age data inside the models, basing that on um, a resampling design of actual data collected uh, that provides us an objective way to weight these, this information inside the models. Um, again, that, that was an important improvement, but didn't have a large effect on the, the overall results. The biggest effect on overall results was created by um, the investigation of and ultimately the estimation of female natural mortality in the short areas as fleets model, uh, noting that we were already estimating natural mortality in the two long time series models. And I, I just make a minor correction. I think Dr. Cox has spoke earlier um, when he mentioned that we were not estimating natural mortality in the two long time series models. I think that was just an oversight because we didn't spend a lot of time evaluating the estimation of natural mortality in the long time series models because that had already been in place for a number of years, which I'll, I'll tell you exactly how many in, in a minute here. So that was not a focus of the review because we were already doing that in those models. Uh, but this change in the estimate of natural mortality in the short areas of Sleet's model did have a large effect on the estimates from that model. And in tandem, um, it also influenced the overall uh, ensemble of, of four stock assessment models. And I realize that this is kind of an abstract concept, so I'm going to step through several slides here to help you better, hopefully better understand a little bit about natural mortality. So we use the, we call this M, but I'll, I'll try to say it out in terms of natural mortality. Uh, what is natural mortality for Pacific halibut? This is just the rate at which fish die of causes other than fishing, be it disease, old age, whales consuming them, Whatever, whatever the factor, this is all the fish that die, but not as a function of, of fishing. And so how do we estimate this quantity? This seems very abstract, and in fact, it is very difficult to estimate it. We estimate it indirectly in the stock assessments, and we do this by watching each age class of fish as they decrease in abundance over their lifetime. So you imagine we, we, we pick a year class, and each year we see fewer and fewer of that year class over time until eventually they're gone. They're, they're, they've, they've all died off. If we can track how many we catch out of that year class every year, the difference in the decay from what we caught versus what we're actually seeing gives us an estimate of M. Now, if we do this for a single year class, we don't get a very good estimate. But if we do it for two year classes or three or five or say 100 years of specific calendar data, that gives us a much stronger estimate. And that's why we've, we've since we developed it, we've been able to estimate natural mortality in the long time series models because we have literally uh, approaching 100 cohorts represented in those models. 
in the short time series models, we have fewer cohorts. In fact, even 10 years ago when I started on the stock assessment, we didn't have enough year classes in those models to estimate natural mortality. But we've been working away on this and investigating, and the um, one of the keys was getting the sex ratio of the commercial catch, because that allowed us to better estimate the selectivity of the commercial fishery, which allowed us a better look at what was going on after fishing to those year classes. And so that, that sort of unlocked the door. And that was in, remember, in 2019 when we first started including that information. And now with several years of that information, we're able to estimate natural mortality in, in yet another model. So how does natural mortality affect the productivity of the stock? Higher natural mortality is a higher turnover rate in the stock. This leads to higher productivity. And what that means is it also corresponds to higher long-term sustainable rates of fishing or, or yields from the stock. The faster things turn over, the less difference it makes if we siphon a little bit of that off of fishing. And that's so that's kind of how natural mortality works both in the in the population dynamics as well as it, as it relates to our, our, our refugees. Now I do want to give you a little bit of history. In general, I would not go into this level of detail for a particular model parameter, but this is an important one and it has some strong implications for this year's results. So I want to make sure that, that everybody to the best of my ability, everybody understands some of the history here. So for Pacific halibut in particular, uh, prior to 1998, all of our stock assessment model models used a value of 0.2. Again, this is a, this is a, the rate at which fish die on their own in independent fishing. In 1998, the choice was made to reduce that value to 0.15. These were these were based on evaluation of the data, but not estimating these quantities directly in the stock assessment models. And that assumption in, in, that was made in 1998 was carried through without any change from 1998 all the way to 2012. In 2012, we identified that this was, because this was just an assumption made in the model, we identified this as a major source of uncertainty. We included that explicitly in the decision table in 2012. And as you can see, in subsequent years, we have scratched away at this issue, um, at this fixed assumption, in 2013, we introduced a model that estimated M, the first of the long time series models. In 2014, we introduced a second model that estimated M, the other long time series model. And each year, as we've reevaluated the assessment, we've investigated to see whether there was sufficient information to either support or refute this fixed assumption of 0.15. And in 2022, we, we, when we reevaluated it, what we found was strong evidence that 0.15 was not consistent with the data that we've been collected. Our current estimates from the three models that estimate natural mortality range from 0.184 to 0.215, uh, all significantly larger than the value of 0.15, although we do retain still one model uh, fixed at a value of 0.15. So let's go back for just for a second to, to 1998, uh, because I think it's important to understand why this choice was made in 1998. If the estimate was imprecise, they, they knew it at the time that it was challenging to estimate given the models they had at hand, and they recognized that there was a level of precaution that we, by changing from 0.2 to 0.15, it reduced the overall biomass estimate, and it, it reduced the potential consequences of getting this value wrong. So they, they recognized at the time that this was a, a precautionary adjustment uh, by, to, to reduce this value. and, and to be fair, in the 1990s, this was common practice in stock assessments to make adjustments where it seemed like that would be a little bit more precautionary. But I, I'll, I'll remind you that in 2012, the commission had, the IPHC had an end-to-end -end performance review. And one of the strongest recommendations out of that review was for us to make our science more transparent, to make a, a bigger distinction between our science products and our policy products, to make risk and benefit trade-offs more apparent for everybody. And the way to do that is to provide risk-neutral science. It's to provide our best scientific estimates and then allow the risks to be evaluated on their own rather than folding in some level of risk assessment into the science products. And so that leads us to where we are today, which is that we have now 25 years of additional data beyond where they what they had in, in uh, 1998 in order to estimate natural mortality. And we, we now have this mandate to have transparent and risk-neutral science, uh, not making a precautionary adjustment to M inside the stock assessment models. Should that adjustment be from 0.2, which is what's supported by the data, 
five or how big a, how big an adjustment would be appropriate that that's really not a choice that that should be made by uh, made and and folded into the science rather it should be on the table so that's that's where we are this year so at the end of the day, um, estimating M, as you heard from the, the, the Scientific Review Board, uh, this represents the, our best available estimate. Um, and so that's, that's the, the product that we are providing for you. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more in a few minutes about where this really affects the, the results for this year's stock assessment. So this is the results from each of the four stock assessment models. And this figure actually looks quite similar to what you've seen in previous years. We don't know how big the stock was in the late 1990s. It was early in our survey time series. And um, the stock, as we fished the stock harder through the 2000s, we learned more about the size of the stock. And these estimates come together there around 2010. All the models agree that the spawning biomass was at a relatively low level um, approximately 12 years ago. The stock, the spawning biomass increased somewhat from that time period through around 2016 and 17, and that was as a function of the 2005 year class uh, moving things up over that time period. Then subsequently as that year class, although it continued to be present in the stock, it became less numerous and less important to the overall contribution, we've seen a decline in the spawning biomass all the way until 2020. If we put that then, we combine those four model results into the stock assessment, which is the full ensemble of all four, which is shown in blue here. So the blue line down the middle shows you the point estimate from the ensemble. The shaded areas show you the uncertainty around that estimate. And on top of that, I've shown the results of each of the last 10 or 11 stock assessments. Each one shown as a black line. Uh, the, the best estimate from that stock assessment ending in a red point, which was the terminal biomass estimate from each of those stock assessments. They don't all agree exactly with this year's stock assessment, but you can see that this year generally gets the same pattern that we've seen across this whole time series, uh, right down to the decline since about 2016 and 17. So although, as I, as I mentioned, we have changed, um, we've improved the estimate of natural mortality in one of these models overall, the, the estimate of spawning biomass, or the number and, and biomass of fish in the water, has changed very little as a function of this year's stock assessment. In terms of recruitment, each of these four models produces a different time series of recruitment. They occur on different scales, primarily because of the different estimates of natural mortality, uh, but also due to other um, aspects of the structure of these models, the selectivity and other things within the model. Um, and so, Rather than focus on the differences between the models, what I want to draw your attention to is the relative strength of each of these year classes. So what I do in the next figure is I put each of these series on the same scale. I divide each of these by the average recruitment over this time period so that we can see how well these models do or don't agree with which are the strong year classes and which are the weak year classes. And you can see when we put them on the same scale, they all suggest the same overall pattern which is that we had generally higher recruitment through the, the late 1990s and into the 2000s, culminating in the 2005 year class, which was the biggest that we've seen um, in the last approximately 30 years. Then we had this period of six low, or even I would even call that very low years. We had six in a row that were just not good recruitment, uh, lower than almost anything we'd seen in this recent time period. And this is the gap. This is the primary driver in what, we've, what we're seeing this year in the commercial fishery in terms of the age structure, in terms of the catch rates. And this is going to be a huge factor moving forward. Uh, recalling that Pacific halibut take 10 or 12 years to mature, these fish, the 2011, the back end of this low recruitment, is just going to be reaching maturity next year. So we are right in the middle of the long-term effects of this gap in recruitment. The good news is that we do see a, a, a decent recruitment coming on the backside of this. It's not as big as the 2005 recruitment. And in fact, this year's survey results did downscale this recruitment a little bit. We estimated last year that this 2012 year class was maybe a little bit closer to the, 2000, the magnitude of the 2005 year class. And this year we see it's a little bit smaller. And that, again, that's being informed by the data that we collected this year. That's being informed by that downward trend we saw in catch rates. After 2012, things become very uncertain because we have only seen these fish 
a few times and primarily only in the fishery independent set line survey. Uh, recall that we see a few fish at five and six years old, but really it's not until seven or eight years old that we start to see them well in the survey. And in the commercial fishery, it's closer to eight or 10 years old before they start making a, a real uh, entry into the commercial fishery. And we need to see these year classes several times before we can get a precise estimate of, of their magnitude. And so we don't yet know from 2014, 15, 16, even though these fish have been in the water for quite a few years, it'll be another couple of years before we start to get a read on these, these more recent year classes. Now, I really, I do want to put this low, this run of low year classes in a broader context. So not all four models go back through the whole time series, but two of them do. And if I highlight that same run of six low recruitments, and you just trace across with your eyes, you'll see that we haven't seen six low recruitments of that magnitude since the late 1960s. And this is important because what this, this tells us two things. One, this is a really big gap in recruitment and it's gonna have strong effects on the short-term conditions of the stock. Two, we're a long way from average. And so when we start to think about fishery reference points, like what's the rate that we would fish this stock at over the long-term average, you can imagine that, that the effect on the stock right now might be quite different than we would expect to see on average over the long-term. Had we applied something like our current reference points at any time over this last, um, say, 40-year time period, we might have seen something uh, very different in, with regard to catch versus biomass in the water than we're seeing right now, um, given these low recruitments that are on their way through the stock. So this next figure is similar to the spawning biomass figure I showed you a minute ago, um, but now we're looking at fishing intensity. So to orient you on this plot, we have year across the x-axis and fishing intensity on the y-axis. The harder you fish, the higher you go on this graph. Each of these black lines represents a previous stock assessment result. So here we're looking back across uh, the last eight stock assessments, and you can see that each of these estimated, with some variability, estimated that we were fishing pretty hard in the mid-2000s. And this is no surprise. We've, we've known this for some time now, that we were fishing at a, a very high fishing into level of fishing intensity in that time period from now, approximately 2002 or three through about 2012 or 13. Um, this is, again, we, we've known this for some time. Each of these, uh, those black lines then ends in a red dot, which was the projection of the, the fishing intensity associated with the adopted limits in that year. So each year we do an assessment, there, there are a set of adopted catch limits and we make a projection of what we think the fishing intensity is going to be based on those adopted limits. And that's what each of those red dots are there. And you can see that those have bounced up and down quite a bit. And some of that is variability from assessment to assessment. Some of that's the difference between what we thought was gonna happen when we set a certain set of limits and what actually happened in terms of what the fisheries actually caught. Uh, and some of it's also just updating information as we go along. There's also there's one more line on here, which is that green line which shows you the reference levels. Um, first F46 from 2016 onward, and then F43 from, from 2021 and 2022. And so particularly for those last two, you may recall that the, the adopted catch limits were projected to be associated exactly with an F43 uh, level of fishing intensity. However, you can see that for um, 2021, the second to last red point, even one year later, we already estimated that that was, in fact, a lower level of fishing intensity than we had projected in that particular year. The black line for the final assessment in this time series goes underneath that, that red point. Um, now, I'm going to overlay on top of this, this year's results. So same black lines and red dots and, and reference level, but now this is the results from this year's stock assessment. Again, same as the spawning biomass, the blue line down the middle shows you the best estimate or the point estimate from this year's stock assessment with the blue banding showing you the, the um, uncertainty interval around that estimate. We estimate that in 2022, the fishing mortality um, based on this year's stock assessment was equivalent to an F51% level of fishing intensity, which is so you'll, you'll note that the, the y-axis goes in a somewhat counterintuitive opposite direction. Um, <coughs> F20 is higher fishing than an F100, and 
and that's because this is representing an F SPR, where SPR is the uh, reduction from the unfished level of spawning biomass associated with the fishing in that year. So the harder you fish, the more you reduce the biomass. So what we're estimating is that um, for the last several years, we've actually been fishing a little bit less hard than we thought we would. You'll note that four of those red points actually line up quite closely with the results from this year's stock assessment. Um, and those were, those were years when at the time we were estimating a, uh, a lower level of fishing intensity from each of those stock assessments. This level of variability, um, up and down, back and forth, as you see, each year's stock assessment gets a slightly different perception of the, the overall fishing intensity. When my colleague, Dr. Hicks, talks about estimation uncertainty and how the stock assessment is an imprecise tool to estimate what's going on in the stock, this is, the, this is a, a manifestation of estimation uncertainty. Sometimes our estimates are higher or lower. Um, and you know, over time, we, we learn more about this. You can also, the, the only other point I want to make about this figure is that you'll see that we, we're not revising our overall perception of the time series. Um, in that, that period in the mid 2000s, we still estimate we were fishing very hard during that time period. Um, and that, that that decrease in fishing intensity over, say, 2010 through around 2012 or 13, still of a similar magnitude um, in this year's time assessment. Okay, last set of reference points, and then we're almost done with the modeling section. So our current management procedure references the spawning biomass that's in the water compared to the spawning biomass that we would estimate to have occurred if we hadn't been fishing on the stock. And so this ratio, or what we call the relative spawning biomass, is shown on this figure as a as blue line with the blue band showing you the uncertainty. To give you a few reference points here, the dashed line is our SB 30% reference point. If the stock is estimated to go below that level, um, that's where we start to dial back the fishing intensity. The solid red line above the solid red zone there is the conservation zone. If the stock drops below 20% of the biomass that we would estimate in the absence of fishing, we would consider that to be a conservation concern. And that's where we would suggest um, to reduce the fishing intensity as low as practically possible at that point. You'll note that in at the beginning of 2023, we estimate that we are above that both of those reference points and currently at 42% uh, of the unfished stock condition. You'll also note that this we, you see an increasing trend in the relative biomass across the, the um, almost the last decade. And if you you followed the, the previous figures, you're probably wondering why if the spawning biomass is flat. Why is our relative spawning biomass going up? And so I'll, I'll show you on this figure why that is. Uh, this figure shows you the actual estimated spawning biomass in blue. That's the lower line there. And I've taken the uncertainty intervals off here just so that you can clearly see the trend. The upper line is the spawning biomass that we would project to have occurred had we not been fishing on the stock. And how that are a dynamic species. The biomass, even if we weren't fishing, would go up and down across a very wide range of biomass levels. And what you can see is that the unfished stock has been decreasing faster than the fish stock at the end of this time period. And that's why we're becoming more, we're, we're, the relative biomass is actually increasing at the end of this time period. So what, what does this mean? Put this another way, um, the effect of fishing has been much smaller than the effect of natural change on this stock over the last decade. And you're probably wondering, well, now why is the stock going down even if we, if, why do you think the stock would be going down even if we hadn't been fishing? And the answer is because we've had these very low recruitments. We have the six lowest recruitments since the 1960s working their way through the stock. This also begs one more question, and I'll move on from this slide, which is, well, what if fishing is somehow causing those recruitments to be low? Or wouldn't we be getting this wrong? And the answer is that we include the effect of fishing when we calculate the stock in the absence of fishing. So or we, we account for the fact that fishing could reduce the spawning biomass, which could have an effect on recruitment. We do that by a stock recruitment relationship that's built into the stock assessment models. So we, we're already accounting for the fact that when we fish, we might actually see a reduction in recruitment. That, that's factored in here. Okay, this next table just shows you some, some general metrics. It really just summarizes a lot of the, the to reference points and other things. It provides a one-stop shopping for 
the status of the stock um, and uh, a variety of specific um, performance metrics. And I, I think I won't speak to any of these in particular because I've covered most of them already. And I'll move now into the final section of this presentation, it's much shorter than the, the first two, which is the projections in the near term and the, the decision table uh, for 2023. So recall that when we do these projections, we do them for a constant level of catch for the next three years. We provide a range of mortality levels from no fishing up to some large value, in this case, in recent years, 60 million pounds of TCEY to provide some contrast across the risks. We provide additional detail for um, levels of fishing intensity, in this case, F40 to F46, that have been found through our management of strategy evaluation process to be generally consistent with the overall conservation and fishery objectives for the stock and OB in the long term. We also provide six specific projections here, um, and I'll go through each of these and, and highlight a few of the, the particular results for each, but these range from the reference level, which is the TCEY associated with um, or estimated to result in a fishing intensity of 43%. The three-year surplus, which is the yield that we could take over the next three years and have no more than a 50% chance of dropping and spawning biomass from where we are now at the beginning of 2023. The status quo, which in this case is last year's coastwide TCEY. And to, to bracket things and provide a few ranges on either side, we also provide um, columns with the status quo minus 10, 15, and 18 percent to provide um, for an evaluation of risk across a whole range of different alternatives here. So graphically, uh, this first figure shows you the projections over the next three years in the absence of any fishing mortality. And a couple things stand out right away. The first is that even if we aren't fishing this stock, we should expect a, a terribly rapid change in biomass. The dynamics of Pacific halibut are relatively slow. And even in the absence of any fishing mortality, we would get back roughly to a biomass level that we saw, say, in 2016 or 17. So not a huge change in a three-year time period, given the, the dynamics of halibut and the fact that we have a number of cool recruitments already in the pipeline. There's nothing we can do about those, even, even if we don't fish on them. The three-year surplus, which in this case is 43 million pounds, uh, by definition, that produces no more than a 50% chance of a decrease in spawning biomass, and that, of course, leads to a, a flat trajectory over the next three years. The final projection is the reference level, or the TCY, associated with an estimate of an F43% fishing intensity level. You see here, this is, provides a projection that is for a declining stock, not rapidly declining, but but declining with a high probability over this three-year time period. Particularly the lower confidence interval in this figure you see expands quite rapidly, indicating that at the, high, the higher we fish, uh, the less certain we are about uh, future projections and the, the greater the probability of even lower spawning biomass. So the decision table it provides an overall risk-benefit trade-off between yield and the probability of something bad happening either to the stock or the fishery. So I will go through now the headers on this table, and then I'll highlight a few of the particular risks. So across the top of the table, from left to right, we have no fishing mortality. We have high and low values bracketing the table. We have that zone of fishing intensity rates consistent with the results from the management strategy evaluation. In the middle of that, we have the reference level of that 43%. And um, then we have moving through to the left, we have the three-year surplus here occurring at 43 million pounds of TCBY. The status quo, last year's um, coastwide TCBY at 41.2, and three lower alternatives below last year's uh, status quo. For each of these, across the top is the estimate of total mortality associated with that projection, then the TCBY, our best estimate of the fishing intensity that that TCBY would correspond to, and then because we'd be setting a TCEY, we don't know exactly what the fishing intensity would be. The, the final row there is the range of fishing intensity associated with each of those. And as I'll highlight in a subsequent slide, there's a pretty broad range of um, potential fishing intensities that we might get for a particular TCEY. I want to step back just for a second and speak first to this concept of surplus production or the, the three-year surplus. And I think this gets to the current state of the stock as well. Um, 
The red dots and the black line here show the actual mortality across um, this time period from the, the early 1990s to present. The blue lines show the surplus TCDY or the calculation in each year of how much we could take in the upcoming three years and not cause a further reduction in spawning biomass. And because we don't have the TCDY spelled out for all of those years, I've also put the surplus mortality in terms of all sources of mortality there. And you see they, they track each other quite closely. It should strike you quite quickly that we had more surplus production back in that period, 2015, 16, and 17. That was when the stock was increasing slightly at the peak of the 2005 year class. Then we have this period of decreased surplus production. That's as these poor recruitments were moving into the stock. And now as we come out the other side of that gap in recruitment, we're starting to see surplus production buoyed up primarily by the 2012 year class. We saw a small improvement in 2021, a little bit more in 2022, and even slightly larger here in 2023. I do provide the full decision table so you can evaluate all of these various probabilities uh, for yourself. I'm not gonna go through all of these, uh, but generally risk increases from the left side of the table to the right. And um, each, each component here, stock trend, stock status, fishery trend, and fishery status, all represent different types of risk to the stock and or to the fishery. I will, however, go through those six particular columns and just call out a couple of the risks so you can see how these change across different levels of yield. So starting with higher yields at the top here at F43% and moving down to lower yields at the bottom, uh, I'm providing two risks. The first is what's the chance of a one-year decline in spawning biomass? In this case, for a 52 million pound TCBY, that's a 75% chance of one-year decline. And what's the chance that we, when we set that TCBY, we might actually be exceeding at 43%. For 52 million pounds, that's a 50-50 chance. As we start to increase up to or sorry, decrease to down to 43 million pounds. Those probabilities go down to a 53% chance of a one-year decline, down to 49% chance of a one-year decline at, at the status quo, and further down the line here. Now, I do want to note that you probably looking at the F43% and the TCDY associated with that, and it feels like a disconnect. We've been in the range of 40 to 45 million pounds for a number of years, and now we're getting an estimate of F43% that puts us at 52 million pounds. And it's worth considering what that F43 row or column in this case represents. Um, the, an F43 policy of fishing intensity is not intended to stabilize the stock at any particular biomass level. That is a long-term rate that we estimate through the management strategy evaluation process to be consistent with our objectives across a wide range of environmental and stock conditions. But it, it's not going to stabilize the stock at any particular time at a, at a particular biomass. And it's also a, a rate that's going to be applicable on average, it's going to achieve all of our objectives. But as you'll see in, in Dr. Hicks' presentation, there's a wide range of potential outcomes. And what we know right now about the current status of the stock is that we are at one of those very low outcomes. We would not expect to see very often six low recruitments in a row like that. And yet here we are with six low recruitments. And that's perhaps why we're seeing such a disconnect between a reference point that we know would work over the long term, over a period of tens to hundreds of years, but maybe providing a kind of a surprising result right now in the near term because of the actual conditions that we're in and the fact that the stock is currently at a relatively low level of biomass. So that rounds out the decision table. I do want to highlight several additional risks that we are not able to capture in the decision table. And the first is what I will call uh, uncharted territory. Uh, we have been monitoring the stock through the fishery independent setline survey and the commercial catch rates at, at least as far back as the early 1990s comprehensively, and we are currently at the lowest catch rates we've observed. We just had a discussion about the implication of those low catch rates for the fishery independent subline survey, and I, I, I've certainly personally heard from a number of fishermen about the effects of low catch rates on their, their personal plans um, over, over this year. Uh, there's no question that we've observed some very low catch rates in 2022 relative to anything we've seen in recent years. 
and that, that so that's not easily captured in our in our decision table and in our calculation of long-term reference points. The second additional risk is with regard to TCEYs. Um, we estimate from this year's assessment that anything more than about 43 million pounds of yield is um, likely to result in further declines. And I, I already spoke to this in terms of where we are now compared to where we would expect to be over the long-term average. We're already at a low level um, relative to the, the range of stock conditions that we might expect to see across the long term. Finally, and this this last one is another one that's that's not able to be quantified in the decision table, is this reliance on the 2012 year class. So moving forward, we're going to have fewer and fewer fish from 2005 and older year classes, and we're going to be relying heavily on this 2012 year class to mature on schedule. And what I mean by that, I'll show you in this figure. So this is our, our estimate of the rate at which fish mature at age. So you'll, you'll recall that between 11 and 12 years old, about half of Pacific halibut tend to, a female Pacific halibut tend to mature. Right now, in 2022, we estimate that about a third of that 20, 2012 year class would be mature at 10 years old. Over the next three years, that's going to go up to, we hope, two-thirds of the, that year class being mature. So most of the projection that we're seeing, or the dynamics in this short-term projection, are heavily dependent on this 2012 year class maturing on schedule. We have an active, as you'll hear from Dr. Planis, we have an active program of research to revisit uh, maturity for Pacific halibut, try to better understand. This curve has been in place for decades, and we're just now starting to collect some information to update that curve. Um, however, there's no guarantee that this particular year class is going to stick to the schedule. They might be ahead, but they could also be behind. And yet we are counting on them in the next three years to mature on schedule and, and as effectively as, as your classes have historically. So again, it's a, it's a reasonable assumption, but we don't have any way to ground truth it over the next couple of years until we start to get some of this research information coming in. And by then, we will have already counted on this year class. So I do want to put this year's uh, reference level in context. So this shows you over the last 10 years, the reference SPR that's been applied, the reference TCEY, the second row that's come out of each year's stock assessment. And you can see that those have gone up and down fairly substantially in some years. Uh, the third row shows you the percent change from the previous year. And you'll note that we have now Five assessments have produced reference TCUIs that have changed by at least 20% or more over the last decade. And, and I, I point this out, one, to help you understand what Dr. Hicks speaks about, again, about estimation uncertainty and how much variability is in our understanding of the stock. And two, just to put this year's change in, in context at, in terms of proportional change. Um, although it's a big jump from 41 to 51, we've seen this kind of jump in the reference calculation in the past. Also, just for comparison, the fourth row down shows you the same over the same time period the adopted TCEYs and the percent change from the previous year in the adopted TCEY as well. On average, the reference TCY has changed by 14% year to year, uh, either up or down, and the adopted TCEYs uh, by 7% on average over the same time period. I don't have any specific distribution information for the TCEY. This will be provided and the guidance from mission on that topic. So at this point, I'll conclude the formal part of my presentation and recommend that the commission note this paper and we have to answer questions. Thanks very much, Ian. Questions for Ian? John? Thank you. Um, thank you, Ian, very much. It's hard to know where to begin. A lot there. Um, I, I guess, first of all, um, I I'm almost wishing that there was a, a new term that you had invented for um, how to capture what the reference TCEY represents. It seems like uh, we should, we're not even comparing apples to oranges. It's just two very different things based on this change in, in natural mortality. So um, I guess thinking a lot about the people listening in on this, uh, this meeting, I wonder if you could just clarify my understanding is that. Uh, you showed a couple slides ago a 26% increase in the reference TCEY this year. Last, that does not equate to 26% more halibut average. 
you have sold your house, right? That is absolutely correct. In fact, we, we estimate that while the spawning biomass is holding steady, um, overall the biomass has decreased, as we saw um, at, as referenced both by the fishery independent set line survey and by the catch rates in the commercial fishery. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I think it's just important, important to be very clear uh, for stakeholders about that. Um, back on slide 31, um, you were uh, explaining what natural mortality represents. Sorry, I'll give you a second to get the slide there. Um, and noting that um, it equates to higher productivity. Um, so I wonder if you could maybe clarify a bit how to understand that. Um, by productivity, it's not an increased rate of recruitment per se, as I understand it, but essentially it's saying because of the um, change in understanding of natural mortality, individual fish are living longer and have more opportunity to reproduce. Is that the right way to look at it? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think maybe I'll draw on a few other fish species to help make this um, this comparison. So the higher the natural mortality, the higher the turnover in the stock. So if fish are, are born and die very rapidly, you can see there, there's a very high turnover rate in the stock. And the higher the turnover rate, the, the higher the fishing intensity that that stock can maintain. So for example, a, a species like a sardine, which only lives for a few years, we can fish them very hard sustainably. A species like a rockfish that lives to be 150 years old and has very low natural mortality, we have to back way off on the fishing intensity in order to have a long-term sustainable yield. So it's it's a metric of the, the rate of turnover in the stock. And, and part of that is created because when we fish, some of the fish that we catch would have died anyway. And so that it's it, it, fishing fishing is substituting for some of that natural mortality, and that's why the two are related in that way. They're, they're both they're, we're both are capitalizing on the rate of turnover of the stock. So when I say productivity, um, I'm, I'm really meaning just the, the overall um, speed of the dynamics. But it is related to uh, change in the natural mortality rate so going from what we were assuming to what you believe we now should should factor into that it's saying those fish have a longer opportunity to contribute to population is that actually we're at, we're now estimating a higher rate of natural mortality so the turnover so of the stock is higher yeah meaning we can fish a little bit harder on average in the long term and have the same overall effect on the stock. Okay, thanks. And then uh, if you could go to slide 34. Oh, sure. Okay. Um, so this um, goes to a comment I made when you gave us the preview presentation the other day about um, this change in the understanding of natural mortality um, had, a, I guess, a level of precaution built into it um, that um, we have a different way of looking at that, I guess. Uh, and so um, the way you phrase this here, not making a precautionary adjustment to natural mortality inside the assessment model. Um, and, and I have asked about uh, in terms of how we as commissioners should view that potentially we may want to uh, introduce precaution somewhere else in our equation and have a look at this. So I gather that's what you're trying to get at here by saying it. it's not embedded in the assessment model, but for decision makers, it's a relevant consideration as whether that should be embedded somewhere else and how we're evaluating this course for interpreting that. Yes, that's correct. To the degree that we have had this built into the stock assessment for years, I think it is reasonable to consider uh, now that it is no longer built into the stock assessment, which actually improves the assessment because we're trying to get the dynamics model accurate using the wrong value or a value that's inconsistent with the 
data in the assessment is not leading to a better assessment. Uh, but, but you're totally right. By moving it now outside, we're presenting it to you as, look, this is what was built in. Be aware that this this did have an effect when they put this this precautionary adjustment in the assessment. Yeah, so, so again, back to my lead off question, it doesn't necessarily need to throw caution to the wind. It's right. just thinking about where and how to apply. Thank you very much. Uh, you just carrying on the subject. Um, slide 32 shows that um, three or four models now have an estimated natural mortality. <coughs> There's one model remaining. Does that mean you'll be doing work to uh, probably examine natural mortality in that model? And so is that going to lead to probably increases in uh, natural mortality? Two, two part question, and thank you for the question. I appreciate the chance to speak to this. Um, yes, we do have one of the four models still has a value of 0.15. We were, we did not have conclusive evidence within that model that we should be estimating natural mortality versus using that fixed value as we did in the model that we updated. Uh, and it wasn't highlighted in the SRB's uh, presentation, but in the SRB's report, you'll note that they did actually recommend to the Secretariat that we make this a research priority to continue to investigate that particular model and whether or not we could can estimate natural mortality in that model. In terms of then, okay, well, what is that going to mean for us moving forward? Are you likely to see another big jump in natural mortality? The answer is no, and the reason is because uh, we currently, assuming that we keep the same set of four models, uh, we, as an average of four models, we went from a case where we had two estimating natural mortality at a relatively high value and two fixed at a low value. Now we have three estimating natural mortality at a high value. And so the median value or our best point estimate coming out of the ensemble is now reflecting the higher value. So adding another one will reduce some of the lower tail of the probabilities, but it's unlikely to have an effect like we saw this year. This is essentially was the tipping point for a set of four models. By now having three all estimating higher natural mortality, our point estimate or the median is now being driven by this higher estimates of natural mortality, which I will reiterate are informed by the data rather than model rather than assumptions made outside the models. So, if I understand, um, there will be a review of this, uh, reviewed by the SRB. Uh, and just given the mechanics of the calculations, it's unlikely that it's going to have a big impact on the new four models. But it does seem quite well. Would you agree that it would still uh, slightly increase? Or Potentially, that? yes. And to the degree that we may update model weighting in the future, um, it could have a greater or lesser effect. So that is is, is certainly an unknown. Um, it's also not a foregone conclusion that the fourth model will necessarily come up with a higher estimate. At this point, we don't feel like we can reliably estimate it in that model, which is why we haven't. Um, so I, I don't want to presuppose what we may or may not find out. But in the other three models, the evidence is clear that those models are much more consistent with a higher value uh, than the value that had been used in them. All right, thanks very much, that was very helpful. Perhaps if I could just follow up on that, just one a, a bit more. Um, we are on a three-year stock assessment cycle. <coughs> so um, I my expectation would be that something like changing the approach to natural mortality would fit in a full stock assessment, um, but would be much less likely to fit smoothly into an update in an in-between year. So my expectation would be it could easily take us until the next full stock assessment to have a, a better pers perspective on this. So that would be in three or four years? Correct. Okay, um, other questions? Richard. Yeah, so um, I guess these are like, every time we have a full stock assessment, that's when we you normally know, expect these big shifts, like we had the post wet assessment. <coughs> The information on sex composition, now we have natural mortality, and I think you alluded to the fact that maybe the next big change might come with some understanding of maturity in the future. Um, do you, 
Do you have any uh, idea of what maturity might be doing to this um, concept uh, of the uh, reference TCY? Would it have as much impact as this uh, maturity, uh, as a mortality? Thank you, Commissioner Yamada, for the question. Yes, um, maturity is the next big question, I think, both in terms of the, the very short-term dynamics of this 2012 year class, but also in terms of the overall scaling of our, of, our, of our estimates of stock size. Maturity will affect our estimates of spawning biomass. It will affect the estimates of unfished spawning biomass, and it will also affect the estimates of the spawning potential ratio or the fishing intensity. So it has the potential to be very influential. And the curve that we're using now represents uh, an average curve that was estimated from historical data. I will say that we have we've, we've reevaluated it a few times over the last several decades, and it hasn't shown obvious signs of change. But as Dr. Planis will speak to, we now have some new methods to measure and, and better describe maturity. So honestly, it's a it's a large source of uncertainty. I think if we were looking for what what could change this assessment a lot in the in the in medium term, maturity schedules is definitely it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, well, just before I go to some other questions, um, Dr. Stewart, did you have anything about the timing of that maturity schedule review? And do we think that might I think I will let Dr. Plana speak to the research track on that. We, we collected the first round of samples this summer, uh, so it's not going to happen right away. Okay, we can come back to that. Um, I wanted to make sure I actually understand uh, natural mortality in a bit more detail. Um, so the way I read the presentation is we are we're actually only changing the estimate, or even maybe we're only generating an estimate, so that's one of my questions, of female natural mortality. Um, and I wondered, is that like the spawning biomass or is that the entire female biomass and then do we also have estimates of male biomass like how do they all come together or do they excellent question and i i for simplicity's sake i left out the discussion of male natural mortality uh, the short answer is we already estimate male natural mortality in all of these models and have for a long time uh, with the sex ratio information we do have it's enough to inform that Male natural mortality is generally just a little bit lower than female natural mortality. We used to think it was a lot lower, and then we got the um, sex ratio information from the commercial fishery, and that actually brought them a little bit closer together because we now understand fewer of them were dying from fishing than we thought in the past. Um, but male natural mortality is well informed by the data that we have in these models, so I haven't, I haven't focused on it here, but it's estimated directly in all four models. And then for the female portion, it's it's not just the spawning biomass, it's actually all, all females. That's correct. Okay. And, and then I, I wondered, just for context, um, I, I guess I'm struck that uh, the values were 0.184 to 0.215. But it has pretty good impacts. Do we generate estimates of fishing mortality? We use uh, SPR, or spawning potential ratio, as a better metric than fishing mortality. The challenge with using fishing mortality is it's generally defined as the um, rate of mortality on a age range, an average over an age range for the fishing mortality for fully selected fish. But we have a case here where we have multiple fishery sectors with different selectivity curves. Some of them don't shape selecting small fish that almost don't overlap with other sectors that select larger fish. And so any, any F or fishing mortality rate that I were to report could be, I think, more confusing than less. SPR naturally integrates F across multiple fleets when you have different selectivity curves in a way that's comparable year to year. Otherwise, we would have to be concerned with changes in selectivity over time and relative proportions of different fleets. Um, it's, it's, it's messy when there are a lot of different sectors 
accessing the same resource with different selected behaviors. Okay. Um, so for natural mortality, like does it, do we do anything to try and estimate how much of different age classes might be dying? Or some of that, I mean, is that same logic kind of applicable or relevant for natural mortality? It is the, the spawning potential ratio calculation integrates that over the lifetime of the fish. So it looks at the rate of mortality from fishing versus the rate of mortality from natural sources. And it integrates that over the whole lifetime of that fish. So it, it takes care of the fact that, for example, as two, three, and four year olds, there may be mortality associated with discarded non halibut fisheries for the recreational fishery. And then as, it, as they get older, there's mortality associated with the directed halibut fleet. All of those are, are integrated into calculation of SPR. So it, it takes care of all that mortality at age at the same time. So I just want to make sure I understand that. So, so when we are estimating mortality, natural mortality, it is also like an SPR style estimate. Natural mortality occurs after age two. It's a constant value across all. Okay. Years. All right. That uh, I didn't do. Um, I, I had a totally different topic, which was size at age, um, and it's increasing. And uh, I was, and maybe this is a question for Dr. Planas as well, but. Um, I just wondered how, I know that it's a challenge, if I remember right, to understand why size at age changes. I wondered if, um, I guess I, I was curious to be reminded of whether we are doing any research to build on our understanding of that or how, how likely a better understanding of the drivers of changes like that uh, might be. I think I will defer to Dr. Planas to answer. You can do a better job than I can. Thank you. So I have a couple questions, Mr. Chair. Um, so I was looking at the uh, old 32 numbers, uh, Dr. Stewart, and, on your chartlets, and I, it showed an 18% drop. And I didn't see a commensurate drop when you um, you run your your four models together that they give us the uh, spawning biomass. So what am I missing there? That uh, it looks like we're, it's dropping, but it's still around 200,000, 200 million. Is that right? Yes, thanks, Commissioner Alvarez, for the question. Uh, that is right, and I think the um, I think the short answer is that we are stepping across this gap in recruitment, and in terms of spawning biomass, we're replacing larger, older fish with smaller fish. And so we're not seeing a, a big net change in, um, in the spawning biomass estimate, despite the fact that we are we saw a big drop in the catch rate, particularly for the, uh, the largest, heaviest fish this year. And so if we were to take 51 million pounds out of the uh, of 032 commercial size, it seems like we're dropping the density um, of these fish on the grounds. And the density is is such that for the first time in a long time, we're going to be under 90% or just at 90% of catching 3A. Similar, a worse problem in 4A and 4B, somewhat for C, D, and E as well. Um, And the weight per unit effort for the uh, the Sutline survey would be similarly affected, and we're already having problems with financing that situation. So I'm struggling with um, this number that comes out with the new uh, uh, mortality level suggests a 51 million pounds is going to be sustainable, but it may not be economically sustainable for the fleet. Or for the survey, is is that a reasonable observation? 
Yeah, thanks, Commissioner Alverson. I think that's a good synopsis. It, it is 51 million pounds corresponds to a rate of fishing that we have tested and know is sustainable in the long term. But it would it will, in this case, uh, with a very high certainty, approximately 75% chance of further declines in the stock. And so the likelihood would be that any yield over 43 million pounds will lead to reduced catch rates uh, in the near term because of the this condition that the stock is in right now compared to where it might be in, in, in the long term average. I have two short questions on two of your chartlets up there on slide 20. Are those, uh, is that bubble chart based on your trawl survey or is it a combination of trawl and your survey? <coughs> so this particular figure is just the directed commercial fishery. Uh, I, the one earlier slide showed just the fishery independent set line survey, but not the trawl survey. Uh, I, I do have I, I do have trawl survey pages if you'd like to see those. No, I, I was just curious if we are really catching that young a fish on our surveys. Yeah, so this is the fishery. The survey here. We we do catch a few five year olds, increasing number of six, sevens, and eights, and then by eight to ten years old, we we're catching a fair number of those fish. On the survey, and these these would be oh, many of these fish would be sublegal, so we we don't see these in the land of catch. And then the last question, Mr. Chair, uh, the eco chartlet you had, are those temperatures surface temperatures temperatures at 100 fathoms? What what's that a measure of when you say temperatures? And my apologies for abbreviating an entire ecosystem report in a single bullet on the slide. <laughs> I do not do them justice here. Uh, these, these represent, um, in many cases, it is surface temperatures that are summarized, but the analysts in, in some cases have gone to great lengths to, to produce data that's corresponding to bottom temperatures. For example, in the Gulf of Alaska, what we saw was that heat wave or the, the warm blob in 2014 and 15, in sequential years, that, that warmer water actually sunk down and, and pervaded deeper and deeper depths. Uh, and so this is very much a three-dimensional story. Although the deeper and longer these things play out, the less clear our picture of them is. It's much easier to, to monitor, say, surface temperature on a year-to-year basis. But I, I think the parts that are most important for how are obviously bottom temperatures. Um, and, and the evidence is that they that's also been the case for, for example, Pacific Cod in the Gulf of Alaska, which had a large mortality event that, that seems to be related to these elevated temperatures. That, uh, that concludes my comments or questions. Thanks, Bob. Richard. Yeah, so my understanding is uh, all the information that we received um, lead to the fact that if we make changes in a given year on selecting a different harvest intensity, then we're not going to see any immediate results the very next year or maybe the next three years. It seems like it's a very delayed kind of reaction to the resource. But I'm still baffled by the fact that in one year, across the board, something happened to the stock where we had kept the fish either disappeared or we're not catching them. So how do we explain that, you know, this cross the board reduction in uh, catch per unit effort and in the fish survey in one year when all the changes we would normally predict to, to do shouldn't affect the stock that immediately. So how do we explain that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think there's, there's two contributing factors here. The first is, there's no question this was not uh, an optimistic result this year. It was it was worse than we projected, and the the result in the stock assessment models was to scale that 2012 year class down slightly uh, to to help account for the drop in, in catch rates. But the second factor that was going on was not only did we see that drop in the 2012 year class, but this was the shift when the fishery and the survey, to some degree, reached across that gap in recruitment. So we, we essentially traded a bunch of older fish for a bunch of younger fish. 
And although the fishery was able to still find some larger fish, some of those were younger and larger fish, and some of those were the, the last of the, the older fish, this was this was a long step across the gap. And so I think we saw perhaps a more abrupt change there than we might have seen had we had a slower gradation between good year classes and poor year classes. We had we had a just a stair step from 2005 to 2006, low recruitment all the way to 2011, and then it jumped back up to 12. So I think that that pattern is what's driving some of that. But I, I definitely I think the observation is fair that um, I don't think we expected to see quite this big a drop based on the projections from last year's stock assessment. Even though we did say that we did project a high probability of decline, I don't think we we expected this this big a drop. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Dr. Stewart. Um, at one point, you mentioned that uh, natural mortality was the primary source of uncertainty in 2012. And yet, um, the graphs on slide 41 or 42, I'm not even sure exactly where it would be applicable, but I don't see, we have this more knowledge, but I don't see a refinement in these uncertainties anywhere. Where, where am I missing that? Like, uh, would you, where would you expect to, now you have this more knowledge of the stock, where would you expect to find a refinement in uncertainties for our decision making? Because it seemed to me it's almost widening, uh, but that could be from another effect, I'm not sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. That's a, a very good one. Uh, we So in 2012, we had a single model, and it had a fixed assumption of 0.15. And so we arbitrarily picked lower and higher values just to try and express some of that uncertainty associated with natural mortality. Over time, you've not seen a reduction in overall uncertainty because we replaced those assumptions that we made in 2012 with actual models and actual estimated values. And so over that time period, we went from saying, well, it might be this and it might be that, to it might be this. The data tell us in this structure that it should be this value. And over this time period, we've had, as I responded to Commissioner Ryle's question, We've had essentially two low and two high models represented in the ensemble. This year, we now have three higher natural mortality models and one lower model. So we still have not, I think, resolved once and for all what the best um, natural mortality value is to use for this assessment. I, I wish we had. Natural mortality is a common source of uncertainty in stock assessments. And even with a lot of data, it's difficult to get a precise estimate. Uh, we, I think there is some promise based on work we've done so far that we may be able to estimate it in the fourth model and therefore make some progress, but it is, is certainly going to remain a, a major source of uncertainty. Okay. Okay. Um, the other question, I, it's, I don't even know if it's a question, but it's more to do, so we're jumped this year class, we're, we're less reliant on two, we're, well, they're not there. They're, we, fish them or they're naturally dying, uh, the 2005 year class, into this 2012 year class. And we are seeing size at age growing, and we're seeing um, uh, more evidence that we're, it, it's not quite as strong as we think it was. Um, we're seeing uh, they're not quite mature. Logically, to me, that doesn't seem like the time to start hitting that stock like hitting those that age class. Uh, we're going to be struggling because of those six years of, um, you know, low recruitment. Do we want to hitch all our horses to this uh, 2012 year class and ride it out? It, 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 it doesn't seem like a logical, uh, but maybe you can give me some perspective on that, just considering the results we saw on the table. I can, and I will. I'll reiterate some from my sort of additional risks slide. Um, not commenting on the policy aspects of what quota should or shouldn't be set, but just commenting on what the additional risks are at this point in time. And I think you're absolutely right that we are at a point in the stock where we have uh, 
considerable amount of additional risk that's not well captured in the stock assessment models because we are going to be relying on one year class because we are we we, we want but we don't yet have a, a, a fresh look at maturity schedule yet we're relying on a single year class to mature on schedule um, we have six low year classes in a row which we've not seen in the better part of half a century i, I think there's there's a, a a large number of factors that put us in a very unique situation right now and lead to uh, higher risks than we've, we've seen certainly even in the last 10 years. Okay, that, that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. I was going to ask the same question in a different way. Um, slide 13 had the bubble plus. You don't need to come to it. And then slide 37 has the strength of the year class and an updated estimate as Peter's indicating. Um, but that's only one. And then slide 56 has the maturity schedule. So I guess tying all that together, when do you think we might have a better picture of the strength of 2012? I think we're there. I think we have a pretty solid estimate of that year class now at 10 years old because we saw so many of them in the last two years. Um, the wild card or the challenge is that generally, we historically, we have seen your classes be relatively spatially patchy when they're young and then become more uniformly distributed as they get older. And my conclusion for this year is that the 2012 year class was nowhere near uniformly distributed. And so in that regard, I have some pause that it is acting differently than we've seen in previous year classes. And I realize that's a bit subjective. Um, I, I would encourage you to go, we have a tool on our website where you can look at the survey data and actually plot an individual year class over time and see the distribution. Generally, the pattern we see is that these year classes come in in the west and in the east and backfill toward the center of the distribution. And so it's not uncommon to see a year class really become common in the core areas until it's it's well down the road in terms of age. Uh, but I, I, I do think that there are some differences in what we've seen this year. It was surprising to see such big changes in back-to-back -back years in 2B and X, right, in 3B and 3A, way up in 3B last year and way down in 3A this year. Uh, so I don't know what to tell you exactly. It's hard, it's hard to predict. I think we, we're probably getting a, a decent estimate of the 2012 year class, but I do have some thoughts about its spatial distribution. So the takeaway message there is we think we have a pretty good handle on the 2012 and <clears throat> another two years of information or one won't really change to it. I hope not. <laughs> I can't guarantee. I mean, if we get another year's data and it might be different. Yeah. But. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> that on that even. I guess but what I was hearing from you is you think right now you have a pretty good handle on the 2012 and you're not particularly optimistic that it's going to change just now. Yes, that, that has been the case. For example, the 2005 <coughs> class, by 2015, we, we had a solid estimate that that has been, was revised very little after that. All right. Um, thanks very much, Ian. I don't think there are any other questions. So, uh, thanks, guys. So, Dave, um, taking a look at the agenda, what's remaining? the forecast as far as it's now almost or I'm getting through the rest of the agenda tomorrow um, by noon or some other time. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, we do have uh, the room booked for the for the entire day, so we're, we're certainly going to finish within uh, the end of day's play, so to speak. Um, we have two more agenda items that were scheduled for today. Uh, Dr. Farnes' presentation and questions would probably not take more than about half an hour. Uh, we have 45 minutes slated for it, and that could easily take us out to 5 o'clock today. Um, but looking around the room, I'm also uh, conscious that maybe the MSC would be better taken. Everybody's fresh in the morning. Um, and, and I think, uh, Alan, you're looking at about an hour total with questions. Can do that. But we do have additional time, so on the 
uh, agenda, we also have the report adoption. So if you decide to go to a remote adoption, you have that time available as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jan. All right, thanks, Jan. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm, I'm um, I guess, cognizant that uh, a couple of us were optimistic and have plane tickets tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> um, so uh, even if um, getting into the next scheduled agenda item might not be the best thing right now, I wonder if there's something else we can do to take something that's slated for tomorrow up now just to buy us a little bit of room tomorrow. One other option, too, is to start earlier. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm sensing some resistance. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess my preference would be to add something today and we'll order right now. And if I was to suggest, I, I would suggest continuing on with the agenda item six, which is from Dr. Parnas. Um, we've often taken that at the uh, end of a day or end of a break, and so he's quite used to presenting under that sort of pressure. Well, let's keep the pressure on Joseph then. Yeah, if, yeah, he's, he's available now.
the future of biological and system science research activities. This presentation should probably not last long. Um, as uh, Dr. Wilson indicated this morning, uh, uh, between 2017 and 2021, we completed the biological and system science research plan and has now uh, merged uh, into a much uh, more ambitious and, and global plan, uh, which is the five-year program of integrated uh, research and monitoring that was uh, presented by the Wilson this morning. Uh, and this plan uh, started this year in 2022 and will last until 2026. And, and as you can see from the slide, uh, we're also contemplating, um, uh, with regards to the biological and system science program, uh, work on five uh, research areas. The only uh, two differences between uh, the main biological research areas contemplated in the NEO plan uh, regarding uh, versus the previous one uh, are first that uh, migration distribution and genetic and genomics have now been combined into one single area, uh, which is now called migration and population dynamics. And the intention is to uh, bring in uh, genomics and population genomics uh, work into our uh, understand into our effort to better understand. Uh, migration and distribution among other uh, population, population dynamics uh, issues. Uh, and um, the introduction of a new research area that is uh, named uh, fishing technology, which I will speak uh, at the end. So these are five uh, core research areas that I'll be speaking to. So the first, um, before I go that, uh, there, um, there's a link to the five-year research program of integrated research and monitoring where you will find um, uh, specific details on um, what, what we intend to accomplish within this uh, five-year research plan uh, with regards to the five areas. But I will uh, briefly uh, just mention what are the objectives of each uh, um, one of these five areas. Uh, the first one, migration and population dynamics, the main objectives are to improve our understanding of migration and population dynamics uh, throughout all five stages and the management implications this work are uh, regarding sub-distribution and region management. But the second area of the reproduction, uh, the main objective is to provide accurate maturity and quality estimates, um, and the management implications are regarding uh, our ability to estimate female stock uh, spawning biomass. Uh, the third research area is that of growth, and the objective here is to improve our understanding of factors that are responsible for changes in size and age, and the development of tools for monitoring growth and physiological condition. And the management implications are regarding our ability to estimate the biomass of the mesenchymal cell. Uh, the fourth research area is that of mortality and survival assessment. Uh, and the objective here is to improve our estimates of this mortality rates and to evaluate methods for reducing uh, mortality. Uh, the implications uh, regarding management is our ability to better estimate uh, mortality. Uh, and the last research area of fishing technology is uh, its objective is to develop methods and techniques to reduce depredation and bycatch. And management implications are again to uh, better estimate the time. Uh, the first research area that is, is in migration and population dynamics. Uh, it's it's a summary slide, and you will see this summary slides at the beginning of each. Uh, research area and here uh, in blue uh, under the five-year research plan 2017-2021 you can see the accomplishments for the work that was uh, uh, contemplated uh, during that time and um, we work particularly on three areas uh, larval connectivity general juvenile connectivity and the development of genomic re uh, resources uh, regarding larval connectivity um, and juvenile connectivity what we accomplish is uh, uh, crucial information on, on uh, larval dispersal pathways that allow us to uh, provide some estimates of the level of connectivity at the larval level um, uh, inter uh, between and, and across different basins. So basically uh, within uh, the Bering Sea, within the Gulf of Alaska, or between uh, the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea, as well as uh, onto genetic migrations at the juvenile stage. And those, uh, the results from those uh, studies uh, were published uh, last year in Fisheries of Oceanography. Uh, during that period of time, we also uh, accomplished the sequencing of the Pacific halibut genome um, that was published uh, earlier this year, 
this year in the spring in molecular ecology of resources, and that's a resource that is now being used in the work that I'll describe in a second regarding uh, our um, uh, intention to revise population structure. Uh, so within the new uh, program of uh, integrated research and monitoring, uh, we're actually contemplating work in several areas, but uh, we're, we've started to uh, conduct work in the areas that I'm highlighting in red uh, regarding larval and juvenile connectivity. What uh, we're actually doing right now is to try to map uh, settlement or nursery areas of, of the Pacific Island uh, uh, throughout the convention waters in order to link um, uh, information on larval trajectories, the spawning, um, uh, areas and uh, nursery areas. Uh, and regarding um, uh, population structure, uh, what we're actually uh, doing is uh, um, delineating at a fine scale the structure, the structure of the stock. This is what I'll be showing you in the next slide. And uh, the objective of this work is really to resolve the genetic structure of the Pacific Island stock in convention waters. And uh, by that, uh, we've, uh, in order to accomplish that, uh, we've actually collected genetic samples from spawning groups uh, in different uh, geographic areas within the Gulf of Alaska, the Bering Sea, and uh, most recently in the Central and Western Oceans in the winter of 2020. And with this genetic samples, uh, we are going to, we are actually doing, uh, as we speak, uh, work uh, on uh, local coverage uh, whole genome resequencing, which is a <laughs> state-of-the-art technique uh, that uh, interrogates uh, genomic variation at very high resolution. And that's where the genomic resource, the Pacific Health Genome, comes into play because uh, without the genome, this uh, approach would not be uh, possible. Um, and one of the outcomes is really to establish a genetic baseline uh, with, from which we'll be able to assign uh, this to uh, individual uh, spawning groups. So this is work in progress. And, uh, and uh, hopefully in the next year, 2023, we'll have some results to present. The second research area is that of reproduction. And during those uh, five years in the previous research plan, uh, we did a uh, considerable amount of work uh, to describe the, uh, the, the reproductive biology of the species uh, to provide some fundamental information on uh, reproductive development. Um, and um, we uh, accomplished uh, this study by providing uh, key information on uh, the type of fecundity uh, that Pacific how the females have, the type of annual, uh, uh, the type of reproductive cycle, uh, confirming that the Pacific how the females reproduce annually, uh, and some other uh, reproductive characteristics that have been derived from a histological assessment of reproductive. That's been key to identify uh, the appropriate timing uh, for donor collection in the FIS in order to conduct the studies that we're now embarking on, which is uh, which have the objective to revise uh, current maturity estimates. Um, one of the uh, um, outcomes of this work has been uh, our ability through histological analysis to classify females according to developmental stages and reproductive phases, and then contrast this histologically based information with uh, microscopic or visual um, uh, information on maturity, which is what we've uh, gathered uh, up to date. Um, basically, all the information that we have regarding maturity and the maturity schedules that Dr. Stewart has, has just informed us on um, were based on macroscopic or visual observation of the ovaries. Uh, and uh, there's a clear need to uh, revise those maturity schedules and confirm whether those are accurate based on the new histological analysis that we're conducting. Um, this work has also uh, derived in, in two important publications that have uh, appeared uh, in 2020 and 2022 in the Journal of Big Biology and Frontiers in Marine Science. Uh, in addition, as you've uh, heard from um, Dr. Stewart a little earlier today, um, we've been working uh, on the development of the application of genetic tests for sex identification. So that's how um, we have uh, been able to derive the sex ratio of commercial landings uh, from uh, uh, 2017 until uh, here. Uh, so moving into the, um, uh, the current uh, plan of uh, integrated research monitoring, 
uh, we'll, you'll, you'll see in the next slide uh, our plans uh, for this year uh, to revise uh, maturity schedules based on histology. We have uh, done extensive collection of samples in our 2022 FIS. And we're actually planning on moving on to fecundity assessments uh, in uh, the following year, 2023. And also, in the process, revise the macroscopic staging criteria that is currently being used. So what we've done this year is the collection of a substantial number of uh, samples for histology to revise uh, maturity schedules uh, coast-wide. So we have collected uh, ovarian samples for histology in uh, biological regions 2, 3, 4, and 4B. Uh, and in this table, uh, those are the, our target uh, number of samples. Now we know that uh, the number of samples available for the study has have reduced a little bit, uh, particularly in biological regions 3 and 4. Uh, but we now have uh, sufficient samples uh, that are currently being processed for histology that will allow us to um, uh, revise maturity schedules not only coastwide but also across biological regions. Uh, so the idea again is to revise that maturity schedule uh, based on histological analysis and not based on the uh, currently used methods of uh, visually uh, scoring maturity levels of. Uh, so that's that's the work that uh, Dr. Stewart was referring to. The third area uh, that we're um, conducting work on is that of growth. And during the first uh, five-year research plan, uh, we conducted quite a bit of work uh, trying to identify and validate physiological markers for growth. And the main objective, obviously, is to understand um, the different factors that can, can lead into growth variations uh, affecting uh, in turn, size and age. Uh, so uh, we were successful in um, identifying a number of uh, molecular physiological markers that could identify <coughs> patterns. So we can actually tell uh, positive versus negative growth patterns. And that could, uh, uh, those tools uh, will be applied in future studies that are now uh, in the um, delineation uh, phase. Uh, uh, in the next uh, research plan that will address the issue of uh, potential environmental influences on growth patterns and also dietary uh, influences on growth patterns and physiological condition. The fourth area is that of mortality and survival assessment. And, and here during this first five year research plan, we've conducted work in, in two major areas. So one is in the longland fishery. Uh, and I presented uh, this results uh, in a number of um, uh, meetings uh, prior to this one. Uh, that's regarding uh, our ability to estimate the discard mortality rate in the longline fishery. This work is completed uh, and it has been published. And uh, we have now uh, survival estimates uh, through the use of uh, accelerometer tags. And, and uh, we are um, currently um, uh, working on a manuscript to describe uh, the relationship between um, um, handling techniques, capture techniques, and, and linking that with survival. But uh, secondly, and this is the work that we're currently doing, and I will be showing you some of the results, is uh, similar work on uh, the estimation of discard mortality rates in the charter recreational fishery. Um, and uh, this work is in progress. And uh, the, the, out, the, the type of work is, is, is quite similar to the previous uh, study that we conducted on the longline fishery, and that is to assess the survival of uh, fish that are discarded in the charter recreational fishery with the use of accelerometer tags as well as conventional water tagging, and to uh, analyze capture related variables and, and to determine how those could relate to uh, survival of discarded fish. Uh, we have two publications regarding this work, uh, mostly uh, on, on the first component, which is the uh, DMRs in the longline fishery, uh, one appeared in Transformation of Physiology in 2021, and the second one in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management in 2022. So regarding this second component, the recreational fishery, um, the objectives have been to uh, conduct uh, experimental fishing um, in which specific output were subjected to typical recreational gear and handling practices to 
investigate first the relationships between hook size and head size to develop injury and physiological stress profiles, and then quantify and characterize survival by uh, the use of uh, tagging. And um, um, well, in this study that was conducted successfully in the spring of 2021 in Alaska, uh, in Sitka and uh, in Seward, uh, we tagged a total of 281 fish uh, with wire tags that were discarded. So far, we've recovered 28. Uh, but we also, a subset of those fish uh, were tagged with the uh, accelerometer tags. Those are satellite transmitted tags uh, that uh, provide uh, uh, movement patterns and viability, basically, uh, during uh, a period of 96 days. Um, of those 80 fish that were tagged, um, 76 of those tags provided functional data, and uh, from those results, uh, we can uh, identify whether a fish during that 96-day period uh, was dead or alive. And based on that information, uh, we now know that the mortality estimates uh, from uh, fish that were released in excellent uh, viability category was approximately 1.35 percent with a neural coefficient. Uh, of 95% of between 0 and 95. Uh, and we're currently working on uh, relating uh, capture conditions, uh, environmental conditions, uh, time on the hook and time on deck uh, with a number of uh, uh, other potential variables to link those resources to survival. And the last research area is that of fishing uh, technology. And here we received uh, as a other some of the projects are uh, funding uh, through external sources, uh, in this case uh, from the bycatch reduction engineering program from NOAA. Uh, and uh, the main topic is uh, uh, develop technologies to reduce world earth depredation by protecting long line catches. This, this project, which initiated at the beginning of this year in 2022, started with the organization of a successful international workshop um, that was hold, uh, that was held online. Um, that it was entitled uh, "Protecting Fishery Catches from World Depredation." That was held in uh, 9th of uh, February of this year. That was a, again was a virtual workshop, but it was very well attended. 74 participants from six countries, and uh, we started to, with uh, presentations from three different groups uh, that uh, presented different types of uh, devices for protecting online catches. The first one was a group from Norway uh, presenting sh shuttles. Uh, these are metal structures that uh, retain the catch as they are being um, hauled back. Um, the second one were shrouds. Uh, the image here is pretty small, but those are basically um, uh, ways of physically protecting the catch uh, so that the fish <coughs> cannot get to it. Those were developed by uh, some group of friends. And then thirdly, the use of slinky bonds that they would develop in the U.S. Uh, in order to protect the also the online catches from, uh, from world depredation. So one of the outcomes of this workshop was to identify potential uh, useful avenues uh, for these different devices and field test them. Uh, so that's where we are right now. We're on the second phase of this uh, project. And um, uh, this project now involves the, the production, uh, and that's going on as we speak. Of uh, prototypes of two of the, the different devices that were uh, selected as the most promising. Uh, one was a reduced version of that shuttle, um, uh, the Sago Extreme, and then the second one was uh, a, a modified slinky pod uh, that would uh, go over uh, a long line gear uh, that would protect um, uh, the catch as it's being uh, a hold. So this would be an open end slinky. So those, those two types of prototypes are now being developed, and they're going to be tested for their feasibility uh, in the spring of 2023 in the Bible of Alaska. So the main objective here is, is not to determine really how effective they are, but uh, how they can actually be um, uh, put into place uh, through deployment, uh, looking at also retrieval logistics, uh, uh, test the configurations uh, in terms of weight and how they behave in the water and, and, and overall the basic components of these devices um, in order to make some recommendations as to what to do going forward. 
So finally, um, I just want to <coughs> highlight the fact that we have been successful in over the last uh, uh, year, but uh, that's been consistent throughout the duration of the five-year research plans in obtaining external funding from various sources. Uh, the work that I have described on the recreational and long line uh, EMR estimations have been funded by the North Pacific Research Board, by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, the work that we're currently conducting on uh, population structure using genomic methods has been is being funded by a grant from the North Pacific Research Board. And you just heard the uh, uh, fishery technology project uh, funded by uh, by batch production engineering program. And as uh, recommendations, uh, just like the commissioners to note, uh, the paper uh, that provides the description of these activities that I've just been uh, described, and uh, to provide any redirection or suggestions on the various uh, research streams. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions for John? More of a programmatic question than about a particular presentation, but. Uh, it's great that you've been able to find outside funding for these projects. Is, is the entire program funded through outside funding? Or? No, not the entire program. Uh, just specific, specific topics are being funded. Uh, the work that we're conducting on this carpetalic rate is being funded externally. Uh, the cost uh, is, is uh, this process that you can high. There's been a, a charter work that is uh, costly. That's being covered by the general funding, uh, as well as the cost of the, the tagging uh, efforts. Um, the population structure the work is also externally funded, uh, as well as the uh, fishery technology, for instance, the maturity work is funded internally mm -hmm. uh, through IPT funds, uh, as well as uh, some of the work moving forward to the growth of the initial fund, uh, funding for the project on growth was from another NPRB grant that uh, lasted between 2017 and 2020. So it's a mixture of uh, both in general and external. <coughs> yeah, Dr. Plinus, I thought last year you were about to publish, or the commission was about to publish something to do about the um, the drift of larval in the Bering Sea, and did that take place? Or yes, or that, we're about to take place. No, no, that, that was actually a question. That was actually published uh, in 2021. That's the paper by Santoros et al. That's that's the paper in which uh, we, uh, through um, uh, various modeling efforts, uh, the larval trajectories were identified from five different spawning areas uh, in the Gulf of Alaska and then the Bering Sea uh, through time. So that, that, that paper is published and, and the presentation has no link to that particular paper. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bonas. So um, I have maybe just a few carryover questions from earlier presentations. Um, <clears throat> the following two year presentation here. Um, and I, I apologize if I missed it, but um, I see that the work on the maturity schedules uh, looks like it's sort of completed by 2022. Uh, could you just clarify for me, do we expect like, when do we expect a product that essentially sort of updates that and, and when should we expect it to be reflected in um, stock assessments? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it is, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I should clarify that uh, this work on maturity, on revising maturity estimates, started this year. So, started with a collection of samples in our 2022 list. Um, we have a total of uh, 1,025 for samples that have just been sent for <coughs> processing on an external company. Um, we expect to have the histological slides uh, in-house at the beginning of the year and uh, my expectations that would be that uh, given the number of samples and the limited staff that we have to work on, uh, on that project is that we, we could expect uh, to have some results in 12 months uh, approximately. Um, 
that would be that would be my estimate. Uh, and it would take us a little bit of uh, uh, months to uh, analyze all the technology we have. This is visual examination of the uh, histology as well as the microchip uh, uh, scoring, uh, and then we uh, will uh, uh, model for the maturity uh, values uh, by the by biology. Uh, so maybe we're looking at not next year's stock assessment, but perhaps the year following. We could see some of that being drawn in. I, I would think that that would be a reasonable expectation to have that data available for input into some assessment on the county board. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I asked uh, Dr. Stewart a bit earlier. Um, uh, just what are your views about um, our ability to better understand what influences size of age? Um, perhaps to a point where we may be able to sort of forecast something like that. Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Uh, yeah, this, this is another interesting question uh, because this is a uh, a really important topic that uh, we've, uh, I would say that the Commission has had been working on since uh, 2017 with the beginning of that XRP funding grant, which uh, um, was based on trying to identify some potential markers of growth that could be used in, in subsequent studies to address uh, that particular issue. Um, <coughs> uh, as you all know, um, the Factors that drive those uh, changes in size of age are many and very different in nature. Uh, they go from biological uh, potential factors, environmental factors, ecological factors. Um, so, for instance, uh, you could, uh, there's been reports uh, on, um, on testing the hypothesis that, for instance, density, there may be a density dependent uh, component, interspecific and interspecific, um, that uh, density would negatively affect uh, size of age because it would reduce growth through competition um, among Pacific halibut or among other plant species. Um, environmental factors, temperature most likely being the most important one, and that's the, particularly the one that we focused on that first study. So that study was, I think it was, uh, is, is a good uh, building stone for our ability to move forward because we looked specifically at the effects of temperature on growth. We demonstrated that they that stick out the juveniles um, uh, have the ability to express compensatory growth, meaning that uh, they can uh, reco recover um, uh, growth that was stunted or, uh, or slowed down by Low temperatures uh, in that case, but that's been shown also in other situations, not by us, uh, through a lack of uh, feeding. Uh, the fish, when uh, they encounter better um, environmental conditions, they, they actually catch up, uh, and that could be a determining factor for their future growth trajectories. Um, so that uh, that work is 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 now being um, written as a publication, and uh, we're having discussions uh, uh, among uh, my PhD uh, scientific staff to find or devise uh, a strategy for addressing uh, growth of age. And our plan is to be able to um, determine what would be the priority research to be conducted and presented to the SRB in the upcoming June meeting um, and, and revisit that area and then determine uh, what kind of funding we would need, what kind of efforts would we uh, need to additional sampling in order to address the issue of uh, temporal changes in size of age, but also spatial changes in size of age. Uh, and we have collaborations with, with uh, a group in uh, in Alaska, from Alaska Pacific University, where they have done work on uh, spatial analysis, spatial, spatial differences, or uh, size of age in IPC and laboratory area of VA. Um, and we may find that information interesting to follow up as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
and then the last question was slide five interrogating genomic variation at high resolution does that involve like a bare light bulb and something sitting in a chair <laughs> does it interrogate <laughs> no it, it, interrogate is a term that yeah I, I, it's it's a very term and, and, and when you bring this up because yeah this is a very um, genomic oriented term um, that means that um, that really indicates our ability now to um, look at genome-wide differences. So we're actually looking at the entire genome. Um, just to put things a little bit in perspective, um, uh, not so distant uh, genetic studies were done with the use of microsatellites, with uh, usually in the order of dozens, uh, or uh, SNPs in the order of uh, several hundreds or several thousand, but now with the ability to really exploit the uh, reference genome that we have available for city Alvin, uh, the, the level of, of uh, interrogation, that means the level of, of, of differences, of genetic differences that we can identify, can be increased by the of magnitude. And that's, that's what interrogation means. That means looking at genome-wide uh, differences that could be indicative of uh, geographic differences, the differences of origin, uh, and and the development uh, of the genetic marker panels that can be used for more routine applications. Thank you. Um, Bob, go ahead, please. Yeah, Dr. Plenis, I on one of the chart or pages here, you had a picture of how of it being tagged, and um, it was 80 of, of those tags you bought. Um, it, it, and it looked like it had. Uh, you plug in, you got uh, a bunch of information on it. What, what do those tags run? What's the cost of those tags? The accelerometer tags that we use for this particular study, uh, which are different from the ones that are traditionally used for uh, understanding migrations, uh, they're a little simpler because uh, they lack uh, the ability to collect uh, uh, depth or, or light. Um, they're called accelerometers because, in fact, what they detail, detect is the tilt of the tag as the fish is moving. Um, so uh, they're a little simpler and they run for approximately $1,000 each, as opposed to $4,000 for the regular satellite in terms of making tags. And, and the, the fish that, that, yeah, are you tagging mostly that size fish or, or a variety of size fish? No, there was a variety of. Fish. Uh, the limitation was that we only tagged fish that were in excellent category. So that was a subset of the right. uh, collection of fish that we encountered. Yeah, Richard. <clears throat> Hi, Dr. Planis. Uh, a lot along the same lines of your genetic studies. Uh, this morning we heard from the SRB report that they were investigating or they were making a recommendation for a scientist that had expertise in this uh, close kin uh, marker capture. And I understand that's a genetic way of doing a stock assessment. So in, in your uh, big scheme of things in your scientific plan, where is that method of doing a stock assessment in, on your radar? Is it something that uh, um, would run parallel uh, with the current FIS, uh, help it improve the performance of the information we have about the stock, and uh, when do we see that in one of your plans? Thank you, uh, Michelle. Uh, in fact, the close cam marker capture is in the five year uh, program research and monitoring, and we started to um, uh, contemplate work on that area. And, and the first thing that we've done is, is in fact, uh, establish uh, several meetings uh, with uh, Dr. Mark Brevington from Desiro. He was one of the few individuals that uh, uh, co-authored the first paper where they applied that uh, method to estimate abundance. Uh, and I was using uh, the looping tuna as an example. Um, so 
uh, over the last year, uh, we've had, uh, if I remember correctly, I think we had three or four meetings with uh, Dr. Brampton as well as Dr. Campbell from Cicero in Australia uh, to discuss um, um, the data sources, the existing data sources that we have for, for Pacific Alibut, um, the, the genetic samples that we have available, um, and um, we started this course plans to uh, to move into a pilot study, uh, not a full blown study, but a pilot study that would tell us what would be the sample requirements uh, in order to obtain uh, the information that we desire. And, and post skin model capture is a genetic method that is based on genetic uh, apparent. Uh, uh, Genetic relatedness. Uh, so, in fact, you identify a pair of pairs. Uh, so, you have to have a, a sample uh, size that is uh, large enough in order to determine those those relationships uh, between offspring and parents. So, um, we're moving in that direction. I think it's a little early to see how that um, what that would entail. Uh, but uh, our intention is really to move into a pilot study um, some something that would, uh, would also be called a feasibility study uh, to see what we would need and how much would it cost uh, and how much effort from, from our part would be needed to perform that study. Um, CKMR is usually used in uh, for species for which uh, don't have the type of information that we have on Pacific Halibut. Uh, so the, the species for which there's no uh, survey, there's no stock assessment. Uh, that's and their their only interest is really to get a, a, an estimate of abundance. Uh, but um, CKMR can actually provide not only abundance, but can actually provide information on mortality, on uh, on the quantity of the species, a uh, number of life history parameters that are that could be particularly interesting. The fact that we have genomic resources already available, it's it's a huge step. Uh, Thank you. Um, question. So on the slide 12, fishing technology, I'm looking at depredation. Do you think this is work that should be done by them? Meaning that it favors one particular sector to get information. Right, maybe the question is more for us as to which one. Um, what's your what's your concern in raising it given that this is funded by uh, an outside source? Well, I guess um, what I understood from Joseph was that it also takes that time there. And so that's accurate, then maybe there's other things with higher priority that benefit um, the, everything overall. So things like um, understanding maturity, for example, mm -hmm. which seems to be like a, I think a pretty high priority, and I think there'd be others that <clears throat> would be high priority to make sure that they occur. So that, that's where it's coming from, John. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. It's, it's an interesting question, and I, I guess I would ask uh, Dave, what the, what the process is when seeking outside funding for something like this. It's, it's, uh, does that typically come to the commissioners? Is this just something you work with staff on? Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the, question, the question and through the chair. So these types of projects are um, developed out, out of, uh, in this particular case, obviously requests from stakeholders, which are then brought either to the RAB or the Scientific Review Board to gauge the um, level of utility and, and, and potential merit in, in doing so. Um, and then and for this particular project, uh, I'll have to defer to Giuseppe to figure out the process of, of when it would have come to the commission and for uh, consideration, noting that we've had a lot of discussions at, at all levels of the subsidiary bodies, uh, and then also at the commission, noting the issue of whale depredation um, as a 
priority at some point, and, and again, uh, I wouldn't go put my finger on when that was considered a higher priority. Um, <coughs> but maybe just have you have some sort of timeline background there. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think uh, the uh, instigators were us moving in that direction uh, were uh, some recommendations from the RAP um, starting in, if I remember correctly, in 2019, uh, where well degradation was one of the key issues that was discussed uh, by the RAP. Um, as a result of that, that was uh, incorporated into our drafts for the five year uh, program of integrated research and monitoring. Um, and that's now in that plan, and the SRB uh, endorsed uh, that plan. Of course, uh, this particular funding opportunity, as many funding opportunities, are also <coughs> opportunistic. Uh, they don't come, um, they're not open all the time. So um, when in 2020, uh, this opportunity from REP came up, um, it was built in a line quite well with the recommendations of our advisory bodies. Uh, and uh, it was an opportunity also to engage with the industry, uh, which was also one of the recommendations of the, of the research advisory board uh, to work uh, a little more closely with industry, industry partners. Uh, and we have several industry partners as well as NOAA participating in this project. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's, that provides a little bit of history on how this developed. Yeah, thanks, Joseph, for that, providing that background. That was helpful. John? Oh, if I remember correctly, this same basic question came up at our work meeting in September. And the meals we raised it, and, and it, 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 if I am remembering correctly, I raised it at that time that this isn't just a matter of benefiting fishermen, uh, but also uh, having a better way of dealing with the ecosystem effects its effects on other components of the ecosystem, effects to marine animals, that there are potentially adverse effects from interaction with gear, and we can reduce those adverse effects. Um, so I don't think it's quite as simple as uh, this being a sort of an industry service, but your, your broader point about where this fits within the realm of priorities is, is a fair one. And uh, you know, we're going to some consideration for future projects. Yeah, fair enough, John. I just um, thought it would be an interesting question to pose from when, when we do set priorities that we consider these things maybe a little more broadly and take your point of the whale devastation. Um, and unfortunately, I'm never going to get out of my head the vision of a genome being interrogated. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Uh, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, sorry, I was, I was actually going to ask. I was actually going to ask about the uh, the uh, whale depredation study, and, and uh, um, are you guys? Uh, I see you have uh, something called the open end slinky plot, which to me a plot closed on both ends. But uh, is this a new technology that you guys have developed and want to test with the company, or is this just a modified? Uh, plot system to fish, or are you trying to integrate um, open line gear with the pots? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Sure uh, it's the latter. Um, it, it is a modified uh, slinky pot uh, that uh, we're adapting and for use uh, in a lot of lines. That was interesting. Last call. <coughs> yeah, uh, so did you use it in 2022? Um, I give Mr. option. No, no, this has not been used yet. The plans uh, are to uh, do the field testing in 2023 in the spring. That will be really very interesting. That's good. Thanks. OK, Peter, you Smart. <laughs> I was just curious, would you still call it a pot? The reason why is there could be some regulation issues around pods. First, it's not really a pod because it's open-ended, right? So I'm just curious if it's necessary to still call it a pod. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your comment, uh, Commissioner DeGree. No, you, you're totally right. In fact, uh, if you look at the slide, uh, you know, the, the word there is shroud rather than 
Oh, okay. So uh, we, we may, yeah, we may be looking at answering the nomenclature issues with the bond. It's the money line. In fact, it's, it's only more accurately referred to as a shroud. It's, it's protecting money by slinky bond. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, Joseph. <coughs> Um, are there any public comments? No, there's not, Chair. Okay, thanks, Dan. So, um, just for tomorrow, then, we will pick up um, with the management strategy evaluation. And uh, can you give a time estimate of how much time do you think is required to go through the rest of the, uh, the agenda? Thank you, Chair. Um, content, uh, I imagine, we'll get through all of it within three hours or so, um, probably two and a half hours. Uh, and then, so in terms of uh, conversation, discussion around the MSE could take a little bit of time, some some budgeting discussion as well. Uh, but we should, noting that you, you have the intention of potentially leaving or ending the meeting mid-afternoon or early afternoon. And if we didn't have a lunch break, for example, I'd be confident we'd be done by 1.30. Mm -hmm. So, and that would mean that we would be um, having a remote uh, completion of the uh, recorded from this session as well. <coughs> yes, Chair, if, if that's the Commission's choice, I uh, could also send some, some of that report this evening uh, as it's being kept up to date. Um, and it would be useful maybe given you have your advisors um, on hand to potentially do some of that initial review. Uh, and then yes, a, a report adoption via correspondence uh, early next week would be ideal. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so if you could send what you have around tonight, people can take a look at it tomorrow as we're going through, I think it would be helpful. And, uh, and then we could finish every moment. So I guess, John, that worked for you. First for me, I think Neil really wanted to start about 7.30 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, <I'm good>. laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently we did interpret his desires. <laughs> so, um, okay, so does that type of time frame work for commissioners? Okay. And works for the secretariat. So with that, then I think we can adjourn for today and we will commence tomorrow morning at 9.